Chapter 9 Mary had crumpled to the ground in a huddle of green voile and tumbled brown curls. John dragged her to her feet. Let's get out of this. Shouldn't we wait for the police? I squawked. I was trying not to throw up. John didn't bother to answer. Towing his stumbling bride, he was already on his way, leading the retreat as usual. Schmidt tugged at me. He is right, there may be more shooting. Come, we can do nothing here. That seemed to be the general consensus. Screaming and shoving, people poured through the entrance. Their sheer numbers overwhelmed the guards, who appeared to be as shaken as the visitors. They were waving their rifles around in a disorganized manner, and one of them fired into the air. I think it was into the air. If it was intended to stop the stampede, it failed. The sound of gunfire made people even crazier. The crowd exploded into the parking lot, carrying us with them. John materialized out of somewhere. He grabbed Schmidt by the collar. This way. Ed was standing by the car. When he saw us coming, he opened the back door and motioned vigorously with the large, heavy, lethal object he was holding in his right hand. In. Move it. John still had Schmidt by the collar. He heaved him in, gave me a hard shove, and followed close on my heels, scooping said heels and the legs to which they were attached in with him. The door slammed, and the car took off. We got our arms and legs sorted out eventually. Ed had gotten in front with a driver. The gun was no longer in sight. Mary crouched in the corner. Her eyes were open, but they had a fixed glassy stare. Her pretty frock was crumpled and dusty. Perched on the jump seat opposite, John ran his fingers through his disheveled hair. There wasn't a mark on him, or on Schmidt, who had cleverly managed to fall on top of me. I was bleeding all over Larry's expensive velvet upholstery. I fully expected a visit, if not a reprimand, from the police. I should have known no such vulgarity would be perpetrated on a person like Larry. Schmidt was in my room trying to persuade me to let him wind yards of bandages around my scraped arms and legs when a servant knocked at the door and informed us that the master hoped we would join him on the terrace for drinks. The others were already there. Mary had changed her dress. She was wearing white and the Greek earrings. Larry began fussing over my injuries, but I cut his expressions of sympathy short. Just scrapes and bruises, I'm fine. Unlike poor Jean-Louis. It was he, wasn't it? I couldn't... I couldn't be sure. So I've been informed. He was carrying identification, of course. Always the perfect host, Larry handed me a glass before dropping into a chair. He covered his eyes with his hand. I dread telling his parents they were so proud of him. A tear rolled down Schmidt's cheek. It is furchtbar, frightful, terrible. Just when he had attained his fondest dream. What will you do now about the Institute, Larry? Impeccably groomed, gracefully lounging, John drawled. Every cloud is a silver lining, they say. This seems to be Faisal's silver lining. Or are you going to appoint someone else as director? Even Larry had a hard time remaining courteous in the face of that outrageous speech. He answered shortly, Faisal will assume the post, of course. He's on his way here now. We have a number of things to discuss, so I'll have to ask you to excuse me when he arrives. Have they caught the terrorists? I asked. Not yet. Apparently, there was a great deal of confusion. The police are rounding up the usual suspects, I murmured. From what I'd heard about the SSI, the usual suspects wouldn't have a pleasant time. John put his glass on the table and stood up. I think I'll have a swim. Anyone join me? Mary shook her head. Schmidt said doubtfully, It does not seem proper. Hands in his pockets, lips pursed in a whistle, John sauntered toward the house. His pitch was perfect. I recognized the strains of The Wreck on the Highway. He really was exceeding himself in tactlessness that afternoon. There hadn't been any whiskey, but there'd been plenty of blood, and I hadn't heard anyone pray. Larry assured Schmidt, 
After all, you hardly knew the poor man. But Schmidt remained seated. I wouldn't like to imply that he was lacking in sensitivity, but I suspected mixed motives. He wanted more to eat and more to drink and more in the way of information. Browsing among the hors d'oeuvres, he peppered Larry with questions. Had anyone else been injured? Had a motive for the attack been established? Where had the bombs been placed? How had they been set off? Larry had no answers. A servant finally came to announce that Faisal was waiting in Larry's study, and Larry excused himself. Schmidt decided he'd have a swim after all, and since I couldn't decide which alternative was less appealing, having a heart-to-heart -heart with the pregnant bride or watching the pregnant bride's husband flex his muscles at me, I went to my room. I didn't know the answers to the questions Schmidt had asked either, but my admittedly confused memories of the event raised a couple of others he hadn't asked. I'd seen a big hole in the pavement and a lot of dust, but to the best of my recollection, not a single column had toppled and nary a sphinx had been scarred. I'd seen a lot of fallen bodies, but only one that was undeniably dead. The murder of a foreigner, and a foreign archaeologist did that, would raise a real stink. The usual suspects were in for a hard time. But maybe this time they were fall guys, not perps. Note the technical vocabulary. We well-known amateur sleuths like to sound professional. I can't say I felt particularly professional at that moment. What I felt was scared spitless, as my mother used to say, innocently unaware of the word the euphemism concealed. Bits and pieces of a theory were scuttling around in my brain like beetles with too many legs and shifty dispositions darting for cover behind lumps of stupidity whenever I tried to swat one of them. The overall pattern was so preposterous, I'd have laughed it off if anyone but John had been involved. One thing stood out shining and clear, though, and when I joined the others for dinner, I was trying to think of a way of proposing it that wouldn't make matters even worse. Larry didn't join us. He'd sent his apologies, claiming he'd be busy all evening. It seemed a heaven-sent opportunity for making my move. I feel guilty about taking advantage of Larry, I said, poking at a delectable fruit salad. He's too polite to say so, but I'm sure we're making things more difficult for him. Not only is he getting ready to leave, but Jean-Louis' death will involve a good many additional administrative problems. What do you say we check out and move to a hotel, Schmidt? Usually, Schmidt was agreeable to any activity as long as he could do it with me. But this time he looked mutinous. We can give help and comfort to our poor friend. I doubt you can give him the sort of help he needs, John said dryly. I think Vicky's hit on a splendid idea. We'll miss you when you're gone, of course. Both of you. If that wasn't a hint, I'd never heard one. From the tilt of John's eyebrow, I deduced it was also a quote from one of Schmidt's country ballads. Lots of them are about missing people after they're gone. And in most cases, gone doesn't mean temporarily removed from the scene. The meal dragged on, prolonged primarily by Schmidt, who ate hugely of everything offered. Nobody else seemed to have much of an appetite. When we headed for the parlor for coffee, one of the servants drew me aside. There is a gentleman to see you, miss, he murmured. He was waiting in the hall. I didn't recognize him at first. He might have been dressed for a funeral in a dark suit and somber tie, and his face was almost as gloomy. Faisal, I said in surprise. His attempt at a smile wasn't very convincing. I have been with Mr. Blenkiron. I thought, I hoped I might persuade you to come with me to a café. I had a number of reasons for believing that might not be such a good idea. I don't think so, Faisal. Not tonight. He shifted his briefcase to his left hand and caught mine in a hard grip. His voice dropped to a whisper. Please, Vicky. Only for a little while. It's not what you think. Do you suppose I feel like celebrating? I have to talk to you. There were also a number of reasons for believing it might not be such a bad idea. He saw I was weakening. In the same hoarse whisper, he went on. We'll go to the ETAP or the Winter Palace, wherever you will feel comfortable. Please. Well, he practically dragged me to the door.
I made a few feeble protests about freshening my makeup and getting my purse, which he overruled. I looked beautiful and I didn't need my purse. He would escort me home. The last part turned out to be true anyhow, if not in the sense I expected. I was relieved to see a taxi waiting for us instead of Larry's mammoth car, and even more relieved to hear the words Winter Palace in the midst of Faisal's otherwise unintelligible order to the driver. We didn't go to the hotel, but sat on the terrace, which was crowded with people. I ordered coffee. Let's not waste time, I said. What's wrong? Can you ask? I just did. It has to do with Dr. Mazran's death, doesn't it? A nice step up for you. He turned a queer shade of brownish gray. You don't think I had anything to do with that? I wouldn't be here if I did. But you are a member of one of the, uh, revolutionary societies, aren't you? Faisal went a shade grayer. If you'd like to see me hauled off to a detention cell, never to emerge again, speak a little louder. Sorry. Faisal drained his cup and ordered a refill. Forget politics. They've nothing to do with the present situation. I have a feeling you're well aware of that. He stopped, watching me expectantly. What little he had said confirmed my hunch. But although I was dying, to make that anxious to know more, I had no intention of blurting out my suspicions to one of the people I was suspicious of. Please continue, I said. Faisal took out a handkerchief and mopped his forehead. I'm taking an awful chance warning you, but I couldn't just walk away and leave you at risk. I'm going into hiding, and so must you. I can take you to a place where you'll be safe. I groaned. Why do I do these things? I inquired of the room at large. You'd think by this time I'd have learned better. No thanks, Faisal. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to go round the tables and panhandle a few bucks so I can take a cab. Back into the lion's den. You mean back into the frying pan? What you're proposing sounds a lot like the fire. I told you. You haven't told me anything. You've just spouted vague threats. Appeal to my intelligence, Faisal. Give me two. Hell, I'll settle for one. Good reason why I should accept your offer. Faisal groaned. We sounded like a pair of sick dogs. I was told to show you this. He opened his briefcase and took out a piece of paper. There was no writing on it. It was a piece of plain, black paper, about eight inches square. I felt the blood drain slowly out of my face, starting with my brain and backing up in my vocal cords. All I could do for a few seconds was gurgle horribly. Finally, I managed to clear my throat. Who gave you this? Larry? Max? Who's Max? Either he was honestly bewildered, or he could have given drama lessons to Sir Lawrence Olivier. He cut silhouettes, I mumbled, staring at the piece of black paper, for a hobby. His other hobbies are fraud, theft, and murder. Art and antiquities, those are his specialties. I thought he was in jail. I helped put him in jail. How the hell did he... I shoved my chair back and stood up. I've got to get Schmidt out of there. If Max is one of them... Oh, Christ, of course, it has to be him. He was careful to keep out of my way. But I should have known. He was obviously wearing a wig the first time I... I wasted time fumbling under the table for my purse before I remembered I didn't have it. Faisal grabbed my arm as I started blindly for the street. Hold on a minute. You don't have money for a cab. I'll tell him to wait, just long enough for me to collect Schmidt and my purse. I'll come with you. Wait a second. He tossed a few bills onto the table and picked up his briefcase without relaxing his grip on me. I pulled away from him, and he said, I sense you are now convinced of the danger. Come with me to the place I mentioned. Not without Schmidt. There were several decrepit-looking vehicles lined up in front of the hotel. I opened the door of the first one, hoping it was a taxi, and got in. Faisal followed me. I'll go back for him after I've taken you. No, you won't, driver. 
Faisal enveloped me in a rib-cracking embrace and rattled off a string of directions to the driver. I didn't understand a word, but I was pretty sure he had not given the order I would have given. I tried to free myself. Let me go, damn you! Certainly, said Faisal, unwrapping his arms. I fell back against the seat, and he socked me on the jaw. He must have given me an injection of some kind, because it was morning when I woke up. Very early morning, the rosy hues of dawn fell prettily across the floor of wherever I was. I didn't wait to examine my surroundings, but made a rush for the door. Somehow I wasn't surprised to discover that it was locked. The single window was blocked by ornate grillwork. It had been there a while. Rusty streaks stained the black iron, but it was still functional, as I discovered when I shook it. Had it been designed to keep people in or keep them out, I wondered. Whatever the original purpose, it would suffice to keep me in. The rush of adrenaline subsided, leaving me shaking and weak-kneed. I staggered back to the bed and sat down. After I'd surveyed the room, I had to admit that I'd been shut up in worse places. The furniture looked as if it had come from the local equivalent of a low-budget outlet store, but it was clean and fairly new. In addition to the bed, the amenities consisted of a table, a lamp, and two straight chairs. On the table was a jug, plastic, full of water, a glass, plastic, a bowl, you guessed it, a bar of soap, a towel, and a paperback novel with the cover missing. I picked up the book. It was by Valerie Van Dyne. I threw it across the room. There was only one door. I am not without experience. I was raised on a farm. I found what I was looking for, chastely hidden under the bed. After I had paced the room forty or fifty times, I retrieved the book and started reading. Voluptuous Madeleine de Montmorency was fighting off the villain for the second time when I heard a sound at the door. The book and my feet hit the floor simultaneously. There was nothing in the room I could use as a weapon, so I had to rely on craft, cunning, and my bare hands, which left me, I had to admit, at a distinct disadvantage. But when I saw the figure framed in the open doorway, my clenched fist fell. Nothing my imagination had conjured up could equal that vision. She was about three feet tall and about a hundred years old, and she didn't have a tooth in her head. Black cloth covered everything except her face and her hands, the standard garb of a conservative Muslim female. She wouldn't wear a face veil in her own house with only another woman present. Bearing her gums at me in what was probably not a smile, she sidled into the room and deposited a tray on the table. Where I come from, punching old ladies simply isn't done. My stupefied stare must have reassured her. Straightening to her full height of three feet six, she gestured at the door and twisted her bony wrist once, twice, three times. I got the message. Three doors, three locks, between me and freedom. I was beginning to think maybe I could overcome my conditioning about hitting old ladies. Not hard, of course, just a little tap when she gave a sudden backward hop, agile as an Egyptian cricket. They are black and very large, and they don't fly. They beam themselves from place to place like Captain Kirk. Before I could move, she was out the door. It closed with a slam, and I heard the key turn on the lock. I didn't swear. I was too dumbfounded to be angry. What the hell kind of jailer was this? Where the hell was I? Who the hell was responsible for this? By the time I had finished the coffee and nibbled at a piece of flat, unleavened bread, I was pretty sure I knew the answer to the last question. The situation had his distinctively lunatic touch, including Grandma Moses. I wondered where he'd dug her up. So, fifty pages later, when I heard the key turn in the lock again, I didn't bother assuming a posture of attack. Where John was concerned, bare hands weren't worth a damn. I'd need a water cannon to handle him. The man who entered had the same swagger and the same condescending smirk. It wasn't John. It was Faisal. Don't you have any Barbara Michaels or Charlotte McLeod? I asked, waving the book at him. I loathe Valerie. 
Faisal settled himself comfortably in one of the chairs. Wrong cue. You're supposed to say, how dare you? Or, what do you want with me? So I can leer lustfully at you. Let's not bandy words, I said. Who's the old lady? My grandmother. You low-down skunk. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, dragging an innocent grandmother into this. Or is she innocent? Oh, quite. She thinks my interest in you is personal. Now, wait a minute. I didn't believe him, but I thought it might be a good idea to get up from the bed. I pulled out the other chair and sat down facing him. A dear old-fashioned Muslim granny wouldn't connive at abduction and rape. Certainly not. Faisal looked shocked. She knows I'm irresistible to women. She thinks you're just playing hard to get. But don't worry, he went on, while I struggled to express my feelings. Much as I'd enjoy overcoming your maidenly scruples, you are perfectly safe from attentions of that sort. And why is that? Faisal sighed. It's those years at Oxford, I suppose. The facade is only skin deep, but it sticks like glue. Besides, I've been told how many square inches of skin I would have removed if I so much as breathed heavily on you. He was quoting the Merchant of Venice, I think. He does quote Shakespeare a lot, I agreed. How very gallant of him to be concerned about my maidenly scruples. Or is he saving me for later? Faisal folded his arms. Vicky, you simply have to take this seriously. You are perfectly safe here. It's probably the only place in Luxor where you are perfectly safe. I'll supply you with additional reading material if you insist. Just sit tight for a few days. Emulating his cool, I folded my arms and stretched my legs out. What's going to happen in a few days? I'm not going to ask how much you know, Faisal began. I must know more than I think I know. What vital clue, observed but uncomprehended by me, prompted this rash act? Faisal's beautiful black eyebrows drew together, but he sounded more puzzled than angry when he spoke. Astonishing. You really haven't a clue, have you? I don't understand. Obviously not. So why don't you just relax and leave it to us? Us being you and John? Boy, talk about broken reeds. I never did find out why so many Egyptians have such pretty thick lashes. Faisal's were as fuzzy as a toothbrush. They fell, concealing his eyes, and he said, He got me into this. He promised he'd get me out. Oh, you poor, dear, trusting man, I said, with sincere sympathy. Faisal stopped trying to be cool. He scowled at me. You really are an extremely irritating woman. I'm trying to save your life, at the risk of my own. If my part in this were discovered, I would die a slow and horrible death. Where's Schmidt? I demanded, ignoring this melodramatic remark. It might or might not be true, but at the moment I didn't give a damn. He's safe. I figured it was now or never. Granny's vigilance would be relaxed now that there was a big, strong man in the house, and at least one of the three doors was unlocked. Under the same illusion of macho superiority, Faisal might have neglected to lock the others. I sighed, smiled, shrugged, leaned back in the chair, hooked both feet under the rung of Faisal's chair, and pulled. The chair and Faisal combined made a very satisfying crash. As I had hoped and counted upon, the back of his head came into emphatic contact with the bare boards. I was already out the door when I heard him shout. The words were Arabic but the tone was unquestionably profane. I spun in an agitated circle, not knowing which way to go. There was a door at either end of the short corridor. I had a 50-50 chance of hitting the right one, so I went left. Wrong choice. The door didn't lead to the street, but to the kitchen. I found that out when it opened, to display a stove, a table, a sink, and granny. I should have such reflexes when I'm a hundred years old. Snarling toothlessly at me, she hopped back, reaching for something on the table. There were several things on the table, a pot, a bunch of onions, and a long knife. I didn't wait to see which one she wanted. 
I pushed her, as gently as circumstances allowed, and headed for the other door, followed by screams and curses. The latter came from Faisal, whose footsteps I could hear in the corridor. Door number three wasn't locked either. My exultation received a rude check when I found myself not on the street, but in a walled enclosure. It was unpaved. Weeds, or maybe they were onions, stuck up from the dirt, and there were a few chickens pecking disinterestedly at the ground. They scattered, squawking irritably, as I dashed for the gate. He hadn't bolted that either, the egotistical thing. I didn't bother closing it behind me, nor did I stop to consider which way to go. Anyway was better than where I was. I turned right this time and ran like hell, followed by renewed protests from the chickens and a lot of bad language from Faisal. Back home, they'd have called it an alley. It was narrow and unpaved and bounded by high walls, the backs of other such courtyards, I assumed. There was nobody around, not even a chicken. But not far ahead, I could see people and cars and other hopeful signs. I don't know how far behind he was when I burst out of the alley onto the street. He didn't follow me. I hadn't thought he would. He wouldn't dare drag me back fighting and yelling with all those people around. I had no idea where I was. It had to be Luxor, but it didn't resemble the part of the city with which I was familiar. It looked more like one of the country towns we'd passed through on our shore tours. One-story shops, street stalls, uneven sidewalks littered with debris. I walked on, ignoring the curious glances I got from passers-by. This was definitely not one of the popular tourist spots. I was the only foreigner in sight. I went on for another block or two, till my breathing slowed to normal speed. Still no sign of the river. The sun was no help. It was high overhead. I'd have to ask someone for directions. Luxor was a good-sized town. I could go on wandering in circles for hours, and I was in a hurry. Finally, I saw what appeared to be a gas station, or rather, two gas pumps and a shack roofed with rusty tin. A few men wearing T-shirts and jeans were lounging against the pumps. I sidled up to them. Corniche de Nile, I said, hopefully. I got a pointing finger and a spate of Arabic, including what sounded like an improper suggestion. I said, thank you, and turned down the street the finger had indicated. I had to ask twice more before I saw an open space and a gleam of water ahead. I'd found the river and the corniche, and a short distance away, a familiar tumble of pylons and columns. Karnak. But I was still a long way from my destination. I was tired and thirsty, and I didn't have a piaster in my pocket. I accosted the first tourists I met, a middle-aged couple strung with cameras, binoculars, and the other unmistakable stigma of the breed. He was wearing walking shorts and a shirt printed with sphinxes and palm trees. She was reading from her Baedeker. There is no better way of getting money from people than by appealing to their prejudices. Tourists in third-world countries expect to be mugged, though from what I'd heard, that was more likely to happen in New York and Washington than in Cairo, not to mention Luxor. My appearance certainly substantiated the pathetic story I told. They wanted me to go to the police. I applied the handkerchief the kindly lady had given me to my eyes. No, no, I can't face it. I've got to get back to the hotel right away. My husband will be worried sick. I was supposed to meet him an hour ago. He warned me not to go off alone. There was a man. I got into the cab with ten pounds and the guy's business card. I had every intention of paying him back. And I would have, too, if I hadn't lost the card. The driver let me out some distance from the house. After I had paid him, I was broke again. I suspected he'd overcharged me but I didn't feel like arguing with him. The river glittered in the sunlight, and the sky was a pale, clear blue. I walked slowly, trying to figure out my next move. Had they carried or enticed Schmidt off to a safe place, too? If he wasn't at the house, I had no idea where to start looking for him. But there was reason to hope they would consider him harmless and not bother to imprison him. No doubt they had concocted a convincing explanation for my failure to return the night before. My escape had changed the picture, though. Faisal had had plenty of time to report it, and they would certainly expect me to turn up. John knew I wouldn't leave Schmidt in the lurch. It all made sense to me at the time, 
So I wasn't thinking too clearly. I was tired and hungry and thirsty and worried sick about Schmidt. And even if I had known what I was soon to discover, I don't know what I could have done about it. Getting Schmidt out would still have been my first priority. I had considered somewhat vaguely the minor problem of how I was going to get past the gate or over the wall. It would have to be the gate. I hadn't the time or the equipment for climbing a wall topped with broken glass and barbed wire. And I didn't suppose for a moment that I could enter without identifying myself. My plan, if it could be called that, was simple. Get inside. After that, I hadn't the slightest idea what I was going to do after that. Oh, well, I thought. Fortune favors the brave, and the meek shall inherit the earth, and more to the point, there was a nice little gun in my bag. I might even have to use the damn thing, if it was still in the wardrobe where I had left it, and if I could get to it before I was caught. When I reached the entrance, I had my first piece of luck, and high time, too. Two large vans and a pickup truck were waiting outside the gate. The vans were closed, but the back of the pickup was open. It was also full of men, locals by their clothing. Some were sitting down, others leaned against the sides of the truck. They were delighted to see me and not inclined to ask unimportant questions. Or maybe they did ask questions. They certainly didn't get any answers. I grinned ingratiatingly and held up my hands. A dozen brawny brown arms assisted me over the tailgate, and a couple of the lads obligingly made room for me when I indicated my intention of sitting down. How true it is that language is no barrier to friendship. By the time the truck reached the house, we were close buddies. Very close. I had to detach quite a few friendly arms before I could get out, but they accepted my departure with grins and shrugs and affectionate farewells. With what I hoped was an insouciant smile, I strolled past the packers and entered the house. Once inside, I stopped being insouciant and ran along the corridor and up the first flight of stairs. My only hope, if there was hope, lay in speed. The servants probably weren't in on the deal, but if one of the others caught sight of me, I was dead meat. I reached Schmidt's door unobserved, I hoped, and turned the knob. The door wouldn't open. My brain wasn't working at top efficiency. All I could think was that they'd locked him in, that he was a prisoner. It took several important seconds for me to notice that the key was in the lock, and several equally vital seconds for my sweating fingers to turn it. The room was empty. Not only was Schmidt not there, his clothes and luggage were gone, too. I checked the wardrobe to be sure, but one glance had been enough. Schmidt can't occupy a room for five minutes without littering every surface with his possessions. The hinges of the door had been well-oiled. If I hadn't been looking in that direction, I wouldn't have known it was opening again. I made a wild grab for the nearest hard object, a brass vase, intricately worked in enamel and silver. John slid through the narrow opening and eased the door shut. He wasn't as neat as usual. His shirt was dusty, and there was a cobweb in his hair. Put that down, he said softly. I brandished the vase. What have you done with Schmidt? If you've hurt him, he's left. John kept a wary eye on my impromptu weapon, of his own free will and under his own steam. I figured it out, I said. Have you indeed? Yes. How you ever expected to get away with a stunt like this? He was trying with great difficulty to control his temper. I knew the signs, flexed hands, the taut muscles of the jaw. When he spoke, his voice shook with fury, but it was the same almost inaudible murmur. For Christ's sake, Vicky, won't you ever learn? I don't know how you got in here. Don't you? You were waiting for me. In that closet across the hall, to be precise. I was informed you'd got away, and although I hoped I was wrong for once, I had a strange foreboding you'd do something like this. Now get the hell out of here, if you can. I gave him back stare for stare. My teeth were clenched so hard my jaws hurt. I had no intention of going out that door with John standing by or of turning my back on him for so much as a split second. After a moment, his hands relaxed and he lifted his shoulders in a shrug. If that's how you want it, he said, and turned his back. He couldn't have heard me. I was wearing sneakers and the rug was thick. 
He couldn't have seen me. There was no surface to reflect my movement. He just knew. His lifted arm struck mine with a jarring force that made me lose my grip on the vase. It clattered to the floor, and I stumbled back, trying to elude those agile, reaching hands. I knew it was wasted effort, but I went on squirming and struggling, even after he'd pinioned my arms and clapped a hard hand over my mouth. He had lost the remains of his temper. His face was flushed, and he was hurting me. His nails dug into my cheek. I felt tears of pain and fury welling up in my eyes. He took his hand away from my mouth and relaxed his grip a little, but not enough to enable me to free myself. You dim-witted twit. I'm trying to get you out of this. If you yell, I'll squeeze your silly neck. Since his fingers were now wrapped around my throat, I didn't doubt he could or would carry out the threat. I took a deep breath and forced myself to relax, leaning against him. The angry color faded from his face and the corners of his mouth turned up. Don't even think about it, he murmured. I wasn't thinking at all. His hand had moved from my throat to my cheek, long fingers twisting through my hair, tilting my head back. I hate to think how I must have looked, lips parted, eyes half closed. They weren't quite closed, though, and I was facing the door. The sudden alteration of my expression, from vacant acquiescence to shamed horror, was sufficient warning. He let me go and spun around. She was wearing dark pants and a loose linen jacket that made her look like a little girl dressed in her big brother's clothes. Her hair was tied back with an amber-gold scarf. It matched the color of her wide, unblinking eyes. Why, it's you, Vicky, she said. I'm so glad you've come back. If I had ever seen murder in a man's eyes... I had read that trite phrase Lord knows how many times in Lord knows how many thrillers and taken it for a figure of speech. It wasn't a figure of speech. I saw it now. He moved so quickly I barely reacted in time, catching his upraised arm with both hands. For God's sake, John! He threw me off with a single snap of flexed muscles, like a man dislodging a snake or a venomous insect. I staggered back, slipped and sat down with a thud. I didn't hear the shot, but I heard him scream and saw him fall, his body curling into a hard knot of pain. So that was what a silencer looked like, I thought, staring at the gun in Mary's dainty hand. For some reason, I'd expected it would be bigger. Her lips parted, and out came a string of obscenities that shocked me almost as much as what she'd just done. It was like hearing Dorothy cursing Uncle Henry and Auntie M. Her pink mouth wasn't pretty now. It had the grotesque shape of a Greek fury's, and her eyes were as opaque as coffee caramels. Damn him! Why did he have to get in the way? She turned those yellow-brown eyes toward me, and the look in them made me shrink back. That pleased her. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. He won't be going anywhere for a while. And you wouldn't leave him, would you? See what you can do for him. I'd hate to have him die. I have plans for you, Vicky dear. And it won't be nearly so much fun if John isn't there to watch. The door closed. The key turned in the lock. John sat up. Missed, he said with satisfaction. I stared at the spreading stain on his sleeve. Missed, I croaked. She meant to do a bit more damage than this. He didn't have to elaborate. She must have known the only way she could stop him was to put a bullet in one or the other of us, and she probably didn't care which. If he hadn't pushed me away... And if I hadn't interfered, he could have stopped her before she aimed and fired. Out of all the questions boiling in my overheated brain, I fished the least important. Is she pregnant? Not by me, at any rate. John didn't look up. He was concentrating on rolling up his sleeve and not doing a very good job of it. 
Are you trying to tell me you didn't... You never... As you have had occasion to observe, my principles are somewhat elastic. But there are some things at which even I draw the line. All other considerations aside... He glanced at me from under his lashes. All other considerations aside, I'd as soon bed a black widow spider. If you don't believe me, and you probably don't, I can produce witnesses. Max and Whitbread took turns spending the night with us. Cozy little arrangement. Would you mind helping me with this? I should be back before long, and it would not be a good idea for either of us to be here when that event occurs. He had a point. I hoisted myself up and went to investigate the medicine cabinet. It was well equipped. You'd have thought they were expecting a small war. I slapped some gauze and tape over the bloody furrow the bullet had left. How are you planning to get out of this room? I asked. The door's locked. With these handy little devices you were clever enough to bring along. John plucked one of the picks out of my hair. Was that why you... Ow! That's the one with the hook on the end. It's caught... One of the reasons. His fingers brushed my cheek in a caress so fleeting I might have imagined it. You do it, then. I haven't had much practice at this, since I usually keep my lock picks elsewhere. Thank you. He knelt by the door and started poking at the lock. Maybe we should start thinking about where we're going after we get out, I said uneasily. The operative word, my love, is out. He seemed to be having some trouble, possibly because he was perspiring heavily, despite the comfortably cool temperature of the room. Mary won't be pleased when she finds us gone. Is she in love with you? The pick slipped and rattled onto the floor. Bloody hell, said John between his teeth. Keep your grisly suggestions to yourself, will you? If I believed that were the case, I'd cut my throat and be done with it. No. Something clicked, and his fingers tightened. Her motive is much simpler. She blames me, correctly, I must admit, for her brother's death. Her brother? Brothers. Two of them. After a brief pause, he said resignedly, The fat's deep in the fire now so I may as well abandon reticence. Or have you enough clues to reason it out for yourself? Two brothers, a strong streak of homicidal mania, and those bright, empty brown eyes. It was true. I'd only known one other person with eyes of that unusual golden brown. When I first met him, in Stockholm, I had thought him a gorgeous specimen of Nordic manhood, built like a Viking, and tall, really tall. It's hard to find men who are six inches taller than I am. I'd been prepared to overlook the fact that Leif's sense of humor was practically non-existent. But when I found out he was Max's boss and one of the gang, I sort of lost my girlish enthusiasm. John had been responsible for Leif's death, in this case, my objection to murder had been overcome by the fact that Leif had been trying to kill me and would undoubtedly have succeeded if John hadn't intervened. You didn't kill Georg, I said, watching his hands twist and press. Or did you? No, his cellmate did him in, rather messily, last year. However, since I was partially responsible for sending him away, she has some justice on her... Ah... There we are. He handed me the picks. Where are we going? I asked. I know, out. How? Any ideas? John peered cautiously through the slit in the opening door. My room. I want to get my purse. You won't need a purse if we don't make it out of here, was the depressing response. My room has a balcony. Someone is sure to spot us if we go through the house. Point taken. Come on, then. My door was locked, too. John left the key in place after he had turned it. I offered him the lockpicks. If they find the door is still locked, they may not look in here. Once they discover we've gone, they'll look everywhere. He headed for the balcony. You might have mentioned it's a 30-foot drop, 
he said, returning. I assumed you knew. We were both whispering. Footsteps had passed my door without stopping, but I had a feeling they'd soon be back. Not some sheets together. Trite, but worth a try. Now what the hell are you doing? Looking for my bag. Maybe I put it in the wardrobe. I'd been expecting it, but I started convulsively when it came. A wordless, genderless shout of rage, hardly muted by the heavy door. The response was just as audible. You two cover the doors. They may not have left the house. I recognized that voice, though it had been several years since I'd heard it. I froze, my fingers clutching the strap of my bag. John grabbed me around the waist, trying, as I thought, to pull me toward the balcony. Instead, he lifted me, shot me into the wardrobe, and closed the door. And locked it. I couldn't imagine how. I hadn't seen a key or a keyhole. But when I shoved at the damn thing, it didn't budge. Then I stopped shoving. I also stopped breathing. The door of the room had burst open. Maybe they'd look under the bed first. The wardrobe would certainly be next. There was no place else to hide, and they were obviously thorough, well-organized chaps. And while they searched for me and found me, John would have time. He had time. He was as agile as a cat. He could have dropped from the balcony and taken his chances on breaking a rib or two. I would have risked it, given the alternative. He didn't. I stood there in the dark, wincing and biting my knuckles and calling myself names as I listened to what was happening. It didn't last long. They were three to one. One of them was Hans, Max's large, slow-witted associate. I discovered this after I'd realized the interior of the wardrobe wasn't completely dark. The pierced openings in the grillwork admitted light. A couple of them were big enough to give me a clear view. Fortunately, I was too short of breath to cry out, or I might have done so when I spotted Max less than two feet away from my wide blue eye. His bald head shone as if it had been polished. The heavy horn-rimmed glasses provided an additional distraction. He must have worn contact lenses before. But if I had ever gotten a long, close look at him, I would have known him. Mr. Schroeder, Larry's secretary, had found reasonable excuses for keeping out of my way. One of Hans's ham-sized fists was wrapped around John's left arm. The guy who held his other arm was familiar, too. Rudy always looked as if he wanted to murder somebody, and his expression hadn't changed. This time I deduced he wanted to murder John. Rudy had one hand pressed against his stomach, and he was whooping for breath, but the gallant lad mustered enough strength to give John's arm a sharp upward and backward twist. John yelled, of course. Stoicism was not a quality he chose to cultivate. Gently, Max said. Gently. That is his right arm, Rudy. He must be able to use it. There was blood on his chin. I couldn't help noticing that Hans was unbruised and unbloodied. John tried to pick on people who were smaller than he was. Max took out a handkerchief, wiped his mouth, studied the resultant smear of blood with fastidious distaste, and threw the handkerchief on the floor. Where is she? he asked. John opened his eyes as wide as they would go. Who? Rudy had got his breath back. His shoulder shifted, and John let out a pained yelp. Stop it, Max said. He didn't sound as if he meant it, though. The balcony, I suppose, Max went on, while you put up a gallant battle to prevent pursuit. Or was that the reason? I find it hard to believe that you would risk yourself even for her. I was dumbfounded myself, John admitted. No doubt I did have another motive. I wonder what it could have been. You're such a profound student of human nature, Maxie. Perhaps you can suggest... Get him out of here, Max said shortly. What about the woman? Rudy demanded. His eyes moved, scanning the room. The only woman in the house is my child bride, said John smoothly. 
I wouldn't interrupt her if I were you, Rudy, old chap. She's probably sharpening her knives, or dismembering a baby, or... I knew Max would crack if he kept it up long enough. John must have known, too. Max's backhand swing was understandably aimed at his mouth. It was hard enough to snap his head back and leave him hanging limp between the men who held him. Tie him up, Max said. But here, Max, Rudy began, and gag him. If he makes one more clever remark, I may not be able to control myself. I didn't want to watch, but I couldn't stop myself. Gnawing on my knuckles, I followed the proceedings with dry-eyed, unblinking attention. They tied his wrists and ankles and used the handkerchief Max had tossed onto the floor as a gag. There was more than a smear of blood on it when they finished. Max watched, too. His back was turned to me when he said coldly, Take him away. I will stay here and search the room, just to be certain. Chapter 10 My heart should have skipped a beat, or maybe my blood should have run cold. I didn't feel a thing, except a distant, primeval urge to lay violent hands on Max. After the others had gone out, he closed the door. Then he looked at the wardrobe and said quietly, I am sorry you had to see that, Dr. Bliss. I'm sorry, too. His statement had been so unexpected, not to say in apropos, that I answered without thinking. Why not? He knew I was there. Was he now going to apologize for dragging me out and turning me over to Hans and Rudy? And Mary? Do you have a watch? I was thinking about Mary and the look in her eyes when she said she had plans for me. What? Oh, yes. Wait fifteen minutes. Most of us will have left the house by then. If you take reasonable precautions, I suggest the balcony. You should be able to leave unseen. I beg you won't try something brave and foolish. You would only be caught again. Where are you taking him? Max clicked his tongue against his teeth. Now, Dr. Bliss, you know better than to ask that. Max, please. You said you owed me a favor. I am doing you that favor. I would be in great trouble if it were known I had connived at your escape. Catch the first plane to Cairo and leave the country as soon as you are able. You know I won't do that. A sensible woman wouldn't have wasted her breath arguing with him. Vicky Bliss went right on talking. You asked me a question once, remember? I didn't know the answer then. I do now. I love him, Max. Please. Max took a step toward me. Are you crying? He asked suspiciously. I would, if I thought it would do any good, I said, sniffing. It would not. Honestly, I cannot comprehend why an intelligent woman like you should behave this way. You ought to be thanking me for... Stop that! I can't, I snuffled. The conversation between a courteous criminal and a weeping wardrobe might have seemed funny to a detached observer. I was not detached, and Max was clearly uncomfortable. I couldn't figure him out. I'd never been able to figure him out. Only in fiction do you find cold-blooded villains with one soft streak in their flinty hearts. But if he didn't mean to let me go, why had he sent Rudy and Hans away? Fifteen minutes, Max repeated. There is no use trying to follow. They will have left the house by now. She is still here, however, and she would like nothing better than to get her hands on you. You can do him no good by allowing yourself to be recaptured. He thought he was being so clever. I said between gulps, I can't get out. He locked me in. But there is no key. How? He came to the wardrobe. Ah, I see. That is good. It will hold you just long enough. Auf Wiedersehen. 
Or rather, goodbye, Dr. Bliss. I threw a few more sobs at him as he walked to the door. His shoulders twitched, but he didn't stop or turn around. I waited a few minutes, just in case. When I tried the door again, it opened without difficulty. The bolt was part of the carved ornamentation. It wasn't concealed, just inconspicuous, unless you were looking for it. I could have forced it if I had thrown myself against the door hard enough. Max had saved me the trouble. It would have been a pity to damage such a beautiful antique. John had pulled the bedclothes apart before he was interrupted. In case I haven't mentioned it, the sheets were linen, fine as silk. They knotted nicely. I took them out onto the balcony. My window overlooked the garden. I could hear sounds of activity at the back of the house. My friends the movers, I assumed. On this side, there was no one in sight, not even a gardener. But I kept an eye peeled as I tied one end of the sheets around the wrought iron railing. I slung my bag around my neck before I climbed over the balcony and took hold of the makeshift rope. I've done some rock climbing and had become rather vain about my ability to lower myself smoothly down a chimney or rock face. I soon discovered that a bedsheet is not a good substitute for ropes and pulleys. My thigh muscles wouldn't work the way they were supposed to. The sheet kept stretching, and the bag kept banging against my chest. I didn't dare discard it, though. It's bad enough to be on the run. Being on the run, sans money, passport, and other useful items, complicates the problem even more. I had to drop the last ten feet, not because the linen gave out, but because my thighs lost the struggle. Scrambling up, I scuttled along the side of the house, ducking under the windows till I reached the corner. Two of the gardeners were at work on the flowers that lined the driveway. Kneeling, their backs to me and the house, they appeared to be weeding the beds. Their dusty, faded robes blended with the shadowed foliage, and their white turbans looked like cauliflowers. There were no vehicles in the driveway. The gates at its far end were closed. So was the door next to the gates. I hadn't noticed it before, but I had anticipated it would be there for the use of visitors who came and went on foot. I had two choices. Well, actually, I had quite a few, but turning myself in didn't appeal to me, and neither did trying to get over a wall ten feet high that was topped with barbed wire and broken glass. I could make a run for it, or try to bluff my way out. I decided on the second alternative. The gardeners were bound to see me. I intended that they should. They were more likely to stop a frantic fugitive than a casual stroller. I stuck to the shrubbery as long as I could but I was still ten yards from the gate when I had to leave the path and step out into the open. One hand in my pocket, the other in my bag, I strode briskly toward the gate. One of the weeders sat back on his haunches as I passed him and gave me a curious look. I gave him a pleasant nod and managed not to break into a run. My back felt exposed, as if it had been stripped not only of clothing but of skin. My neck muscles ached as I fought the impulse to look over my shoulder. The pedestrian door was locked. I'd expected that, but I had hoped there would be a simple bar or bolt. No such luck. There wasn't even a visible keyhole. The damn thing was probably electronically controlled, like the main gates. I heard the gardener call out. From the inflection, it must have been a question. Don't you know you're supposed to check out before you leave, you rude person? Or, what the hell you think you're doing, lady? I strolled on without replying. But the next demonstration of interest was too emphatic to ignore. The bullet hit the steel panel of the big gate with a ringing crack. Obviously, it was time I stopped fooling around. I took the gun out of my bag, squatted down, pressed the barrel against the metal box at the base of the nearest column, and squeezed the trigger a few times. The position was unstable, and my legs were as unsteady as my shaking hands. The recoil toppled me over onto my back. The next bullet whistled through the empty space where my head would have been if I hadn't fallen over. The son of a bitch must be using a rifle. No hand weapon could have been so accurate at that distance. The control box was a mess of smoking ragged metal, and the gate was ajar. So far, so good but I wouldn't get far unless I could delay pursuit. I looked back. 
the man with the rifle had stopped shooting and started running. He was still some distance away, but the gardener wasn't. I could see the whites of his eyes, so I stood up and pointed the gun in his general direction. He was no hero. With a yell, he dived into the nearest bush. With an answering yell, I was beginning to lose my famous cool by that time, I dived through the door and ran, straight into a pair of grasping arms. Eyes blurred, ears ringing, on the ragged edge of hysteria, I punched him in the stomach. My fist bounced off a surface as resilient as a beach ball. He staggered back, pulling me with him, and we fell onto the seat of a waiting vehicle, which took off with a scream of tires and a stench of burning rubber. The door flapped wildly until someone slammed it. He'd fallen on top of me again. I stared up into the face in such intimate proximity to my own and burst into tears. Schmidt! Oh, Schmidt, God bless you. What the hell are you doing here? Schmidt's eyes were overflowing, too, but only as he was careful to explain, because I'd hit him in the solar plexus. As soon as we'd untangled ourselves, he put an arm around me and pressed me to his stomach. Put your head on my shoulder, little darling, he said tenderly. All will be well. Papa Schmidt is on the case. That set me off again, and Schmidt had to lend me his handkerchief and tell me to blow my nose like a good little girl. The cab took a screeching turn into an alley hardly wider than the one I'd traversed earlier that day and went careening along, scraping the walls on both sides. What's he doing? I gasped. Eluding pursuit. Schmidt's happy grin stretched from ear to ear and from mustache to double chin. Leaning forward, he tossed a handful of bills onto the front seat and shouted something in Arabic. The driver let out a whoop and roared across an intersection filled with traffic. I shut my eyes. Schmidt! I had to raise my voice to be heard over the roar of the engine and the screams of rage from the other drivers, but I strove to speak calmly. Schmidt, I think he's eluded it. Wouldn't we be less conspicuous if he drove at normal speed? That is probably true, Schmidt said reluctantly. Another fistful of money and another longish speech produced the desired effect. I have instructed him to drive us around the city for a while, Schmidt said, settling back. Now we can talk, eh? What has happened? I told him. When my voice gave out, he said gravely, So, he is a prisoner. Or dead. Schmidt shook his head so vigorously that all his chins wobbled. They won't kill him, not yet. Vicky, you are not thinking clearly. Oh, I understand. Your emotions are at war with your intelligence. Your heart aches to rush to the rescue of the man you... Shut up, Schmidt. I bit my lip. I'm sorry, Schmidt. I didn't mean it. Ha! said Schmidt. Well, I did not know what you told me about the young woman. It explains the one thing that had confused me, however. Listen to me now. Matters are more serious than I had realized, and we must act without delay. Late last night, Sir John... That's not his name. Well, I know that, but I have become accustomed to it. It suits him. Late last night, he came to my room. He said that he had sent you away for your safety, and that I too must remove myself from the house. So... Following his advice, I announced this morning that I felt it best to take myself to a hotel. Larry made only token objections. He seemed distracted. I'm sure he was. Didn't he comment on my failure to return last night? Oh, yes. He expressed concern and asked if I knew where you were. I was very clever, Schmidt said, puffing himself up. I said that you were a grown-up woman and that this was not the first time you had gone off with a handsome young man. Thanks a lot. The important thing was not that he believed it, but that he believed I believed it, said Schmidt. He added, smirking, This facade of naivete, I assume, is very useful. No one tried to prevent me from leaving. <laughs> but they will be sorry when they find how they have underestimated... Schmidt, 
I said, trying to articulate through clenched teeth. At some future date, I will spend an entire day telling you how brilliant you are. Right now, I'm in something of a hurry. Stick to the point. How did you happen to turn up today? In the nick of time, Schmidt pointed out. It was not a coincidence that I was there. I didn't think it was. My teeth weren't clenched. They were bared. Schmidt said hurriedly, Yes, I will tell you, if you will stop the interruptions. I went, as I had said I would, to the Winter Palace Hotel and checked myself in. I was eating Mittagessen when a waiter summoned me to the telephone. It was Faisal. He was calling me, he said, at the instruction of a mutual friend. You had foolishly run away from him, Faisal, that is, and he, the friend, feared you would return to the house of Larry Blenkiron. He, the friend, strongly advised that I should adopt evasive measures for my own sake, and for your sake I should hover outside the gates and try to intercept you. I had a sudden, insane mental image of Schmidt hovering over the house like the Goodyear blimp, or a very well-fed angel. It won't be heaven to Schmidt unless there is an unending flow of fattening food. You were too quick for me, Schmidt went on, frowning. I was still hoping to see you come when I heard the guns shooting and knew they must be shooting at you or at, uh, at John. So I leaped from the taxi, telling the driver to be ready for instant departure and was about to break down the gate when you emerged. Break down the gate, I repeated. How did... Never mind. You're a hero, Schmidt. If you hadn't been there, I'd never have made it. If it had not been for the foresight and noble sacrifice of John, you would not have made it, Schmidt corrected. So, now we must rescue him, eh? Do you know where they have taken him? They didn't take him anywhere. I stared at my hand. The knuckles were raw. John managed to to distract the other guys. They aren't awfully bright, but he didn't fool Max. Max knew there hadn't been time for me to get away. He figured I had to be hiding somewhere in the room. The wardrobe was the most obvious place. When he told them to tie John up, he was trying to mislead me, to suggest that they intended to transport him some distance. Rudy even started to question the order, but Max cut him off. John is still there, so I've got to go back. Aber natürlich, Schmidt said. I had to leave him, Schmidt. I had to convince Max I had fallen for his fabrication and make sure the others knew I was gone. My departure was a little more conspicuous than I meant it to be, I admitted. But now they'll be off guard. They won't expect me to come back. If I'd hung around... Stop it, Vicky. Schmidt stifled me with the handkerchief. I blew my nose and mopped my face while he continued gently. You do not have to convince me. To have acted otherwise would have been folly. Sorry, I muttered. I get nervous when people shoot at me. Ha, said Schmidt. Now be quiet and I will tell you some things. Did you think I was so stupid I did not know what you were doing? From the first I have known... Known more than you, Miss Know-it-all. I told you I never forget a face. The moment I set eyes on the secretary of Mr. Blank Iron, I recognized him for the criminous cutter of silhouettes. How could you? I demanded incredulously. You never saw Max. He was in jail. And that is where I saw him, in the jail. But I was curious, Schmidt admitted. I am interested in the criminal mentality. And what you had told me of him suggested he was an unusual person. On the boat he kept away from you, but he did not expect I would remember. As soon as I recognized him, I knew there was trouble brewing, which I had of course suspected as soon as I saw Sir John. A coincidence that you and he should both be on that boat. You insult me to think I would believe such a story. You pretended to believe it. Well, of course. My feelings were deeply wounded by your lack of faith in me. But I forgave you, Schmidt said magnanimously. For the desperateness of the situation became clear to me 
when I recognized that terrible man. The one thing I did not know was the identity of the young woman. But of course I realized that it was only a marriage of convenience and that his heart still belonged to you. I started to say something sarcastic, but I changed my mind. If his heart didn't belong to me, he had gone to considerable lengths for the sake of friendship. How did you figure that out? I asked meekly. From the way he did not look at you when he thought others were looking, and the way he did look at you when he thought others were not. You, said Schmidt judiciously, were more skilled at concealing your feelings. Had I not known better, I would have believed you were adversaries instead of... Yeah, right. Did John tell you what they're planning, Schmidt? No, he did not have to tell me. I knew. How did... Oh, hell, never mind that now. I looked out the window of the cab. Palm trees, flower beds, the rippling river beyond. First things first. Did you check out of the Winter Palace? No, you see... For God's sake, Schmidt! They know you're there. They'll be looking for you. Schmidt let out a roar. For all his pretended calm, his nerves weren't in much better shape than mine. Give me some credit for good sense, Vicky. If I had checked out, they would only look for me somewhere else. Now they will wait for me to return. I left my luggage, but I have with me all we will need. He indicated the briefcase on the seat next to him. You're right, and I'm a fool, I said humbly. No, you are not a fool. You are fearing for the life and safety of the man you... I didn't want to scream at him, but I knew I would if he said it, so I cut in. I have the essentials with me, too. I've got to get rid of this gold and turquoise bag. It's too conspicuous. Now you are thinking, Schmidt said approvingly. He leaned forward and addressed the driver. I didn't know you spoke Arabic. I speak all languages, Schmidt twirled his mustache. My Arabic is not good, however. Only a few phrases. Following, I assumed, Schmidt's instructions, the cab stopped at one of the street markets and Schmidt hopped out. He returned with an armful of souvenirs, including a new bag. This one was black, with the head of Nefertiti on one side and rows of hieroglyphs on the other. A good half of the souvenirs sold in Egypt have Nefertiti on them. Now where? I asked, transferring passport, wallet, and a few dozen other objects into the new bag. The ETAP, Schmidt answered. It is good that you have your passport. We'll need them in order to register. Under our own names? Unless you happen to have a false passport with you. We have no other choice, Schmidt said, with pardonable sarcasm. You know the regulations for foreigners, and don't tell me you should choose a less expensive hotel. When they begin looking for us, they will look in the cheaper places, thinking that we would not be so foolish as to go to another four-star hotel. It is what you call the double vemi, Schmidt added. I hated to get out of that taxi. I felt as conspicuous as a stoplight. However, I was less conspicuous at an expensive hotel, with other tall, blonde female tourists around, than I had been in the back streets of Luxor. Schmidt had had another bright idea. So, following his suggestion, I hung back, studying a rack of brochures, while he registered. The old boy was really in top form today, and I was not. If they tracked him down, he could come up with a legitimate excuse for changing hotels. And my name would not be on the register. As he passed me, following the bellboy, he said loudly, The fourth floor, you say? I waited a few minutes before following. When I got out on the fourth floor, Schmidt was waiting to lead me to his room. It was a nice room, with a balcony and twin beds. Not that I expected to occupy one. Good work, Schmidt, I said. Now we have to call the room service, said Schmidt, suiting the action to the word. When he comes, you will hide in the bathroom. Now close your mouth, Vicky. It looks very ugly when it is in that shape. I know the anguish that grips you, the frantic need to rush to the rescue of the man you... No, I said. I don't think you do, Schmidt. 
But it is important that we organize ourselves instead of running headlong into danger and inevitable defeat. How long has it been since you have eaten? I sat down on one of the beds. I don't remember. We will be running and shooting and using much energy, Schmidt said with evident relish. We will need all our strength and cunning. We must procure disguises and weapons and money, much more money, for bribes and for... You can't come with me, Schmidt. But Vicky! Come here, Schmidt. I patted the bed next to me. Pouting, Schmidt sat down. I put my arms around him, as far around as they would go. You're the man I love, Schmidt. You're also about a thousand percent smarter than anybody I know, including me. Especially me. I will have something to eat, and I will assume any disguise you can supply, and I will proceed with the utmost care and caution. But one person has a better chance of sneaking into that place than two. Especially when one of them was the size of Schmidt. I'd have cut my tongue out before saying it, though. I went on. And one of us has to play backup. If I don't make it, you'll have to come in for me. That, I added quickly, is a football term, Schmidt. Not a literal suggestion. I mean, I know the football, Schmidt sniffed. He had given me his handkerchief, so he wiped his eyes with the back of his hand. You mean I must go to the police? Why don't we do that now? I can think of at least two good... A knock on the door interrupted me. I dragged myself into the bathroom and splashed water on my face while I waited for the waiter to leave. The face needed a lot more than water, but I got the worst of the dirt off before Schmidt called me back. I know the reasons, too, he said, waving me into a chair. It will be hard to convince the police they must invade the home of so distinguished a visitor as Herr Blankiron. Have you any proof, Vicky, of what he plans? No. I put things in my mouth and chewed them. Swallowing wasn't easy, but I managed it. That's one reason. The other, yes, I have thought of that too. For once, Schmidt didn't appear to be enjoying his food. Neither of us wanted to say it. Even supposing the cops could be persuaded to search the house, they might not find anything. It's easier to hide a dead body than a live one. John knew exactly what they were planning. They still needed him for one part of the scheme. I was pretty sure I knew what part. But they'd work around that rather than take the risk of letting him talk to the authorities. Another thing concerns me, Schmidt said, tactfully changing the subject. Is there a possibility, do you think, that not all the police are honest? It's a dead certainty, I think, that some of them are not. There are a few people in any security service, in any country, who can be bought. I put my fork down and stared dismally at my boss. There's another little problem, Schmidt. I doubt that even John knows who is in blank iron's pay and who is unwitting. If we pick the wrong person... Eat, eat, Schmidt urged. Do not lose heart. We will not pick the wrong person because we will go straight to the tops. My old acquaintance... Dr. Ramadan, the director of the Cairo Museum, and my dear friend, the interior minister, and the pleasant individual I met at a conference. I'll leave it to you, Schmidt, I said. I couldn't eat. I couldn't think. I couldn't sit still a second longer. At that moment, I was in complete sympathy with the people who want to censor films because of excessive explicit violence. Obviously, I'd seen too many of them. Technicolor images kept flashing across the screen of my mind. Help me figure out how I'm going to get back in that place. The main gate was out. They'd be guarding it closely, especially since I had wrecked the electronic controls. Once inside, there was a chance I could mingle with the packers long enough to enter the house. If the packers were still there, and if I could climb that damned wall, and if my turban didn't fall off, Forget it, I said impatiently, grabbing the strip of white cloth from Schmidt after it had collapsed around my ears for the third time. I can't put it on till after we leave the hotel anyhow. I'll cheat and use safety pins. 
He'd had to make a quick shopping trip. There were dozens of shops and souvenir stands along the Corniche. The only problem he'd had was finding a jellabilla without sequins, embroidery, or bright braid. The one he'd brought back was plain gray. After I'd wadded it up and rubbed it in the flower box on the balcony and frayed the hem, it looked reasonably authentic. The white cloth was a cotton scarf designed for female tourists. My handsome tanned complexion came out of a bottle. What else have you got in there? I asked, curiosity overcoming my raging impatience as Schmidt replaced the bottle in his briefcase. Contact lenses, said Schmidt. Black ones and brown ones. Scissors, they are useful for many things. Dye for the hair. I declined the hair coloring. It would take too long to dry, and if it was the same stuff Schmidt had used on his mustache, it would probably run. Travelers checks, Schmidt continued, and money. Take it, you may need it. I will cash more travelers checks this afternoon. And take this also. I put the cash into my pocket. The other offering was a knife. Where'd you get that? I demanded. He must have brought the other things all the way from Munich but he could never have gotten the knife through customs. It had a worn wooden hilt and a blade eight inches long. The edges shone. From the taxi driver, Schmidt said calmly. He did not have a gun, but he... Thanks. I was in no mood to be fussy. I was only sorry the taxi driver hadn't packed an Uzi. I didn't get to use my pretty new bag after all. I filled my pockets with as many useful items as they would hold and fastened them securely with safety pins. Schmidt was talking, something about Cairo, but I cut him off. Let's go. I assumed my disguise in the taxi. Watching in the rearview mirror, the driver was so interested he almost ran over a bicycle and two Swedish tourists. Schmidt told him some story, something indecent, probably, because the driver howled with laughter, and Schmidt blushed when I asked him what he'd said. He dropped me off, and I waved bye-bye to him as the taxi headed back along the corniche. The arrangements had taken longer than I would have liked. The sun was sinking toward the cliffs of the west bank, and the river reflected the glow of gathering sunset. It might have been more sensible to wait until after dark before I made the attempt. In fact, there was no question about it. It would have been more sensible. Carrying my shopping bag, I shuffled along the broken sidewalk in my backless leather slippers. For once, I was grateful I had feet as big as a man's. The women's slippers were gaudy affairs with turned-up toes and gilt trim. By the time I'd gone a few hundred yards, my footwear was dusty and scuffed, like the shoes of the other pedestrians. What I saw at the entrance to the Institute made me duck into the first street leading away from the Corniche. I had expected guards. I hadn't expected they would be wearing black uniforms. It was depressing confirmation of the doubts Schmidt and I had had earlier. Larry must have convinced the police he needed protection. If they were stationed all around the perimeter, I was in deep trouble. By the time I'd worked my way around to the back of the estate, blue shadows were gathering, and my nerves were ready to snap. I'd been warned away from the wall by one guy carrying a rifle and wearing a uniform, and there were apartment buildings facing it across a narrow street. Finally, I reached a place where the buildings were replaced by a vacant lot, filled with weeds and tumbled masonry. The base of the wall was in deepening shadow, and the mud plaster had flaked leaving crevices between the underlying bricks. Nobody was around. It was now or never, and by that time I was about ready to whip out my gun and shoot anybody who tried to stop me, if, that is, there were any bullets in the gun. I couldn't remember how many shots I'd fired. Several. I've never climbed anything as fast as I did that wall. At any second, I expected to hear a shout or a shot— Hanging on by my toenails in one hand, I reached into the shopping bag, slung onto my back, and pulled out the pillow I had taken from Schmidt's bed. It helped some, but the barbed wire ripped a gash in my long skirts as I swung my leg over. It didn't do my shin any good either. I didn't try climbing down, I just let go. The ten-foot drop knocked the breath out of me, and the shrub through which I fell had lots of thorns. It was a nice thick shrub, though. 
I blessed Larry's landscaper for wanting to hide that ugly wall. I had left my Nefertiti bag with Schmidt and was wearing my own clothes under the jalabiyya. After gathering up the odds and ends that had fallen out of my pockets, I peered through the branches and tried to figure out where I was. The swimming pool, or to be more precise, the surrounding fence, oriented me. I pinned my turban back on and headed for the house, skulking along in the shrubbery when I could, dashing across the open spaces when I couldn't. It would be dark before long, but if the movers had quit for the day, apparently the gardeners were about to do so. I spotted a couple of them heading for a shed, rakes and spades over their shoulders. Some of the others, the ones I particularly didn't want to meet, must be away from the house, not heading for another hideout, as Max had tried to make me believe, but searching for poor little me. They needed me, not for my sweet self, but in order to persuade John to carry out his part of the deal. And I needed John, not only for his sweet self, but because he knew the answers to certain vital questions. How far had the corruption spread? How many people were in on the scheme? One reason why I was reluctant to appeal to the police, or the SSI, was that I felt certain some of them must be involved. The man I had met in Larry's office, who had insisted on the conveniently anonymous appellation of Ahmed, had to be in Larry's pay. The purpose of that interview was clear to me now. It had been intended to get me off the case and convince me there was no need to contact anyone else. Until I spotted Max, I hadn't been certain Larry was involved. They could have done the job without his knowledge, though it would have been difficult. But Larry had lied about how long his secretary had been with him. A year ago, Max had been in a Swedish prison. Larry had pulled the necessary strings and gotten him out when he was needed. It's terrifying the amount of power money can wield. All the complex aspects of the plot had been made easier by Larry's influence and wealth. He probably owned the Queen of the Nile, and the crew, and the captain, and the engineer who had dutifully demolished the refrigeration machinery, and Jean-Louis and Faisal. It wasn't fair. Everybody was on Larry's side. Except John, who was, as usual, on his own side. Not entirely, though. Not any longer. I didn't dare think about his reasons for defying the others, or the price he would probably have to pay. I didn't dare think about a lot of things. If I did, the defenses I'd built up over the years would crumble and fall, and I couldn't afford that kind of weakness now. As I approached the side entrance, I heard voices. The movers were working late, but one look told me this clever idea wasn't going to work a second time. The man who stood by the open door, watching them pass in and out, was wearing European clothes. Though darkness was not yet complete, the floodlights illumining the entrance had been turned on, enabling him to see their faces clearly. They also enabled me to see his features clearly. I had known him as Bright. I had a hunch that wasn't his real name. The floodlights served me as well, half blinding him to anything that was going on outside their glare. I sidled through the landscaping until I reached the terrace. As I crawled on hands and knees in the dubious shelter of the low walls, one of my sandals fell off. Instead of replacing it, I kicked the other one off. Once I was inside the house, bare feet would be quieter and quicker than those clumsy sandals. I had come prepared to break the glass if I had to. One of the useful objects Schmidt had pressed upon me was a roll of tape. However, the French doors weren't locked. The parlor was lighted, but empty. After I had closed the door behind me, I relaxed a little, though I knew the feeling of greater safety was mostly wishful thinking. There were places to hide, behind draperies and furniture, but several of the pieces I'd seen before were gone. Into one of the moving vans, I supposed. I wished I were more familiar with the plan of the house. Somewhere, I felt certain, there were rooms not open to the general public, and I wasn't thinking of the kitchen and service areas. But if they were as secret as they had to be, underground, protected by every possible security device, access wouldn't be easy. 
I had decided I would investigate the bedrooms first. My turban had come unhitched, and my hands were too unsteady to deal with the damn thing. I tied it around my neck in a neat Girl Scout knot and padded toward the hall and the front stairs. If the man who came down the stairs had been barefoot, I would have walked right into him. He was wearing boots, and his step was firm and confident. I heard him coming and ducked back into the parlor, praying that room wasn't his destination. He went the other way, heading for Larry's study. The door opened, and I heard voices before it closed again. Evidently, a business meeting was in progress. There'd been several voices, including a woman's soprano, considerably louder and shriller than her usual soft tones. I hadn't dared look to see who the latest arrival had been. Max? Larry? But at least four of them were now in the office. Lifting my skirts, I ran up the stairs. All the doors along the corridor were closed. Lights in antique bronze sconces shone brightly. A methodical searcher would have tried each door in turn. That procedure had its risks, however. It was too much to expect that all of them would be in Larry's study. If I opened the door of an occupied room, the search would end then and there. I tried the door of Schmidt's former room first, and then that of my own. Both were dark. I had to turn on the lights to make certain nobody was there. It wasn't a very smart move, but I hadn't thought of bringing a flashlight. There were a lot of things I hadn't thought of. Time was getting on. The meeting could break up at any moment. It occurred to me that maybe I ought to find a place where I could hide in case someone came upstairs. If I couldn't find him right away, if he wasn't in this part of the house, I'd have to wait till after they'd gone to bed before I resumed the search. Maybe I'd be lucky enough to overhear a snatch of conversation. Let us go to the cellar, which is reached by a flight of stairs next to the kitchen, and see how our guest, sneering laughter, is getting on. Fat chance. I'd been associating with Schmidt too long even to imagine such a thing. It was likely that he was in the cellar, if there was a cellar, or in one of the other buildings. Checking the bedrooms was probably a waste of time, but it had to be done, and now was the best time, before the occupants of the house retired for the night. First, though, I needed to find a place where I could hide temporarily. The narrow, unadorned door at the back of a shallow recess looked as if it led to another broom closet or a linen closet. So I tried it first. No one would be there. Someone was, though. It was a small room, only eight or ten feet square, with a single window. Shelves along two of the walls indicated that its original function had been that of storage, of linens or other household objects. The furniture consisted of a cot, a table, and a few chairs. They hadn't even bothered to lock the door. His head had fallen forward, and his body sagged against the ropes that bound him to the chair. I hadn't dared hope I would find him in pristine condition. I'd even braced myself for a little blood but only the dark hours of nightmare could have prepared me for this. The stains covered his shirt like a macabre, crazy quilt pattern of rust and scarlet, some patches still wet and bright, some dried to ugly brown. The sound I made was wordless, more like a bird's squawk than anything human, but John must have recognized my voice. His head lifted alertly, and his face was set in a scowl. You again, he said, without enthusiasm. What? His face was unmarked except for a swollen lip. I cleared my throat and tried again. What did they... It's called the death of a thousand cuts. Or something equally picturesque. Lower percentages are employed for purposes of discipline or persuasion. The scowl became even more pronounced. The primary subject of the interrogation was your present whereabouts. I ought to have told them not to bother, because you'd be sure to turn up before long. Christ almighty, Vicky, wasn't one encounter with that ghastly woman enough? I've been trying for two days to get you out of here, but you keep coming back like a 
a bloody boomerang. You're the nastiest, most ungrateful bastard I've ever... I began. If you're going to shout, at least close the door. Oh. I closed the door. Dare I flatter myself that you came after me this time? John inquired, in his most poisonously polite voice. Very good of you, I'm sure. All right. Let's try the escape bit again. If we keep practicing, we may get it right one day. I trust it occurred to you to bring along a weapon, possibly even a knife. If you didn't, there's one on the table. I'd already seen it and was trying hard not to look at it. The blade was dark and clotted. Hoisting my skirts, I whipped out my own knife. I'd wrapped a cloth around it as a makeshift scabbard. A look of apprehension replaced John's scowl as I wobbled toward him. Do please watch what you're doing. There are several essential arteries running down the extremities. And your knowledge of anatomy... I don't suppose it's as expert as hers... I had no doubt who had used that knife. His shirt was open, and I could see some of the cuts, arranged in patterns as neat as cross-stitch. I managed to free his ankles without slashing an artery, and then crawled around behind the chair. When the knife touched his bare arm, he made a profane remark, and I snapped. I'm trying to slide it down between your wrists. The rope is pretty tight. Oh, is it really? If you don't stop twitching and complaining, it'll be your own damn fault if you end up with a spouting artery. After the last of the ropes had fallen away, John rose briskly to his feet and immediately dropped to his knees. Instinctively, I reached for him. He flinched away from my touch. No, just uh, give me a minute. I stood looking helplessly down at him as he fought to control his ragged breathing. Sweat had darkened his hair, and his wrists were ringed with ridged flesh. John, I whispered. I, uh, I, well? He didn't look up, but his shoulders straightened as if in expectation. I, I'm sorry. You're sorry, John repeated. Well, uh. It was very nice of you to lock me up in the wardrobe and, and all the rest. Of course, if you had taken the trouble to mention at an earlier point in time that Mary was one of the gang and a closet sadist, none of this would have happened. Oh, well done, John said. For a moment there, I feared that the Vicky I know and love had gone soft. He fumbled in his pant pocket. His hands were still numb. He managed to extract a small tin, but it slipped through his fingers when he tried to open it. Let me. I picked it up. Though I think you'll need something a little stronger than aspirin. That is something a little stronger than aspirin. One of the white and two of the yellow, please. I didn't like the looks of those pills. If they weren't illegal, they were dangerous. Maybe both. This didn't seem an appropriate time for a lecture on drugs, however. Can you swallow them without water? I'll have to, won't I? After he'd forced them down, I said, Maybe we'd better get moving. I couldn't agree more. Perhaps we ought first to discuss the method of escape you have in mind. I trust you do have a method in mind. I hadn't gotten that far. I admitted. Hadn't you? We were both kneeling. When he turned his head, his eyes were on a level with mine. Neither of us spoke for a moment. Then he said, Unless you were planning to tuck me under one arm and make a break for it, you'll have to contain yourself for, say, ten minutes. It will take that long for those pills to kick in. Until they do, I might manage a slow crawl. Did they say when they'd be back? No. They were not so considerate as that. Have you been here all this time? Not in the wardrobe, surely. No, I left, thanks to Max. He knew I was in the wardrobe. That shocked him into relative alertness. What? How do you know? 
We had a long talk. He sent Hans and Rudy out of the room before he spoke to me, and he obviously meant to let me get away. But he refused to tell me where they were taking you, even after I... I... Uh... You seem to be suffering from a speech disability, John remarked. You, uh, what? Are you ready to... No. What did you do or say to poor old Maxie? Burst into tears? Tell him you... Oh, Christ, John said, reading my face as only he could. You didn't. You didn't really give Max... Max, of all people, the old Romeo and Juliet routine. Did you threaten to perch on my tombstone and drink poison? Did you promise you'd follow him to the ends of the earth and stab him before throwing yourself off the battlements a la Tosca? I'm immensely touched that you should perjure yourself for me, darling. But my opinion of your intelligence has been sadly shaken. You'd have stood a better chance of softening a rattlesnake than that cold-blooded, cynical. The door opened just far enough to admit a man, and then closed as quietly. The man was Max. Ah, he said softly. I thought I'd find you here. My skirts were bunched up under me. I had to stand before I could get at my gun. Max watched interestedly while I fumbled in my pockets. John didn't move a muscle. His mouth was still open and his eyes were glazed. Finally, I got the gun out and pointed it at Max. Don't call for help, I said. My dear Dr. Bliss, I had time to recite an entire sonnet while you were trying to locate that weapon, Max said. Something by Shakespeare, or Mrs. Browning, perhaps. I am not as familiar with your English poets as I would like to be. John closed his mouth and cleared his throat, but he wasn't yet capable of speech. I said, Turn around, Max, so you can strike me unconscious with the butt of the gun. I think not, Dr. Bliss. It would be painful for me and counterproductive for you. John got unsteadily to his feet and took the gun from me. He squinted at it and then slipped it into his belt. Would you care to elaborate on that, Max? My meaning should be clear, Max said. I am going to help you escape. Chapter 11 it was fortunate John was too petrified to argue or make long-winded, sarcastic speeches. Time was running out on us. The meeting had broken up. People were dispersing to dress for dinner and for other purposes. Max was waiting for Mary. He'd told us what we were to do, but he wouldn't answer my questions. There was no time, he'd said. And when I heard that shrill, arrogant voice outside the door where we stood listening, I understood. He'd expected she would want to amuse herself for a while before she changed. Get out of my way, Max. No, I forbid it. You have done enough already. You have no authority over me. Then I would appeal to someone who does. His voice hardened. He will not allow you to endanger the entire enterprise. She spat out a string of nouns and adjectives, I thought she was applying them to Max until he replied dryly, I have no fondness for Tregarth either, but business must take precedence over personal resentment. He cannot be forced to carry out his part of the plan unless we hold a hostage as surety for his compliance, and he will be unable to carry it out if you go on playing your little games with him. I have locked the door and I will keep the key so don't bother coming back after I have gone. She stormed off, using language no lady should employ, and I heard the reverberation as she slammed her door. Max moved away without speaking to us. He'd already given us our instructions, and I couldn't blame him for minimizing the risk to himself. They probably kept Mary happy by letting her play with traitors and other expendable individuals before disposing of them. 
Her brother had been fond of knives, too. Max had given me the key and told me to lock the door. My hand was clenched so tightly, John had to pry my fingers loose one by one before he could take it from me. What are you doing? I demanded in a hoarse whisper. He told us to stay here. He told us not to attempt to leave the house for an hour, John corrected. I'd prefer to wait elsewhere. I don't entirely share your blind faith in Maxie. Why is he doing this, then? God knows. But you can be certain it isn't because his heart was touched by an appeal to sentiment, of which he has none. Possibly he's come to think of you as a kind of mascot or good luck charm. He's frightfully superstitious. Look at those ghastly silhouettes of his. They aren't a hobby any longer. They've become an obsession. He unlocked the door and then turned to look at me. Do you want your gun back? No. Then get the knife. You left it on the floor by the chair. And don't put it in your pocket. Keep hold of it. Stay close behind me. If we're spotted and I tell you to run, do it, without one of those interminable arguments of yours, and without looking back. Is that clear? I nodded. His orders had been perfectly clear. Whether or not I would follow them was another matter. Come on, then. Either he had explored the house more systematically than I had had the opportunity of doing, or he had stayed there before. Instead of heading for the main stairs, he turned in the opposite direction. We had to pass several of the bedrooms, including Mary's, and if I hadn't reached a state of total emotional paralysis, I would have dropped in my tracks when I heard a crash and an inarticulate shriek from her room. The cry had been one of rage. She must be relieving her feelings by smashing lamps, vases, and other fragile objects. John's long, even stride didn't alter. He was moving more easily now. The end of the corridor was in shadow. There were no wall sconces near it. What I had taken to be a dead end turned out to be a door, painted the same neutral color as the wall. When he opened it, I saw a landing with narrow, uncarpeted steps leading down and another flight going up. It was lighted by a single bulb on the ceiling. I ought to have known there would be a separate staircase for the servants. Not that the knowledge would have helped. There would be people in that part of the house, too. I felt somewhat easier after John had closed the door. But when he sat down on the topmost step, I said nervously, What are you waiting for? The servants will be coming this way. No, they won't. Not for a while. Leaning back, supporting his weight on his elbows, he went on in the same subdued voice. It's obvious that you've never seriously contemplated a career in crime. If you do, bear in mind that strict attention to schedules is vitally important. Human beings are creatures of habit, and the older they get, the more they insist on regularity. Blenkiron always dines at 7.15. The servants will be preparing dinner for the guests and eating their own. They don't come upstairs to turn down the beds and so on until the guests have retired to... John, if you don't stop lecturing and start answering questions, I'm going to scream. Ask a sensible question, then. How did you get involved with... No. No. That is a reasonable question, I admit. But under the present circumstances, it is less relevant than a number of others, and the answer would involve a prolonged explanation, which you probably wouldn't believe anyhow. Try again, keeping in mind that our primary concern at this moment... All right. Are we going to stay here until eight o'clock? What time is it? 7.15. How time flies when one is enjoying oneself, John murmured. For the next half hour... This is as safe a place as any. I have a little errand to do before we leave. You wait here while I... No. It may be a bit tricky. No, I'm not letting you out of my sight. John studied me speculatively. I scooted back, out of his reach. Oh, no, you don't. Not another sock on the jaw for my own good. It's a tempting idea. But in this case, it might do more harm than good. Besides, you'd probably hit me back. Come along, then. Don't forget what I told you. The stairs ended at another closed door. 
When John eased it open, I started. The voices sounded as if they were only a few feet away. They were. The room to our left was the kitchen. I could smell cooking and hear pots and dishes rattling. John went the other way, moving as soundlessly as if he too were barefoot. I hadn't been in this part of the house, and I had no idea where we were or where we were going, so I stayed close on his heels. When he opened the next door, I didn't know where we were, and that encouraging old adage about the frying pan and the fire came back to me. Ahead was the main hall of the house, lighted like a stage by the hanging brass chandelier and a dozen sconces. The open archway to my right led to the parlor. Lights blazed from the room as well. In another forty minutes, give or take five minutes, Larry and his guests would be entering it. On my left was the staircase. I'd have preferred to stay in the illusory safety of the shadows cast by that massive structure, but John didn't pause. He walked unconcernedly past the foot of the stairs and entered the corridor that led to the library and Larry's study. Apparently, he'd been right about the household schedule. We met no one. When we reached the study, John's fingers pressed a switch and prodded a button, both concealed in the carving of the frame, before he turned the knob. So, I thought, this wasn't the first time he'd enjoyed Larry's hospitality. He was one of the world's most efficient snoops, but even he couldn't have discovered so many useful details in two days. It was at this point that John's theories failed. I suppose it was something of a compliment to me that Larry had taken the precaution of stationing a guard in his study. Or, to look at it another way, it was something of an insult. Had he really believed I'd be foolhardy enough to return? Well, he'd been right. And if I had been looking for evidence of guilt, this was where I'd have looked first. The guard was the man I had known as Sweet. He was eating his supper off a tray and he must have assumed his visitors were members of the household, familiar with the security system. That moment of misapprehension, brief though it was, saved our necks. Dropping his fork, he reached for his shoulder holster, but he was too slow. John had him covered. Get his gun, John said. Go round behind him, far around, if you'll forgive me for pointing out the obvious. Sweet's expression didn't live up to the nom de guerre he had chosen. His eyes, unblinking as those of a reptile, followed me as I sidled to one side, giving him a wide berth. I was not looking forward to coming within arm's reach of him, but I didn't have to. As soon as I'd reached a point at which Sweet had to turn his head to follow my progress, John hit him, not with a gun, but with his left fist. I didn't know you were ambidextrous, I said, removing my Girl Scout neckerchief and winding it around Sweet's wrists. I'm not. Bloody hell, that hurt. Stop complaining and help me. I need some rope. Sorry, I'm fresh out. Removing his belt, he used it to bind Sweet's angles. We need a gag. Where's that nice, clean white handkerchief a proper gent always carries? Never mind the gag. John went to the fireplace and began running his hands over the paneling next to it. What time is it? 7.25. Not much time. I hope to God I haven't forgotten. Ah, that's done it. A section of the paneling slid aside under the pressure of his hands. I couldn't see lights behind it. They must have come on automatically when the door was opened. Go ahead, he said. I'll fetch the unwanted baggage. Larry's quite a romantic, isn't he? I remarked, starting down the stairs the open panel had disclosed. Secret passages all over the place. There's a good and sufficient practical reason for this bit of romanticism. John followed me, towing sweet by his feet. I am, as a rule, a tender-hearted person, but I didn't wince when I heard his head bounce from step to step. There was no door at the bottom of the stairs. They opened directly into a large, windowless room. No wonder I hadn't been impressed with Larry's collection of antiquities. Here was the real collection, his own private collection, hidden away from all eyes but his. The room was softly lit and carpeted. The air was cool, the temperature and humidity carefully controlled to preserve the exhibits. 
They stood along the walls and rested in velvet-lined cases. The cases were open, so he could touch and fondle to his heart's content. My eyes moved in dazed disbelief from one masterpiece to another. The lovely little statuette of Teta Sherry in the British Museum was a fake, all right. The original was here. So was the Nefertiti bust. Not the painted bust in Berlin, but the other, even more beautiful, that was, was supposed to be in the Cairo Museum. Had I been mistaken about Larry's ultimate intent, after all? The contents of this room represented the greatest art theft in history. Getting them out of the museum and into this room was only half the battle. He was in the process of finishing the job, getting his prizes out of Egypt. Packed in among his household effects, they would pass through customs without a hitch. No one would be boorish enough to inspect the possessions of the great philanthropist, the man who had just presented Egypt with a multi-million dollar institute. Wasn't this enough for Larry? No. My original reasoning still held, tenuous and unsupported though it was. The convenient breakdown of the Queen of the Nile, the violent death of the new director of the Institute, only a few hours after he'd found a sympathetic and notoriously inquisitive listener in me, the precise timing of Larry's permanent departure from Egypt, his bizarre obsession, the collection I saw before me was a convincing demonstration of that obsession. Almost every object in the room depicted or had belonged to a queen or princess. Many of the cases were empty, their contents already transferred to the wooden packing boxes that spoiled the neatness of the room. But there was lots left. A small head of an Amarna princess, a diadem of twisted golden wire set with tiny turquoise flowers. John heard me gasp. I wondered if you'd spot that, he said dragging Sweet into a corner and turning one of the empty boxes over on top of him. The diadem had been buried with a princess of the Middle Kingdom. I'd found a sketch of it in the workshop of the goldsmith who had been producing fake jewels for the gang in Rome. The original had been in the Cairo Museum, not the Metropolitan, as I had ignorantly supposed at the time. Obviously, it wasn't there now. You... I began. You? You started this that long ago? This sort of collection takes a while to build up, John said coolly. He joined me and studied the lovely thing with obvious appreciation. Then he shook his head regretfully. Too large and too fragile. This will do the trick just as well, I expect. The object he shoved carelessly into his pocket was a pectoral, its complex design dominated by a huge scarab of lapis lazuli. It had belonged to Tutankhamun. John took my limp hand and led me up the stairs. Time, he asked, closing the sliding panel. Uh, 7.40. We may as well get into position, then. Do you know what Max has planned? I have an inkling, yes. Don't tell me you haven't anticipated his intentions. You're the one who's supposed to be in charge of this rescue. I snarled at him. The sight of that incredible collection, a good deal of which had probably come to Larry via John, had made me remember what he was. And the sight of him, bright-eyed and cheerful and higher than a kite in a March gale, didn't relieve my apprehensions any. I'd had more than a nodding acquaintance with amphetamines and other useful drugs during my days as a grad student. Sooner or later he would crash, and to judge by the immediate effects, it would be a long, hard fall. Some of the cuts were still bleeding. The bright splashes of red looked like flowers against the rusty stains. He saw me staring at his shirt and misinterpreted my expression. Lend me that peculiar garment you're wearing. What for? For God's sake, Vicky, pull yourself together and stop asking silly questions. It won't serve you as a disguise, not with that mop of blonde hair shining like a beacon. And you can probably run faster without it. If, as I hope but dare not expect, we get as far as the Corniche, we'll have to catch a taxi. 
Even a Luxor cab driver may be reluctant to pick up a fare who looks as if he's been in a war. Especially these days, I muttered, stripping off the jalabia. It didn't suit him, but at least it covered the blood. Max had instructed us to be ready at ten minutes to eight. Once he'd made his move, whatever it was, we could count on five minutes, maybe less. If he hadn't acted by ten after eight, we were on our own, and he wished us the best of British luck. Either he had overestimated the appetites of his associates, or my watch was slow. We were crossing the hall, exposed and fully visible from at least four directions, when I heard them leaving the dining room. I almost ran over John, who was in the lead, in my wild dash toward what could only be described as comparative concealment. The first of them entered the parlor as I ducked under the stairs. Before I had time to catch my breath, Max acted. It wasn't until later that I figured out what he'd done. At the time, I was too confused to hear anything except a medley of shouts and expletives in various languages and various voices. People were running in all directions, some through the French doors onto the terrace, others into the hall. Mary was among the latter. I caught only a glimpse of her as she darted past. One glimpse was more than enough. That face would have looked appropriate under a head of writhing snakes. Larry was right behind her. Instead of following her up the stairs, he ran toward his study. Interesting how basic instincts prevail in moments of crisis. Inconvenient, too. I didn't know how Mary planned to get through that locked door, but I didn't underestimate the little dear's cunning. And when she discovered she'd lost her new toy, she'd be back. And so would Larry, as soon as he'd found Sweet. And we were still in the house, and the door was probably locked or guarded or both. I began to wonder if my girlish confidence in Max had been misplaced. Even as this unkind doubt entered my mind, I heard the door open. It must have been Hans who was standing guard outside, for Max called out in German, Hurry, they went that way, after them. He followed Hans. When I started forward, assisted by a shove from John, the hall was empty and the front door stood open. It was almost too easy. Max had directed the search toward the back of the house, which was where sensible fugitives would go, poorly lighted, thickly landscaped. It was even darker back there after Max shot out some of the lights. I assumed it was Max, since none of the others would have been so helpful. Almost too easy, I said. One dedicated soul had stuck to his post. His black uniform blended with the darkness. If he hadn't moved closer to the gate, drawn by curiosity, we wouldn't have seen him in time. The light glinted dully off the rifle barrel. We froze in a puddle of shadow, knowing the slightest movement would betray our presence. There wasn't even a skinny shrub between us and the guard. Give me the knife, John breathed the words into my ear. I didn't ask what he was going to do with it. I couldn't imagine what he was going to do with it. The guy was ten or fifteen feet away, and there was no way of creeping up on him unobserved. The rifle wasn't slung over its shoulder. It was in his hands. John's arm shot back, and his foot hooked around my ankle, sending me sprawling to the ground. A bullet whined through the air over my head. When I got up, which I did with considerable alacrity, the guard lay face down and unmoving. Is he dead? I asked breathlessly. John straightened, the rifle in his hand. Not unless he passed on from sheer terror. I can't throw a knife that accurately. It was only meant to distract him. Vicky, would you mind terribly if we postponed this conversation and started running? They'll have heard the shot, you know. Running barefoot over a hard, broken surface is no fun. The first time I stubbed my toe, John tossed the rifle away and took my hand. When I stumbled, which I did every two or three steps, he yanked at my arm and kept me moving forward in a series of staggering rushes. I stopped listening for sounds of pursuit. I stopped worrying about whether there would be another guard at the street. I could only think how much my feet hurt. When we emerged, unchallenged, onto the brightly lit expanse of the corniche, I was still preoccupied with my feet. Slow down, I panted, trying to free my hand. We made it. Not yet. He stopped, raising his arm. Praise be to God and St. Jude. There's a taxi. I do hope you have some money. I'm getting tired of hitting people. 
The driver may have been dubious about picking us up, but John didn't give him time to think about it. As the cab pulled away, he looked out the back window and said something under his breath. I deduced that St. Jude, the patron of hopeless causes, wasn't going to get a donation after all. Someone had seen us get into the cab. After giving the driver directions, John didn't speak again except to demand money, in a tone a bank robber might have employed. I handed over part of Schmidt's wad and sat nursing my sore feet. I wondered where we were going, but I didn't have the energy to inquire. As we passed the Luxor Temple, the cab turned away from the river into the streets of the town and finally came to a stop. Can you walk a little farther? John asked, helping me out. What's the alternative? I stood on one foot. It only hurt half as much that way. Crawling a little farther. But he put his arm around me and lifted me over the worst spots. The sidewalk was broken and littered. I was too busy watching where I'd stepped to notice my surroundings. When he turned into a doorway and knocked, I was only glad we'd reached our destination. I was beginning to think the occupant wasn't home when I heard a rattle of bolts and chains. The door opened a crack. Then it started to close again. John inserted his foot. Open sesame, he said. It was the foot, not the request, that got the point across. The door swung open, and there she was. She had drawn a fold of cloth across her face, hiding all her features except beady little black eyes. But I'd have known her anywhere. Hi, Granny, I said. I'm back. Aren't you glad to see me? Faisal wasn't glad to see us either. After a prolonged and obviously profane monologue in his own language, he threw up his hands. In here, he snapped, opening a door. It was Granny's parlor, elegantly fitted out with shiny upholstered furniture and a television set and a rug covered with bright red roses. Granny let out a wavering howl of protest. I couldn't really blame her for not wanting two dusty vagabonds in her nice clean room. However, my bloody footprints blended with the red roses. I collapsed into the nearest chair and stretched my legs. When he saw my feet, Faisal's face changed. What happened? Quite a lot has happened, John said. Granny had slipped out of the room. Now she returned with her veil pinned firmly in place. She was carrying a basin of water, which she set down on the floor beside my chair. There was a dead fly floating in the basin. I pushed the body callously aside with my toes and slid my feet into the warm water. It felt wonderful. I smiled and nodded at the old lady. She ducked her head and muttered in Arabic. She is begging your pardon, Faisal translated. She thinks you hurt yourself running away from her. She says she didn't mean to frighten you. I leaned over and touched Granny on her bowed shoulder. Shukran, I said. That's all the Arabic I know, Faisal. Tell her I owe her an apology and that I'm very grateful. She's not the only one to whom you owe an apology, said John, unmoved by this touching exchange. If you'd stayed here as you were supposed to, I did apologize to you. It's your own fault. If you'd stop pushing people around and take the trouble to explain why you're doing what you're doing, instead of being so insufferably condescending, people might... Enough! Faisal exclaimed. We have not the time to waste on recriminations. You promised you'd get me out of this mess, Johnny. Johnny? I repeated. Isn't that sweet? How come you never let me call you Johnny? I never allow him to do it either. It's only a crude attempt to soften me by recalling sentimental memories of our school days. Then I'll have to go on thinking of you as my blue eyes. I thought he'd missed that one, but Schmidt's tutelage had been more extensive than I had believed. Spontaneous, unguarded laughter transformed his face, and my defensive barriers developed a few more cracks. I hadn't often seen that look. I'll never forget the pleasures we both seen together, he assured me. What in God's name, 
Faisal began. You don't want to know. The fact is, old chap, I can't get you out unless I can extricate myself as well. And the only way I can do that is to turn my coat and join the forces of law and order. Until our former associates are safely stowed away in a maximum security prison, neither of us is going to be out of this. He sighed. Ironic, isn't it? Forced by circumstances beyond my control to become an honest man. Don't let it bother you too much, I advised. You can console yourself with the knowledge that it wasn't morality but self-preservation that drove you to that painful decision. Clearing your name is going to be something of a tall order, though. How are you planning to go about it? A good question. John rubbed his forehead. How many of the local gendarmes are in Blank Iron's pay, Faisal? Too many, was the blunt response. He's got enough money to buy several medium-sized countries, much less a few poor devils who are trying to raise families on inadequate salaries. Some of them are honest, but I don't know which, and the honest ones think he's the greatest thing to come along since King Dat's tomb. If it's our word against his, we haven't a prayer. I've a little more than that, John murmured, but I think we'll have to take it to Cairo, straight to the Ministry and the EAO. They'll be watching the airport and the train station, Faisal said soberly. I assume they know you're on the loose. You assume correctly. We'll have to go by road. I don't own a car, Faisal said, and don't suggest I steal one. I'm in enough trouble already. How much money have we? John asked. It added up to more than I'd realized. Grimacing but game, Faisal contributed his hard-earned savings, a few hundred pounds Egyptian. John had only a few pounds in his wallet. Being broke when payment was required was an old habit of his, but in this case I refrained from caustic comment. He hadn't had a chance to pick up his luggage before we left. Schmidt'll have money, I said. He was going to cash more traveler's checks. John started to speak, but I cut him off. I'm not leaving without Schmidt. We'll have to collect him before we go. Of course, John said, raising one eyebrow. You didn't suppose I'd throw Schmidt to the wolves, did you? And before you burst into a fiery denunciation, let me remind you that it was I who got him out of that bloody house and into... I hope to God he's not still at the Winter Palace. No, he... Hold on. He handed Faisal the roll of bills. You'll have to hire the vehicle, Faisal. They'll be looking for me, too, Faisal objected. Not as assiduously as they'll be looking for us. Try to find one that has four wheels and some rudimentary brakes, if you can. And don't doodle. Faisal went out, shaking his head. Granny, bless her heart, was still trying to make up for being so mean to me. She'd been trotting in and out with trays and bottles. Now, John said, reaching for a beer, tell me what happened after Maxie sprung you. Should you be drinking alcohol? I certainly shouldn't be drinking the local water. Please try to concentrate on essentials, my dear. We don't have much time, and I need to know what's been going on. Where did you run into Schmidt? Obviously, he didn't succeed in intercepting you. Obviously but he was waiting when I came out. I gave him a brief synopsis of succeeding events to which he listened with amused and infuriatingly detached interest. Good old Schmidt. We'll have to get someone to present him with a medal and kiss him on both cheeks. He'd love that. I'd settle for getting him out of this in one piece. I don't trust him, John. If I don't turn up pretty soon, he's apt to go looking for me, trying to sneak into the Institute disguised as James Bond or... I hardly think even Schmidt would do anything so useless. He must realize his best hope of helping you is to blow the whistle on Blenkiron. How much does he know? Uh, John said something under his breath. Then he said it out loud. Damn it, I said defensively. There wasn't time for a leisurely discussion. He said he thought he knew, and I said I did too, and then... Hmm... Oh. What do you think you know? John inquired very softly. Well, I assume Larry's using the Queen of the Nile to transport his loot. 
He had to get rid of the tour group so he could make a quick run. No stops, no delays. The reason for the changes in the schedule really was concern about low water levels. He has to get through the locks. The schedule wasn't changed. It was the one he intended all along. You knew? No, I did not. Never mind that. It's a side issue. You are correct so far. Once the boat reaches Cairo, the loot, how well you put it, will be transferred to the airport. I'm sure I hardly need mention that Blenkiron owns one or two airlines. Or that the Luxor airport is too small for big cargo planes? Clever girl. How long will it take him? The sound of someone at the door made me break off. It was Faisal. A friend of mine has gone after the car, he announced. He'll bring it by in an hour or so. We'd better be ready to leave when he arrives, John said. He pulled the robe over his head. Faisal sucked in his breath. You need a doctor or a hospital. Oh, right, John said. I can see myself explaining how I absentmindedly walked into a sausage slicer. What I need is a clean shirt. Dried blood had glued the fabric to his skin in a number of places. For once, he resisted the temptation to overact, peeling the garment off with only a few manfully repressed groans. The full effect, which I now saw for the first time, was grisly enough to require no additional theatrics. Faisal winced and averted his eyes. Sympathetic he may have been, but I had a feeling that he was picturing himself in the same condition. I also suspected that John was well aware of the effect on his reluctant ally. A visual demonstration is worth a thousand words. I didn't volunteer to administer first aid. I was outvoted. It wasn't the first time I had patched John up after a work-related accident. Some of the others had required more extensive first aid, but this was worse. Deliberate sadism instead of random violence. The less said about that process, the better. John was obliging enough to make a lot of noise, which made it a little easier for me. A little. Now what? I inquired, tossing the roll of tape and the scissors onto the bed. I don't suppose you've got any wigs, fake mustaches, and miscellaneous disguises around, Faisal? John was still muttering profanely, but he couldn't resist the chance to instruct the ignorant. He began, The art of disguise. I don't want to hear you lecture on the subject of disguise. Neither do I, said Faisal. But she has a point. I could go out and get no time, John said. As I was saying, the art of disguise depends on posture and mannerisms rather than crude physical alterations. Let's see what you've got on hand. Fitting John out wasn't a problem. He and Faisal were about the same size. Faisal objected violently when John selected his best Cairo-tailored suit, but he was overruled. I've got to look like a respectable businessman when I go in after Schmidt. Or are you volunteering for that little job? No, Faisal said, unhesitatingly. A wise decision. They'll be checking the hotels by now if they haven't already done so. I intend to be as unobtrusive as possible, but... You'll have to dye your hair then, Faisal said. After John's demonstration of what might happen to him if we were caught, he was cooperating wholeheartedly, if not happily. And your eyebrows? I don't suppose you have any boot polish. I don't polish my own shoes, Faisal said haughtily. Do forgive me. John said. I didn't mean to imply you did anything so vulgar. You'll have to wind me a nice, neat turban, then. Dark glasses will look a little out of place at this time of night. The honoured sit, your grandmother, must have some coal or other eye paint. I must say it was an education to watch him work. He didn't use much of the black stuff, whatever it was, just enough to darken his eyebrows and touch up those long lashes. He tanned easily. I'd seen other Egyptians with skin as fair as his. Once the turban was in place, the difference in his appearance was astounding. It was partly a matter of expression. Tight lips, outthrust chin, lowering brows. What about your beautiful, beautiful blue eyes? I asked. His response was automatic. 
I'll never love brown eyes again. And then he laughed shortly. A truer word was never spoken. As for my beautiful blue eyes, I don't intend to stand still long enough for anyone to gaze deeply into them. Now, what are we going to do about you? Maybe Granny could lend me a robe and a veil? John shook his head. You're too tall to pass as an Egyptian female. It's male attire for you, I'm afraid. Your bonny blue eyes are beyond my modest skill. You told me more lies than the stars in the... Sorry. Don't take it personally. Country music does have a thing about blue eyes, doesn't it? Faisal was staring at us as if we'd lost our minds. He was probably right. John had that effect on me. So far, the score is tied, said John. As I was saying, we've got to do something about your hair. Cut it off, I said, reaching for the scissors. Then Faisal can wind me a turban, too. John took the scissors from me. Sit down. I'll do it. I should have known you numbered barbering among your varied skills. His hands moved slowly from the crown of my head to the base of my skull, smoothing the tangled masses of hair and gathering them together. There was a long pause before he said, I have a better idea. A spot of cosmic cleansing wouldn't do you any harm. What are you talking about? I tried to turn, but he closed his fingers around the impromptu ponytail and gave it a hard tug. Communing with the universe, awakening the collective consciousness of the world, John chanted. You're not quite grubby enough for a new ager, but that's easy to fix. When he finished fixing it, I was a dirty blonde with a long, lank ponytail and a distinct four o'clock shadow. The dirt and the beard came from the garden, the single gold earring from Granny and the collarless, long-sleeved shirt from Faisal. Entering into the spirit of the thing, I demanded a crystal and a pair of cutoffs. We'll pick up some mystic insignia at one of the bazaars, John said. These types go in for scarabs and unk signs and such. The shorts are out. Your knees aren't nobly enough. You might have expressed it in more flattering terms, I said. Your legs, my darling, are masterpieces of sculptural elegance. John said agreeably. Those appendages would grace an Aphrodite or a young Diana. Never could such marvels of slender, rounded beauty be taken for those of a man. Your form, in short, is rare and divine. Philadelphia lawyer, I said. John raised one finger and made an invisible mark on the air. One point for you. Faisal's friend was a shy, retiring chap. As soon as we left the house in response to his signal on the horn, he slid out of the driver's seat of the car and walked away without looking back. If he wanted to make certain neither John or I could identify him, he succeeded. As for the car, I'd seen its likes before, in junkyards or abandoned in vacant lots. If it had been in good condition, it would have ranked as a vintage vehicle. Those tail fins had to be thirty years out of date. Good God, John said, staring. Is this the best you could do? We won't get twenty miles in this wreck. I hope you won't think me rude, said Faisal, if I remind you that you are in no position to be fastidious and that you sound like a typical supercilious twit of a tourist. We underprivileged third world types can't afford a new car every year, so we learn how to keep them on the road. Touché, John admitted. After you, Vicky. He handed me the basket Granny had pressed upon us. It was our only luggage, except for Faisal's suitcase. Faisal got in behind the wheel. Where to? he asked. The ETAP. Oh, wonderful. The big tourist hotels are the first places they'll look. Just drive, John said shortly. Schmidt had given me one of his keys. Just in case. I hadn't asked just in case of what. I had had other things on my mind. 
As I crossed the lobby, trying to look as if I were focusing on auras instead of potential kidnappers, I wished I had asked. There was no need for him to leave the room except to cash his traveler's checks, which wouldn't take long, and every reason for him to stay put. Even if they located him, they couldn't get at him unless he opened the door. And surely Schmidt wouldn't be foolish enough to admit anyone except... except the room service? Someone imitating my voice? John had gone ahead. He was waiting by the elevator when I got out of it. What's wrong? he asked. I didn't ask how he could tell. He could always tell. I'm having premonitions, I admitted. It's always best to assume the worst. He took the key from me. Stand out of the way. He gave the door a sharp kick and dropped to a crouching position. That's what they do in the films, he remarked, straightening. Futile, really, when you consider that most criminals use automatic weapons these days. But I suppose they believe it looks... He's not here. Damn the crazy old idiot. Where the hell has he got to now? The door to the bathroom and closet stood open. The import of that didn't dawn on me until after we had investigated all possible hiding places. My morbid imagination was convinced we'd find Schmidt's crumpled body in the bathtub or under the bed. He must have left under his own steam. There's no sign of a struggle, I said. If he's gone back to Larry's looking for me, I'll kill him. He's not gone there, John said. What? I spun around. He was bending over the desk. How do you know? He's left you a note. The paper had been crumpled and then smoothed out. It was so badly stained by something brown and sticky that the words were barely legible. My dear Vicky, it began. I translate, he had written in German. I have the proof we need. I will drop this off at your hotel and then proceed to the rendezvous we... What is this? I demanded. What proof? He never mentioned it to me. What hotel? What rendezvous? Calm down. John seated himself at the desk. Let's see if we can figure out what he's up to. Maybe we'd better get out of here. No need for haste. They've already been. How? I stopped myself. He was dying to show off. His half-smile and cool stare invited me to make a babbling fool of myself so he could patiently explain things to me. Where's the note? I asked. John nodded graciously. Like a teacher to a dull student who was finally getting the hang of it. On the desk. Someone had smoothed it out. But Schmidt must have thrown it away. In the wastebasket or onto the floor, after he spilled food all over it. Deliberately spilled food all over it, John said encouragingly. The implication being that he discarded the note because it was sticky and wet and illegible, and written another one. I began pacing the floor. He expected they'd locate him sooner or later. I've been gone. I looked at my watch. Over five hours. And they'd been looking for us since early afternoon, time enough to inquire every hotel in Luxor. He registered under his own name. If he had the intelligence for which I am belatedly beginning to give him credit, he left this room shortly after you did, John said. In disguise, if I know my Schmidt. Let's see. What would I do next? Stake myself out in the lobby. Hope you'd make it back before they located him. Be ready to move on in case they got here first. He'd already have cashed his traveler's checks and retrieved his passport. They did get here first, and found the discarded letter. John's eyes were bright with amusement, and as he proceeded to make clear, admiration. You see what the little elf's done, don't you? This letter is not only a red herring, it is an attempt to protect you in the event that you've been recaptured. If he's got the evidence that can convict them, there's no reason for them to harm you. In fact... There is every reason for them to keep you whole and healthy, so they can try to strike a deal. Silence, or at least delay, in exchange for you. He paused, and then delivered the highest accolade in his repertoire. 
I couldn't have done better myself. So you don't think he's gone back to the house? Not our Schmidt. Whether you are a fugitive or a prisoner, he can serve you best by remaining free. John returned to his study of the note. I can't see anything else here, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he had. Wait a sec. What's this? The sticky stuff must have spattered, I said, as he held up a blank page spotted with stains. The spots make a suspiciously regular pattern, John muttered. Try joining the dots, I suggested sarcastically. John emitted a crow of triumph. That's it! Look here! Picking up a pen, he began to draw. Not lines connecting the spots, but a series of parallel lines. Five parallel lines. They made the nature of those odd splotches plain. They were musical notes. No key signature, John muttered. Let's assume it's the key of C, and that there are no accidentals. Hard to indicate them, really. He began to whistle. Strike a chord. Try to avoid puns, if possible, I said critically. No, it isn't familiar. How about this? There was a slight difference. I assumed he'd thrown in a few miscellaneous sharps and or flats. This is a waste of time, I grumbled. Schmidt probably was trying to be cute, but if that's one of his beloved country music tunes, you'll never figure out which song, because there are only three or four melodies in the whole damned repertoire. John dropped heavily into a chair. My God, I should have known. What? What? He tried to give me the definitive version, but he was laughing so hard he couldn't keep his lips puckered. If the Egyptians don't strike a medal for him, I'll do it myself and kiss him on both cheeks. He's taken the night train to Memphis. Chapter 12 The room had been stripped of all personal possessions, whether by Schmidt or by John's hypothetical searchers, I couldn't determine. They became less hypothetical as we continued our own search. They'd made quite a neat job of it, but I doubted Schmidt would have removed the mattress from the bed and then replaced it and the bedclothes. The searchers must have been men. They hadn't bothered to tuck in the sheets. Is there a night train to Memphis? I asked investigating the drawers of the nightstand. There's one to Cairo, close enough. John returned from the bathroom. Nothing there. What about the chest of drawers? Only the souvenirs he bought today. The Nefertiti bag had been on top of the pile. I turned it upside down and shook it. He's even taken the few odds and ends I left. Cosmetics, sunglasses, chocolates, apples, and gingerbread. I didn't want to be reminded of the night in the abandoned church when we had dined on the odds and ends I carried in my backpack. Sooner or later, I'd have to deal with those widening cracks in my defensive walls. But not now. Not when we were still 400 miles from safety, and Schmidt was someplace or other doing God knows what, and Mary was looking forward to renewing old acquaintances. I said shortly, He might have left us some money. He wouldn't leave anything of value. The point of the message was to suggest that neither of you intended to return to this room. Obviously, I said. That's it, then. There's nothing else except a few travel brochures. I'll go first. Take the next elevator. I'll meet you at the car. But when I got out of the elevator, he was standing nearby, glancing at his watch as if waiting for someone who was late for an appointment. A slight sideways movement of his head drew my attention toward the registration desk. I saw Foggington Smythe first. He was bareheaded, and his face was set in a frown as he talked with the clerk. The clerk kept shaking his head. He was looking, not at Perry, but at Perry's companion. From behind, all I could see was white, fur coat, long evening frock, bleached hair. I ducked behind a convenient pillar. 
John sauntered toward me and paused to light a cigarette. Yours? he asked. No, I don't think so. Yours? At this point, we must assume everyone who isn't for us is against us. Walk, do not run to the nearest exit. It was the only thing to do. I'd be even more conspicuous lurking in doubtful concealment. But I felt as if I were being followed across the lobby by a gigantic searchlight. And when someone barred my path, I almost jumped out of Faisal's oversized sandals. Excuse me, young fella. I looked wildly over my shoulder before I realized I was the young fella in question. The speaker was a gray-haired American wearing a bright red fez. He wanted to know where I'd bought my shirt. Innocent creature that I am, I didn't realize that wasn't all he wanted, until he suggested that we have a drink while we talked it over. I was about to tell him what he could do with his drink and his fez, when John, passing on his way to the door, swung his briefcase and caught me a painful blow on the leg. It was, as the poet says, a salutary reminder. I growled wordlessly at my admirer and scuttled after John. By the time I reached the car, I was running, and so was the engine. John shoved me in. You daft female, he said crossly. What did you stop for? I think Foggington Smythe may have spotted you. I can't help it if I'm irresistible to men, I said, falling across his lap as Faisal made an abrupt and doubtless illegal U-turn. John set me upright. In your present costume, I have no difficulty at all resisting you. Crushed again. I am beginning to understand why so many people are so annoyed with you two, said a voice from the front seat. Where's the head director? Where are we going? What? One question at a time said John. First, I suggest you get off the Corniche, take back streets whenever possible. We have to go past the railroad station first, I interrupted. No, we don't. Yes, we do. I want to make sure Schmidt... No, we don't. Stop it, Faisal shouted hysterically. Right, said John. Who's in charge here, anyhow? I am not winding my way through a maze of back streets either, Faisal declared. The sooner we get out of Luxor, the happier I'll be. John sighed. That was certainly one of the most futile questions I've ever asked. Vicky, there's no use looking for Schmidt at the station. I, uh, I haven't been entirely candid with you. No, I exclaimed. You, not entirely candid? I can't believe it. What little teeny tiny unimportant detail did you omit? Don't tell me. Let me guess. There is no night train to Memphis. Right? There is no bloody train to Memphis. Stop. End of sentence. He caught himself in mid-shout, and in the silence that followed, I could hear every shaken breath. I told you that, he went on, a few decibels lower. What I neglected to mention, for a number of reasons, all excellent, is that there are several night trains to Cairo. Would you care to hear my ideas as to which one Schmidt is most likely to have chosen? or would you rather continue this unproductive exchange of insults? I hate it when you talk like that, I muttered. Go on. Egyptian trains, said John, in an even more maddening drawl, and with even more infuriating precision, are of several types. Wagon lees run two overnight expresses, with sleeping cars between Luxor and Cairo. They started as one, in fact, but that doesn't concern us. One leaves Luxor at 7.30, and the other at 10.30. Both times, I hardly need add, are approximate. You hardly need. How do you know the times? I believe I mentioned earlier that strict attention to schedules is essential for one who wishes to succeed in my profession. That rule applies particularly to transportation. Really, John mused, one day I must write a little handbook. Rule number one, as soon as you arrive in a place, find out how to depart in a hurry. Don't do that, John, I said very gently. Then leave off distracting me. As I was saying, most well-to-do tourists who travel by rail take those trains. And that, my dear, is a very good reason why Schmidt 
if I read his character aright, wouldn't have taken either. They have a further disadvantage in that they do not stop between Luxor and Giza, just outside Cairo. Once you're on that train, you can't get off it for ten or eleven hours. If I were worried about possible pursuit, I'd prefer more flexibility. Makes sense, I admitted. So what's the alternative? I'm so glad you asked. The other night trains make several stops, but only one of them offers first-class travel. First class is fairly comfortable, even by your effete American standards. Second and third class are not, and even if Schmidt were prepared to endure the crowding and the heat, he wouldn't stand a chance of passing as a student or an Egyptian. So? So, I think he intends to take the 11 p.m. train. It stops at Sohag, Asiut, and Minya. If he wants to confuse his trail, he'll buy a ticket through to Cairo and get off at one of the above. Is that the last train? There are others after midnight. We have to assume he meant not only night, but tonight. The note had today's date. It's clever, but awfully tenuous, I said. We had left the city center behind, and the only light came from the headlights of approaching vehicles. John had withdrawn into the opposite corner. He didn't respond to my comment, but I could still hear him breathing, and I didn't like what I heard. Are you all right? I asked. Perfectly. Maybe you should take another of those. I just did. He hesitated for a moment and then said, If I should happen to fall asleep, wake me before we reach Nag Hammadi. We may have to reconsider our strategy at that point. What strategy? I demanded. If you have some plan in mind, I wish you'd let me in on it. Are we going to try to intercept Schmidt at one of the places you mentioned? Or do you intend to drive straight through to Cairo? Assuming this decrepit hunk of metal can make it that far. Or... Faisal interrupted me with a vehement comment in Arabic. What did you say? I leaned forward. I'd rather not translate literally. There are corresponding proverbs in English referring to domineering women. I heard a muffled laugh from John. Now, kiddies, don't be rude. The main north-south highway and the railroad tracks cross the river at Hamadi. If they are going to set up a roadblock, that's the obvious place. We'll have to reconnoiter before we try the bridge. There's nothing we can do about it until we get there, so stop quarrelling and let me get some sleep. I couldn't think of a response that wasn't rude, childish, or irrelevant, so I didn't say anything. John was out before we'd gone another mile, so far under that he only muttered sleepily when I put my arms around his shoulders and drew him down so that he was lying across the seat with his head on my lap. Faisal had his foot down as far as it would go. The car shook alarmingly, but the engine was surprisingly quiet. There was a good deal of traffic. Egyptian drivers have a demoralizing habit of switching on their bright lights instead of dimming them as they approach another car. I tried not to cringe every time this happened, but I didn't succeed. Each approaching vehicle cast a brief, garish glow into the interior of the car. It might have been a delicately sculptured skull I held in the curve of one arm, the eye sockets, dark hollows, the skin clinging tightly to the bones of cheek and temple. There was no softness of underlying flesh, except for the parted lips. Is he asleep? Basil's voice was barely audible. I applied a gentle pinch to John's arm. He didn't respond, not even with a mutter of complaint. Not that that proved anything. Feigning sleep or unconsciousness was one of his favorite tricks. They usually stop hitting you when they think you can't feel it he had once solemnly explained during one of his lectures on crime. I think so. I raised one hand and brushed at my cheek. I'm sorry I was rude, but you are being a little hard on him, aren't you? He hasn't been exactly easy on me. Easy on you? Faisal's voice rose. He wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. He had no intention of going through with this business. He tried to talk me out of it, if you hadn't turned up out of the blue. Just a minute, I said. Let me get this straight. Are you implying... 
He did more than imply. He told me, brutally and directly. Faisal didn't like me very much just then. That made two of us. This particular project began over three years ago. Johnny had pulled off a few jobs for Blenkiron earlier. But this one was a lot more complicated. Sir Blenkiron hired the group represented by the man who calls himself Max. After the tomb restoration was completed and Max had served his time, Blenkiron contacted Johnny. Johnny said no, he wanted out. They'd have let him get away with it, I think, since he couldn't blow the whistle on them without accusing himself. If somebody hadn't come up with the bright idea of having him rob the museum, at the same time Blenkiron was loading his prizes onto a plane in Cairo. Whether he succeeded or failed, the attempt would have served as a useful distraction. Very useful, I muttered. Whose bright idea was it? Can't you guess? Max is a businessman. He hasn't time for useless emotions like revenge. And that was what motivated the person who suggested the museum stunt. It sounded clever, but there were a number of practical disadvantages. Most particularly the difficulty of forcing a tricky devil like Johnny to go through with a job he doesn't want to do. Max was well aware of that, and would have been more than happy to see Johnny out of it. Unfortunately, his group resembles certain other illegal organizations, in that it is family-oriented, and the sole surviving member of this particular family is... You've seen what she's like. How easy do you suppose it was for Johnny, cooped up with that maniac day after day, and night after night, listening to her obscene threats, and knowing that if he laid a finger on her, she'd retaliate on you? It was like hearing the other side of a long, hostile divorce case. Events that seemed clear-cut and obvious from one person's point of view take on an entirely different aspect when you hear the other guy's version. They got you onto that cruise, Faisal went on. Some kind of faked message planted on the body of a dead operative. I never knew the details. Johnny had cut off communication with you as soon as he realized what he'd got himself into. Jen was already at risk, simply because they knew who she was and where she was. If he hadn't agreed to bring her along on the cruise as an unwitting hostage, they would have kidnapped her, or worse. He planned to get Jen away at some point during the cruise. Once she was safe, he could take care of himself. It never occurred to him that they'd bother with another hostage. I wonder if you can imagine how he felt that day at Giza, when he saw you. I can imagine. I had seen his face. He'd managed to get Jen out of their hands next day, improvising as only John could. And then Schmidt had turned up, and there were still two hostages. I remember the consternation in his voice when he saw Schmidt at Amarna, and Mary's smile. Of course she had known who Schmidt was. She'd probably memorized every detail of my biography especially the episode in which her brothers had been involved. Why didn't he tell me? I demanded. They made sure he never had a chance to tell you. Both of you were under surveillance every minute of the day and night. As a lovesick young bride, she had a perfect excuse to stick closer to him than a cockleburr. And when she wasn't with him, Blank Iron or one of the others was with you. The words stung like a snake bite. Doubly painful, because I felt I ought to have suspected some of it, at least. And there was worse to come. I knew what Faisal was going to say before he said it. That wasn't the main reason. I was present when they explained to him, in painstaking detail, precisely what they would do to you if you learned the truth, from him or in any other way. Okay, I get it, I said hoarsely. You don't have to... I'm going to anyway. You realize, don't you, that while the boat was on the river, they had you completely isolated and in their power. The purported changes in schedule were nothing of the sort. They were known in advance to all of us except Johnny. They kept him off balance, made it impossible for him to make arrangements for his escape or yours. Blenkiron controlled the boat, the crew, 
and half the able-bodied passengers. And the doctor. The moment you became aware or even suspicious, he'd have had you pumped full of drugs and locked in your cabin with a quarantine sign on the door. And there you would have stayed, inaccessible and helpless, until... They tossed me overboard, I muttered. Or would it have been something more... more inventive? Much more inventive. Faisal's voice had softened a little, but he wasn't ready to let me off the hook yet. And prolonged. They were prepared to deal with Schmidt in the same way if he became a nuisance. People are always falling ill. It wouldn't have raised questions if both of you had succumbed to some esoteric and ultimately fatal disease. Your only chance of survival depended on your remaining unwitting, and that meant your suspicions and your hostility had to be focused on Johnny. They promised him that if he'd cooperate, you would be allowed to leave the cruise at Luxor with the other passengers. He believed that? Of course he didn't. He's been moving heaven and earth to get you to a safe place without betraying information that would endanger you even more. And he's had to fight you as well as Blenkiron in the process. Cursing under his breath, he swerved to avoid some obstacle on the road, I assumed, and the car jolted along the shoulder for a few yards before he got it back on the paved surface. I steadied John's head with my other hand. How far are we from Hamadi? I asked. Another thirty or forty kilometers. Are you trying to change the subject? Yes. You were full of questions a while ago. Here's your chance to get some of the answers you'll never get from him. I didn't say anything. The events of the past week were unrolling in my memory like a foreign film. I hadn't understood the first time I saw it. The captions Faisal had supplied cast a different light on every scene. He'd put on a pretty good act in public. But I might have noticed he never used a term of endearment or touched her if he could avoid doing so. In private, knowing Mary as I now did, I felt sure she had enjoyed goading him into dangerous and ultimately futile outbursts of anger. The bruises on her arms were a graphic demonstration of at least one occasion on which she had succeeded, and she'd retaliated promptly and effectively. If Schmidt's loud concern about my phobia hadn't alerted her, my own behavior would have done so. That incident had been a joint project, Larry getting me down into the tomb, Mary or one of the others bollocksing the lights. John must have suspected something was going to happen, but he'd been helpless to prevent it. All he could do was get to me as quickly as possible. That wasn't the only time he'd managed to find an excuse to be around when he feared I might be in trouble. Seeing Schroeder, Max, at the rest house had aroused his suspicions. He'd invited himself along on that stroll from the valley to Deir al-Bahri because he was afraid to leave me and Schmidt alone with Larry and Ed. And he'd prevented Mary from accompanying us, not only because she was an additional threat to me, but because because getting away from her, by any means and for any length of time, would have been like a breath of clean air to a man trapped in a sewer. But the memory that would haunt me longest was the one of that night he'd followed me out on deck while Schmidt was dancing with Mary. By that time, he must have been half crazy with worry and frustration and disgust, and the necessity of hiding those emotions. No wonder he'd lost control of himself, but only for a few moments. Realizing we were being observed, he had deliberately provoked me into a demonstration that would prove we were still at odds, and that would get me off the deck, back into the comparative safety of my room. There had been time, that night, and on a few other occasions, for a brief private exchange. Oh, by the by, Vicky, I'm not really married to that little bitch. This is a setup, and you are in desperate danger. So when I give you the signal, just trot off and go into hiding and stay there, and take Schmidt with you. Of course I'd have obeyed, without question or argument, as would Schmidt. Right. Faisal slowed and pulled off the road. He turned, his arm over the back of the seat. What's wrong? I asked. Nothing's wrong, I hope. We'll be approaching the bridge shortly, 
and I don't want to wake him yet. I don't suppose he's had a decent night's sleep since... Stop it, Faisal! There's just one little point I want to emphasize. When he agreed to Blenkiron's proposal, his own survival wasn't part of the deal. It wasn't even mentioned. He was bargaining for your life, not his. And he was willing to let you go on thinking the worst of him, if that would help to ensure your safety. I don't entirely blame you for doubting him, but if I understand the hints I've heard from various people, he's put his neck in a noose for you before. Didn't it occur to you, even once, to give him the benefit of the doubt? Faisal's tactics had been as effective as a battering ram. The walls were down and I was flat on my face in the rubble. I had a feeling that if I ever managed to hold my head up again, I'd see something that would make that devastating experience worthwhile. But all I could think of at the moment was how much I hated Faisal. When you're crawling on your belly like a snake, you like to have another snake along for company. So, what have you done for your old schoolmate lately? I demanded. You'd still be cooperating with Blankiron if Jean-Louis' murder hadn't cast some doubts on your own survival. The poor devil didn't tell me a damn thing. They killed him solely as a precaution, the way you'd get rid of a wasp's nest on your porch. Johnny was quick to point that out, Faisal said wryly. And I admit it wasn't until then that I agreed to get you to a safe place. There was no way he could do it himself. They were watching him like a pack of vultures, and he was getting desperate. I don't claim to be any nobler than the next man, Vicky. Johnny did talk me into supplying you with a weapon some days ago. Hamid was one of us. I had no difficulty in getting at his keys. However... However, said a remote voice... You are going to be in great difficulty if you don't get moving again. What did you stop for? Faisal slammed the car into gear and pulled onto the road. I thought you needed... I could do with something to drink. And an end to idle gossip about things that are none of your damn business. How much did you hear? I demanded, grateful for the darkness that hid my face. Quite a lot. John said. Are you lying? I always do, don't I? I was in no condition to pursue the subject. If you'll remove yourself from my lap, I'll get you a drink. Country matters, lady. I might have known he couldn't resist that reference. A truck thundered toward us, the bright light and contrasting shadow giving his upturned face and tumbled hair the look of a cheerful scarecrow. But I was too familiar with the cadences of his voice to miss the signs. He sat up, yawning. I heard the rustle of cloth and a faint click. Time for two of those little yellow pills? How many more could he take before he started climbing the walls? I bent over and rummaged in the basket Granny had packed. She must have emptied her larder. There was enough food for a dozen people. Bread, boiled eggs, fruit, a six-pack of soda... I opened one of the cans and handed it to John. I don't know what this is, I began. Neither do I. It tastes like battery acid. Never mind, it's liquid. Where are we? A quarter of an hour from Nag Hammadi, Faisal answered. I hope it was only a morbid fancy that made you mention roadblocks. If we don't cross here, there are other bridges farther north. And if memory serves, a road of sorts on the east bank? Yes to both. You didn't answer my question. What makes you think they might be waiting for us at Hamadi? Foggington Smythe followed Vicky out of the hotel. He was watching when we left. Why didn't you say so earlier? Faisal demanded. Why should I? Either he saw us or he didn't. If he did, and if a lot of other equally unpleasant surmises are correct... They could be waiting for us at Nag Hammadi. But how? I began. Oh, Christ. Do I have to spell everything out for you? Use your head. Your guess is as good as mine as to what Blenkiron will and can do. But his resources are extensive. Always anticipate the worst, remember? 
He had edged away from me and was sitting bolt upright, staring straight ahead. Ten minutes, I thought. Give him that much, at least. Faisal began. What are we... I leaned forward. How well do you know the roads? There was a perceptible pause before Faisal answered. That depends on what roads you mean. The main north-south highway crosses the river at Hamadi and runs along the west bank from there to Cairo. There's a secondary road on the east bank, but parts of it haven't been completed. Where are the bridges? I asked. I was trying to buy John a little more time, but as Faisal expanded on the geographical features, I found myself wondering how Schmidt meant to employ same. Damn it, I knew the old boy better than John did. I ought to be able to follow his thinking. So, the next bridge after Hamadi is at Sohag? The train Schmidt took. Might have taken. Stops there, doesn't it? That's right. It's about fifty miles from Nag Hamadi. And the next crossing is at Asiut? Right again. Asiut is the second train stop. After that, there's only one before Cairo. Minya, Faisal agreed. That's where Schmidt stayed the night before he joined the cruise, I said thoughtfully. John cleared his throat. Are you suggesting he might have left some of his luggage there? My theories may have been a trifle exiguous, but that is really... No, listen. The more I thought about it, the more likely it seemed. Schmidt stocked up on spy stuff before he ever left Munich. He even had contact lenses made in various colors. He suspected this cruise was more than a simple vacation. Who would know better than Schmidt that I wouldn't try to pass myself off as an expert on a subject I know nothing about without good and sufficient reason? I'll bet he's been plotting and planning ever since he arrived in Egypt. He'd have done that just for the fun of it. He spotted Max immediately, and that confirmed... Bloody hell, John said. You mean the little elves be none to us all along? Why didn't you tell me this? There hasn't been time, I began. Schmidt is bad enough, John went on bitterly. The two of you together. Faisal stopped the bloody car. No, not in the middle of the bloody road. Pull over as soon as you can find a suitable place. Now then, Vicky, perhaps you can bring yourself to tell me precisely what Schmidt said to you and what you said to Schmidt before you sallied forth to rescue me. You did have sense enough to make contingency plans, didn't you? In case you were held up or Schmidt had to vacate his room? The medicine had cleared his head, but it certainly hadn't improved his disposition. I realized, with only faint surprise, that we were back on the old footing. Nothing had really changed except my perception of him. He was the same person he'd always been, neither saint nor sinner, hero nor villain, but a bewildering and exasperating mixture of all of them. Human, in other words. Like me. We were more alike than I had wanted to admit. Sarcastic, prickly, defensive, afraid of feeling emotion, much less expressing it. My other self, my dark angel, my dear, deadly companion, my... Take all the time you like, John said, sneering audibly. We're in no hurry. Damn it, how the hell could we plan ahead? I demanded. I didn't know how long it would take me to get into the house, or where in the house you were. It might have taken me all night to locate you. All night? Faisal had turned off onto a narrow dirt road, bordering one of the irrigation canals. I could see a dark glimmer of water below. On the other side of the road, tall stalks of some kind of vegetation, sugarcane or reeds, blocked my view. I didn't need John to tell me I must have been out of my mind to think I could ramble around the house for hours on end without being caught. I had been out of my mind. Since I couldn't think of anything sensible to say, I kept quiet. All right, John said. He sounded as if he were choking. Perhaps this is not an appropriate moment to pursue that subject. We've got to come to a decision about where we're going next. God knows I'm reluctant to follow Schmidt along the chaotic pathways of his imagination, but I hate to think of the havoc he can wreak wandering through Egypt alone and uncontrolled. He's done better than we have so far, I said indignantly. That message he left was damned ingenious. 
He's done better than you have, you mean, was the unkind reply. And on the basis of the ingenuity he has displayed thus far, I'm willing to consider the possibility that he tried to give us additional information. Johnny, Faisal interrupted, no one admires the precision of your syntax more than I, but could you possibly cut it short? I'm thinking of those travel brochures, John said. You wouldn't dare underline or circle a name, but the one on the top of the pile had been opened and refolded. The sites mentioned were all in Middle Egypt, Beni Hassan, Amarna. Nefertiti, I exclaimed. She was on the top of the pile, too. The bag he bought at the bazaar with her picture on it. Amarna, John muttered. I don't see how. He couldn't possibly. Johnny, Faisal began. Yes, right. We need more information before we reach a final decision as to our route. I don't suppose this miracle of automotive engineering possesses a radio. No, that would be too much to ask. Stop at the first cafe, or even better, petrol station. When we stopped, not far from the access road to the bridge, I withdrew into the darkest corner and covered my head with a scarf, while Faisal got out for a man-to-man -man chat with the attendant and the other guys who were hanging around the pumps. He wasn't gone long. When he came back, I could tell by his expression he'd heard something he didn't like. John waited until Faisal had turned off onto a side road. Well... My career in crime is burgeoning, Faisal said sourly. It seems I am now a kidnapper as well as a notorious terrorist. Who'd you kidnap? I asked curiously. You, of course. Faisal made another sharp turn. There's a tough dish. Checkpoint ahead, on this side of the bridge. It's a safe bet they'll be watching for us. He spun the wheel again and the car squeezed itself into a narrow lane between walls that scraped the fenders. We should pick up the East Bank Road a couple of miles farther on. He let out a thin scream and slammed on the brakes. The rider of the donkey glanced over his shoulder and made a rude gesture. I assume it was a rude gesture. Bad luck, old chum, John said, insincerely. I had hoped they wouldn't get onto you so soon, but I suppose it was inevitable when we all turned up missing at the same time. So Foggington Smythe is in Larry's pay, I said. Not necessarily. He might have mentioned in all innocence that he'd seen someone resembling you at the hotel. But I'm in disguise, I protested. He was studying your rear view, John said disagreeably. I told you those jeans were too tight. Dare I inquire how Foggington Smythe became so familiar with the contours of your... Christ, Faisal, watch out for that! A splintering crunch announced the destruction of a small shed. Don't distract me, Faisal said between his teeth. The last few hundred yards of the detour ran along the top of a bank above an irrigation ditch. I think three of the wheels were on the path most of the time. We missed the guy on the bicycle, though. Once we were back on the highway, John cleared his throat. Would you like me to drive for a while? He asked tactfully. I had been about to offer myself. Night driving in Egypt was something no sane tourist would tackle, but I figured I could do better than Faisal was doing at that moment. I think his eyes were closed. Faisal hit the brakes. You said anything to drink? I handed him a can of soda. He slid over into the passenger seat, and John took his place behind the wheel. So what else is new? he inquired, returning to the road. They didn't get the license number, but they do have a description of the car. They aren't certain whether my motive for making off with Vicky was lust or politics or... Kidnapping an American tourist for any reason is enough to stir things up, John said thoughtfully. Did you abduct me, too? They know or assume we're all together, if that's what you mean. Odd, now that you mention it. They were somewhat vague as to your precise role. It's been on all the news broadcasts. 
the government is appalled, shocked, and distraught. They will pursue the hunt with the utmost diligence and punish the perpetrator. He swallowed. Appropriately. Oh, very good, John said. By accusing you of abduction, they've enlisted the assistance of every honest police officer and worthy citizen, and they've left open the possibility that I may be a crypto-terrorist too. That's crazy, I exclaimed. I can tell them you may not have the chance, John said. We went on for a while in gloomy silence. A snatch of song drifted back to me from the front seat. There's a girl from Minnesota, she's long and she's tall. I leaned forward. She was from Birmingham, I believe. Wrong. Tennessee. One for me. I got the song right, I protested. Anyhow, she wasn't a girl, she was a train. Half a point, then. Why don't you get some sleep? You must be tired. Heroic rescues take a lot out of a girl. To hell with that. I'm not going to sleep while you two big, strong, intelligent men make all the decisions. Where are we going? Faisal chuckled. She does have a strange charm all her own, doesn't she? I'm beginning to understand why you... She grows on you, John agreed. As for where we're going, that depends to some extent on what we encounter along the way. But I think we'll head for Minya. That must have been what Schmidt meant by his delightfully mysterious clues. It's the nearest stop to Amana. The train he's taken doesn't arrive until seven in the morning, and it may be late. If we can make it in time, we'll look out for him at the station. If we miss him, we'll check the hotels. How are you planning to get across the river? Faisal inquired. I intend to avoid the bridges. They're the most logical places for roadblocks. We'll stay on the east bank until we reach Amana, and then take the ferry across. There are a number of advantages to that agenda. They'll expect us to take the main road, and it's always a good idea to do what the enemy doesn't expect. Skip the lectures on crime, will you? Faisal said sourly. There's only one little problem with your agenda, Johnny. We can't get to Amarna from here. The road, John began, Ends a few kilometers north of Asyut. They haven't finished it. There's a track, surely. There are a number of paths, yes, for donkeys and camels. If we follow the river, there's one point where the cliffs come right down to the water's edge. The car would never make it through. Hmm. Then we'll have to think of another way, won't we? It doesn't sound to me as if there is another way, I remarked. We'll have to cross at Asyut and risk the roadblocks. Faisal is being modest, John said gently. I'm sure he can suggest an alternative. He has friends everywhere. Knowledgeable friends, right, old chum? Damn it, Johnny. I haven't had anything to do with that crowd for years. It was one of those youthful enthusiasms. I quite understand, John said, in the same quiet, very unpleasant voice. No bright idealistic lad or lassie can resist the lure of revolution. All the same. The silence from the front seat was practically deafening. It seemed to satisfy John, though. I don't know how long I slept, but I was stiff and cold when I woke. The car had stopped, and the view out the window next to me was so beautiful I forgot for a few moments that this wasn't exactly the time to enjoy the scenery. The moon had risen. Now at the full, it hung over the cliffs like a silver balloon. In the cold, bright light, the rocky ramparts looked like glaciers, and the desert floor like new-fallen snow. I'd never seen so many stars. My window was closed, but the one on the passenger side in front was partly open. I could hear their voices clearly. You won't need that, Faisal said. I hope not just so you and your friend understand that I'll use it if I must. I shifted position so I could see. Faisal leaned against the front fender, his hands in his pockets and his shoulders hunched against the chill of the night air. John faced him a few feet away. The moonlight was so bright I could see every detail. I don't doubt it in the least, Faisal said. He sounded more amused than apprehensive. Amazing. I never thought I'd see the day. Now keep calm, Johnny. 
I wasn't objecting to the aim, only to the means. It's been five years since I went that route, and I don't know whether I can persuade, bully, or bribe Amar into lending us the jeep. We haven't much money left. Threatening him would be a serious error, however. Put the gun away, okay? Give him this. John unstrapped his wristwatch. Faisal took the watch. All right, let's make the attempt. They got back into the car. John turned and looked at me. Awake? Yes, where are we? A few miles north of Asiut. Any further questions? How? Save them. And don't join in any discussion that may ensue. This is a conservative area. They don't approve of uppity women. The huddle of low, flat-roofed buildings a few miles farther on might, if one were charitably inclined, be described as a village. No lights showed at the windows of the houses. There was a café. There's always a café. But even it was dark. To give myself credit, which I'm always inclined to do, I felt sure I knew the answers to most of the questions I might have asked. The individual in the house on whose door Faisal was knocking had to be a member of the organization to which he'd once belonged, whatever that might be. Even experts in Middle East politics had some trouble keeping track of the various revolutionary groups and how their aims and methods differed. I wasn't familiar with the ramifications, but I knew that many students had been attracted to the radical movements because they promised an end to government corruption and inefficiency. That's what they all promise. And sooner or later, in the Middle East, or Ireland, or the States, the noble aims are distorted. Violence inspires answering violence. And often the ones who suffer most are the poor devils both sides claim to be defending. The repressive measures of the state security forces had won a lot of waverers over to the revolutionary cause. And I wouldn't have been surprised to learn that everyone in the village was a secret sympathizer. We were in Middle Egypt now. The city of Asiut across the river had been, and probably still was, one of the centers of rebellion, or terrorism, depending on which side you supported. The door finally opened and Faisal went inside. John had gotten out of the car and was leaning against the door, hands in his jacket pockets. I'd never known him to carry a weapon before. I wondered if he really would use the gun, or if the guy inside the house would shoot first. Faisal was only gone for ten minutes. When he returned, he was accompanied by his... friend? He didn't look very friendly. He'd wound his woolen scarf around his head and throat, but I could see his face clearly in the bright moonlight. It's all right, Faisal said, eyes fixed on John's right-hand pocket. He's agreed. He's not happy about it, but he has agreed. Good. John took his hand out of his pocket and opened the car door. Come on, Vicky. The sight of me didn't make the other guy any happier. He let out a spate of low-voiced Arabic and began waving his arms. I gave him an ingratiating smile. What's he mad about? I asked. Everything, Faisal said. I don't blame him. The situation has deteriorated, if that is possible. They are setting up checkpoints on this side of the river now and along the Red Sea Highway. That's encouraging, John said coolly. They don't know which route we've taken. They'll soon find out if we don't get moving this way. We followed our unwilling host to the back of the house, where the jeep, or to be more accurate, the rusting skeleton of a jeep, was parked. The doors were tied on with rope. I climbed over the side, noting as I sat down that there were a few springs left. One, at least. Faisal dumped the luggage in on top of me and turned to John. How much money have we? A couple of hundred pounds, why? We're going to need more supplies. Water, blankets, petrol. No, don't argue, just listen. The moon will be down before long, and I daren't risk driving this route in the dark. We'll have to hole up somewhere for the rest of the night, and probably all day tomorrow. I presume you don't want to arrive in broad daylight. John began, it's only thirty or forty miles, as the vulture flies. You've never done this. I have. You don't know this country. I do. The moonlight drained all the color from John's face. It looked like bleached bone. I said impulsively, 
You've got to get some rest before we go much farther, John. He turned on me. I told you to keep quiet. Keep quiet yourself. Faisal, how long... Faisal waved his hands wildly. Don't ask. Don't ask any more questions, either of you. Leave this to me. Our reluctant ally was becoming more reluctant by the minute. But, in exchange for all the money we possessed, he grudgingly produced a few jerry cans of gas, a couple of blankets, taken off a donkey to judge by the smell, several bottles of water, and a six-pack of what turned out to be fizzy lemon-flavored soda. Our departure was not marked by formal farewells. I started to say thank you, but the man just shook his head and trudged off. After a few abortive coughs, the engine started. The racket was appalling. It must have roused every sleeper who wasn't already awake, but not a light showed in any of the windows. I popped the top of a can and poured half a cup of lemonade down my front when Faisal threw the jeep into gear. We went bouncing off across the plain. There may have been a track of sorts, but you couldn't prove it by me. I clenched my teeth to keep from biting my tongue and refrained from comment. I knew why Faisal was proceeding at such an uncomfortable speed. We had to get well away from the village and into hiding before morning, and the moon was setting. I had an unpleasant feeling I also knew why Faisal didn't want to drive in the dark, and that suspicion was confirmed when I saw we were heading straight for the cliffs that rose sheer ahead. They call them wadis, canyons cut by water in the ramparts of the high desert. Flash floods and natural erosion have littered the uneven ground with rubble varying from pebbles to Chevy-sized boulders. The one into which Faisal drove, without slackening speed, was fairly wide at first, and there was a track of sorts through the center. The boulders weren't much bigger than toasters. We hit every one of them. I bit my tongue. Before long, the moonlight faded as the canyon narrowed and the cliffs closed in on either side. Faisal switched on the headlights. They didn't help much. One had burned out, and the other was about to go. Faisal went on a little farther and then stopped, with a jolt that jarred my back teeth together. He turned off the lights and the ignition. That's it, he said. The terrain gets rougher from here on. I don't want to break an axle. Rougher? I croaked. Our voices echoed eerily in the silence. It was so dark I couldn't even see their outlines but I heard the springs creak when John shifted his weight. How much farther? he asked, in a voice flat with fatigue. Irrelevant. Faisal sounded equally exhausted. We can't go on tonight. Let's get some rest. Hand out a couple of those blankets, Vicky. You can curl up in the back seat. Curl up is right, I said. I'd rather sleep on a rock. Which was precisely what I did. Faisal cleared away some of the bigger boulders, leaving a space just wide enough for the three of us to lie down, huddling together for warmth. I expected John would make some rude comment about bundling, but he didn't speak at all. He was trying to keep his teeth from chattering, I think. We were all shivering. The air was cold and the blankets were too thin to be much use. Without discussing the subject aloud, Faisal and I put John between us. He fell asleep immediately. Not even the hard ground and the stench of donkey and the cold could keep my eyes open. But as I drifted off, I was thinking longingly of Susie's great, big, furry white coat. Against all the odds, I slept for over six hours. It was the heat that woke me, the heat and a sensation of vague discomfort. When I pried my sticky eyes open, I realized I'd shifted position during the night. John's head was on my shoulder, and my left arm, which was around him, had gone numb. He looked like one of the better-preserved mummies. Skin stretched tight over cheekbones and forehead, eyelids shriveled and sunken, lips cracked. I heard a gurgling sound and looked up through my loosened hair to see Faisal standing over me. His appearance wasn't much of an improvement over John's, or, I suspected, my own. Wiping his mouth on his sleeve, he offered me the bottle of water. I swallowed, or tried to. My throat was as dry as the sandy dust, and shook my head. John slept for another half hour. When he opened his eyes, I croaked out a cheery good morning. Removing himself from my limp embrace, he sat up and lowered his head onto his hands. Did I ever mention, he said, 
that one of your least lovable characteristics is that you are so bloody cheerful early in the morning. You're usually pretty bloody cheerful yourself. He lifted his head. On the occasions to which you refer, I had excellent reasons to be. Stop it, Faisal ordered. Come and have breakfast, such as it is. Water and dry bread, oranges and hard-boiled eggs, was what it was. There was no way of heating water, even if we had had coffee or tea with us, which we didn't. Chewing on the hard bread, I studied our surroundings. Stony desert underfoot, steep rocky walls around. There wasn't so much as a blade of grass, much less a tree, dead or alive. The pale limestone of the cliff opposite dazzled in the sunlight. At least it's not raining, I said. John gave me a look in which amusement and exasperation were mingled. Faisal was not amused. Pray it doesn't. We don't have much rain here, but when it comes, it comes hard, and the water is all funneled through these wadis. A flash flood would be the end of us. Say something positive, I suggested. I'm trying my damnedest, Faisal said morosely. All right, let's take stock of where we stand. Clearing a patch of sand with a sweep of his hand, he took a pen from his pocket and used the blunt end to sketch a rough map. Here's the river. Here's the wadi we're in. And this is the one we're heading for. It passes the Hatnub quarries and comes out eventually into the Amarna plain near the southern tombs. I studied the sketch doubtfully. The two wadis don't connect. Not according to the standard maps, no. But it's barely possible to get a vehicle through, Faisal said, rubbing his prickly chin. At least it was five years ago. I can't be more specific about the route because it's too hard to describe. If anything happens to me, it will happen to all of us, John said evenly. At this point, you're the least expendable member of the party. More precious than diamonds. More precious than gold, I said. One point for me. John grinned, or tried to. Faisal rolled his eyes. You two are a pair, I'll say that. Can't you keep your minds on essentials? Laughter is one of the two things that make life worthwhile. Another of John's sententious sayings delivered one morning after he had demonstrated the importance of the other one. He was right on both counts. There are times when you have to laugh to keep from screaming, and if I'm in a tight spot, I'd rather be with someone who makes bad jokes instead of big dramatic scenes. If anything happens, Faisal repeated, keep heading west. John's hand obliterated the sketch. Forget that. Will we make it today? We'll have to, Faisal said curtly. With luck, sometime this afternoon. That's the next question. We don't want to come bursting onto the scene while the site is crowded with tourists and guides and guards, do we? No, John agreed. Let's set our ETA at 9 p.m., when people will be inside eating and watching telly. We've missed Schmidt. I said. My voice was steady, I think, but John said with unexpected gentleness, Don't worry about him, Vicky. I have a feeling we've both underestimated the old boy rather badly, and even if they catch up with him, they won't harm him so long as we're on the loose. I hope you're right. I'm always right, John said firmly. Anyhow, we can hardly be said to have missed him, and we don't know for certain where he is or what he's up to. Pray that he's gone on to Cairo. If he can convince someone in authority to search that boat, we'll be in the clear. The boat won't be there yet, will it? I asked, mopping my sweating face with my sleeve. I shouldn't think so. But you can be sure Blancan has moved up his schedule. He'll load and be underway as soon as he possibly can. And the Queen of the Nile is capable of a pretty fair turn of speed. If she travels night and day and Blancan uses his influence to get her through the locks without delay... She could reach Cairo in a few days. We, or Schmidt, must get there before the boat does. He reached casually into his pocket and took out the Tutankhamun pectoral. Glowing with soft shades of gold and turquoise and coral, it covered his entire palm. The giant blue beetle that dominated the design 
held a sun disk of carnelian in its raised pincers. Faisal caught his breath. From Blenkiron's collection. Good thinking, Johnny. That should be enough. John shook his disheveled head. It should be enough to capture the attention of the museum authorities, certainly. That's why I, um, borrowed it. But once Blenkiron is out of the country with his collection, it'll be my word against his as to where this came from. Eventually they may discover that the other objects are forgeries as well. But things move slowly in this part of the world, and bureaucrats in any part of the world are reluctant to take action. And while they're discussing and debating and arguing and speculating, we will be wasting away in a dungeon cell. If we're lucky. I like you better when you're being frivolous, I said. I don't. Faisal hoisted himself to his feet. We'd better get started. Even after seeing the terrain, I wouldn't have believed it would take six hours to cover less than thirty miles. I suppose it could have been worse. Nobody got bitten by a scorpion or a cobra, and the jeep held together, except for one of the doors, which Faisal wired back on. We only had two flat tires. Smaller canyons opened up along the way, and sometimes it was impossible to tell the main wadi from a dead end. We went for almost a mile into one of the latter before Faisal realized his error. He had to back out. As the sun rose higher, it beat straight down into the canyon, and the temperature kept climbing. We were all sticky wet and itching with sweat when we reached the end of the first wadi and found the steep slope ahead completely blocked by fallen boulders. Is there a way around? I asked. Both of them turned to glare at me. Faisal had taken off his shirt. Perspiration ran down his face and puddled in the hollows over his collarbones. It was a pity I was too hot and tired to enjoy the view, because he did have a great body. John had chosen not to display his. No, my dear, said Faisal, bearing all his beautiful white teeth in a snarl. This is it, the only way. There must have been a minor quake or a flash flood since I was last here. He got out and began fumbling among the miscellany of rusted tools in the back seat. I didn't ask any more questions. The options were obvious even to me. Either we abandoned the jeep and proceeded on foot, or we tried to clear away enough of the debris so we could go on. It would have been a formidable job even if we had had proper tools, and if the weather had been comfortable. With only a tire iron as a lever, and a temperature in the high 90s, and our supply of water running low. I remember thinking sympathetically of Sisyphus, the guy in the Greek legend who'd been condemned to spend eternity pushing a big rock up a hill. As soon as he got it to the top, it rolled back down again. When we stopped for a rest, Faisal mopped his forehead with what had once been a white handkerchief and was now a filthy rag. The sun had moved farther west and there was some shade. We passed the water bottle around and sat there wheezing, even John was too far gone to make jokes. His shirt was soaking wet, and not all the liquid was sweat. The bullet wound must have opened up again. As if he felt my eyes on him, he raised his head and gave me a hard stare, daring me to speak. I didn't. A little more should do it, Faisal said after a while. Do you really think so? I asked. I really do. He took my hand and turned it inspecting first the scraped palm and then the broken nails and bleeding fingers. Those are not the hands of a lady, I said. Guess I won't be invited to the junior cotillion. You're number one on my list, Faisal said softly. He raised my filthy, bloody hand to his lips. John stood up. I hate to interrupt this tender scene, but could we please get on with it? When Faisal called a halt, there were still a lot of rocks on that slope. We all climbed into the jeep and Faisal backed off to get a good running start and then gunned the engine. I closed my eyes and kept them closed while the jeep jounced up and over the ridge and then began to descend. The descent wasn't as steep as the ascent, but it was just as bumpy. When we reached relatively level ground, Faisal picked up speed and I opened my eyes. He was watching me in the cracked rearview mirror. The worst is over, he yelled. Not long now. Don't look at me, I yelled back. 
Keep your eyes on the, you should excuse the word, road. Experience is broadening, all right. Never again would I complain about any road surface, anywhere. Compared to what we'd been through, this stretch was a piece of cake. I now had leisure to realize how hot it was. The air was bone dry. I could feel my skin stretching and cracking. After approximately an hour, Faisal pulled up and turned off the engine. Almost there. People come this way occasionally, so we'd better lie low until dark. Stretched out on the hard ground, we finished the water. I was bone tired, but not sleepy. I waited till John had dropped off, or passed out, whichever came first, before I spoke. He can't go on much longer. I know, but there's nothing we can do for him now. Get some rest, Vicky. You worked like a hero today. What's going to happen when we reach Amarna? He's got something in mind, but don't ask me what. He told me where to go and what to say, but he did not condescend to explain further. Faisal stretched out with a long, heartfelt sigh. At least we can be sure no one has followed us. Only an idiot would attempt this route. Don't worry, love. We'll bribe or bully someone into helping us. We haven't any money. Faisal's long, fuzzy lashes were drooping. He opened his eyes a little wider and grinned at me. We'll sell something. You, perhaps. A woman who can work that hard should fetch a good price. I let him sleep. I tried to, but I couldn't. So I lay still counting John's breaths and watching the sky darken and the stars brighten against the night. Finally, Faisal stirred. Did we finish the water? There's some fizzy lemonade. I've been hoarding it. Well done. All right, let's do it. Johnny. I told you not to call me that, said a grumpy voice from the darkness. I assume you'd prefer it to blue eyes. Someday, perhaps, one of you will explain those esoteric comments to me. A cold day in hell, perhaps, John said. When we emerged from the widening mouth of the wadi, the moon was shining down on the plain of Amarna. Lights twinkled among the dark bank of trees along the river. Nobody felt like cheering. Not yet. Head north, John said. I suggest you follow the cliffs as long as possible. There's a chance of our being observed. If people don't know we're here, they're deaf, I remarked. Back to your old form, I see, John said. Perhaps you'd prefer to walk. It's only six or seven miles. I said no more. Faisal proceeded at a slower speed, and if I hadn't had other things on my mind, I might have enjoyed the scenery. The cliffs enclosing the plain were icy pale in that eerie light, checkered with shadow where crevices and canyons broke their ramparts. One deeper, darker opening might have been the entrance to the royal wadi, which we'd visited earlier. After we crossed the road that led from the landing to the tombs, Faisal stopped and shut off the ignition. That's the village over there. He indicated a few lights along the river. John didn't move. We'll wait here. What are you up to now? Faisal asked. Taking reasonable precautions, that's all. Three people are more conspicuous than one, especially when two of them are obviously foreigners. Someone must have heard us. You can have a look around and withdraw if there's trouble. The house you want is on the northeast corner of the village. There's a brick yard on one side, and... I know. You told me. Faisal hoisted himself out of the car and stretched. I'll signal if it's safe to proceed and wait for you on the edge of the cultivation. Six flashes, and then two at ten-minute intervals. He started off. John watched him for a few minutes and then climbed over the side of the jeep. Get out. What for? I would love to live long enough to see you respond to a sensible suggestion without asking why. A little exercise would be good for you. I got up, stretching. Oh, God, if this is what it feels like to be 80, I'm not sure I want to live that long. I'm sure. John steadied me as I climbed arthritically over the side of the jeep. We settled down next to a rock outcropping a few hundred yards away. 
This isn't very comfortable, I grumbled, squirming around, in the hope of finding some surface that wasn't littered with sharp pebbles. It's flat and it's in shadow. Oh, for Christ's sake, yeah. He took off Faisal's jacket and spread it on the ground. Aren't you cold? No. Have you got a temperature? He moved away from my outstretched hand and sat down a few feet away, his back against a rock. It will certainly begin to rise if you don't stop asking meaningless questions. How about a few meaningful questions? I handed him one of the cans of soda. Such as? Were you really planning to rob the Cairo Museum? Good God, no. I've already robbed the damn place twice. Why should I do it again? A man's reach should exceed his grasp, don't you think? Stealing an entire tomb is certainly a challenge. Your sympathetic understanding touches me more than I can say. He opened the can and drank deeply before going on. It isn't the entire tomb, you know. Only a few selected walls. I still find it difficult to believe how he hoped to get away with it. Oh, he'll get away with it, John said calmly. Unless we can stop him. It's a pity in a way. This might have been the high point of my distinguished career. You can see why the idea appealed to me. When did it start appealing? John settled himself more comfortably. My first arrangement with Blenkiron concerned the princess's diadem. You ought to have noticed the anomaly of that item during your encounter with my friends in Rome. All the other jewellery we, uh, replaced was Renaissance, or later in date, and it was all in private collections. The diadem was in the Cairo Museum, and only a fanatical collector would want an item that could never be displayed. You might have postulated a man like Blenkiron, obscenely wealthy and totally unscrupulous, when you saw that. Don't hassle me, John. I'm trying very hard to be nice. Are you? Sorry, I hadn't noticed. As I was saying, the beauty of my arrangement with Blenkiron was that I only had to liberate the objects from the museum. They stayed in the country, so there was no nerve-wracking encounter with customs. The only exception was the Detesheri statuette. He was so besotted with it, he insisted on carrying it around with him. However, smuggling antiquities into Egypt isn't as difficult as smuggling them out. So the one in the British Museum is a fake? John chuckled. Ironically enough, Blenkiron's is probably a fake as well. It wasn't only the analysis of the paint that cast doubts on the one I removed from the BM. There's something a bit off about the hieroglyphs. I wouldn't be at all surprised to learn that the first one was manufactured by the great-grandfather of the little old forger in Gurna, who made the second one for me. Manufacturing forgeries is an old tradition there. How did you find him? It's a long story, John said, reaching back into the mists of the past and replete with details Schmidt would undoubtedly find extremely romantic. Then don't tell it now. The British Museum must have been a real test of your skills. Their security measures are pretty good. I shan't respond to your subtle hints, darling, so don't bother asking how I did it. Trade secrets, you know. However, I will say that the theatrical plots concocted by writers and producers of thrillers are completely unworkable, especially the ones that depend on esoteric equipment. The more complicated a gadget, the more likely it is to break down just when you need it. He paused for refreshment before going on. The idea of stealing Tetesheri's tomb came to Blenkiron soon after the Getty people began working on the other queen's tomb, that of Nefertari. It was really rather a clever idea. Restoring the reliefs was precisely the sort of philanthropic endeavor people had come to expect of him and it gave him a perfect opportunity to have them copied. There was even a suggestion that a replica of the tomb might be made, in order to satisfy tourists without endangering the original. If at any point his activities had been discovered, he could claim that's what he was doing, as a boyish surprise for his good friends in the EAO. 
It was a monumental job, of course. But as Faisal pointed out, Blenkiron's rich enough to buy all the expertise he needs. And the experts, I murmured. Poor Jean-Louis. That was one of the most difficult aspects, actually, John said. You'd be surprised how many honest scholars there are. They had to be approached very, very carefully. But there aren't many positions in archaeology open, and there are a lot of poor, over-educated devils like Mazarin and Faisal seeking employment. Mazarin wasn't the one I would have chosen. Instead of admitting his own venality, he had to convince himself he was guided by noble motives. Such men are dangerous. Their consciences are never at ease, and they are apt to crack under pressure. I told Blenkiron that. He ignored my advice, and now you know why. He was prepared from the first to remove inconvenient witnesses. Is that why you tried to pull out? It was certainly a consideration. However, Max was an even stronger deterrent. If you recall, he was already vexed with me when we ran into one another in Sweden. I had advised Blenkiron not to hire him for this job, and Max knew it. He took my refusal to work with him personally, I'm sorry to say. He's such a sensitive chap. How did he learn your real name? I had caught him off guard. The empty can crumpled in his hands. That's not... You've been controlling the direction of this conversation. Now it's my turn. How'd they find you? Max didn't know who you were before. He kept calling you Smythe. John didn't answer. I knew he must be feeling rotten, or he'd have been able to come up with a facile lie. Not that I'd have believed it. I knew the answer. It was through me, wasn't it? Max knew you weren't dead. He knew my identity. She knew it from him. When she set out to track you down, she started with me. They must have been watching me for months, hoping, expecting you'd turn up. All they had to do then was follow you home. John tossed the crumpled can aside. What difference does it make? None at all, I said morosely. It's just the last goddamn straw that broke. Look, isn't that a light? John caught my arm as I started to stand up. It's a light, certainly. One of several. Hold on. You think it's not Faisal? There hasn't been time for him to reach El Til, much less have a look around. They're coming this way. Oh, dear, oh, dear, John said. I always expect the worst, but I loathe having it happen. Chapter 13 They got him, I whispered. Or he turned us in. He wouldn't do that, would he? One would certainly hate to think so. John's voice was so soft I could scarcely hear it. There are other possibilities, I suppose. The hell with other possibilities. We have to assume the worst, as you keep telling me. What are we going to do? You may do as you like, said John. I am going to uh, lie down. And he proceeded to do so, though fall over would have been a more accurate description. He looked rather peaceful with his head pillowed on his bent arm, but when I touched his cheek, he didn't move. His skin was burning hot. In a way, it was a relief to have no more choices left. I covered him with the coat and brushed the hair away from his temple. Goodbye, John, I whispered. I love you. I stood up. His hand wrapped around my ankle and brought me thudding to the ground. Where the hell do you think you're going? He demanded. Sand is a lot harder than it looks, and this variety of desert is littered with rocks. By the time I recovered my breath, it was too late to get away. He'd rolled me over onto my back and was lying across me. You low down skunk, I gasped. You did that on purpose. Is that any way to talk to the man you love? His voice was almost back to normal. I knew the slight unevenness was due to suppressed laughter. I'm deeply hurt that you'd think I'd resort to a childish, melodramatic trick like that one. John, are you crazy? Those people out there. There's plenty of time. Were you really going to dash out and lead the hunters away from me, risking capture and a fate worse than death? 
His lips were hot and dry. At first, I wrenched mine away. You're not crazy. You're delirious. Let me go. It's the only sensible course of action. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Stop doing that. No, it's not. Why should I? Because I'd lost my grip on the conversation, not to mention the whole situation. Look, I can't. I'm busy. They won't do anything to me, I said, giggling insanely. I do that when I'm upset, and his lashes were tickling me. I'll tell them it's not a sensible idea, said John, because that may not be the police. And if it isn't, and if they catch you, I'll go after you, and then we'll have to repeat the whole tedious performance. Would you? I told you not to ask silly questions. Say it again. I love you. That's what I thought you said. He lifted himself on his elbows, freeing my hands. I wrapped them around the back of his head and drew his face down to mine. I was a trifle distracted, however, not only by the unnatural heat of his skin, but by a far-off sound. Turning my head, I murmured, We'd better stop this. Discretion would seem to suggest a more responsible course of action. Instead of moving, he kissed the corner of my mouth. Vicky, I couldn't tell you the truth. I couldn't even let you begin to wonder. They had me so boxed in. I know. Faisal told me. I must have missed that part. I hope he portrayed me in a favorable light. You came out looking like Sir Galahad, and me like something that had crawled out from under a... Oh, God. John. Sorry, did I hurt you? Yes. Do it again. No, no, don't. We've got to... I did hurt you. That night, after you danced with Faisal, while you were laughing and giving him languishing glances, she was leaning against my shoulder, watching you, and smiling, and saying things under her breath. Schmidt turned up in the nick of time. I couldn't have kept my hands off her much longer. And then when I saw you, you'd been so cool and indifferent. I thought you didn't care, and... But that doesn't excuse what I did. Can you... John, I said desperately. Isn't that a dog I hear? Probably. There are dozens of them around, and they howl at... Oh. He lifted his head and listened. You mean a dog, as opposed to dogs in general. Damned if I don't think you're right. That puts a different complexion on things. We might elude human searchers, but man's best friend is another matter. I'm beginning to detest the bloody creatures. First that diabolical hound of yours. Get up this minute! The lights were closer now. Three separate beams. Flashlights, I thought. Not the police, then. They'd have more effective equipment, and they'd be making a lot more noise. How could they know we'd end up here? I demanded. Good question. John got to his feet. Another outburst of canine commentary floated across the desert, and John echoed it with an outburst of profanity. My brain seems to have crashed. You'd better get into hiding. It may not be necessary, but... My brain wasn't working any better than his. It had gone back to basics, driven by the same primitive instincts that move all hunted creatures. Right. Hide. Where? I know a place. I hoped we wouldn't have to resort to it, since I know how you feel about... Oh, no, not a tomb. I can't, John. I really can't. Not a tomb. We couldn't get into them anyhow. They've all got locked gates. Come on. The surface under our feet cracked and crunched with every step. The shadows through which we moved weren't dark enough. The rocks between us and the plain weren't thick enough or hard enough. If John hadn't kept shoving at me, I might have sat down on the ground and waited in fatalistic acceptance, like some poor cornered rabbit. In a way, it was worse for me than it would have been for the rabbit. I knew exactly what would happen if we were caught. I'd seen what Mary could do when she was just amusing herself. She'd be really annoyed by now. The face of the cliff was weathered and uneven. 
I saw a dozen crevices big enough to offer concealment, but every time I headed mindlessly toward one, John pulled me on. I could have handled a nice shallow crevice, no problem. I had a feeling he had something less comfortable in mind. He seemed to know where he was going. How? The question, like a lot of others, ran through my head and out the other side, without hanging around long enough to inspire an answer. After passing around a low ridge, he headed for one of the openings in the cliff. The moon was down, but those impossibly bright stars cast enough light for me to see how dark the opening was. Really dark. Very, very dark. He had to drag me through it. The space beyond was devoid of light, but not of sound. Things squeaked and flapped. The blackness moved. I flung myself at him, clutching at his shirt. Not such a smart move, that one. But there was a wall behind him. Otherwise, we'd have both fallen to the ground. His breath went out in a sound that would have been audible a long way off if compressed lips hadn't contained it. Then his arms closed around me, and his mouth brushed my ear. Hang on, darling. It's just a cave and a few miserable bats. Lazy little buggers. They ought to have been out before this. Oh, God, I whimpered. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry I hurt you. No, you didn't. That was a lie if I'd ever heard one, and I had heard plenty of them from John. Listen to me, Vicky. I doubt they know about this place, but the dog may be able to lead them here. If that happens, there's another way out. A tunnel. I can't. Yes, you can. We'd both been whispering. He was barely breathing the words now, his lips against my ear. Rest a minute. Catch your breath. I tried to pull away from him, so my weight wouldn't press against his chest, but he tightened his grip. His lips moved across my cheek. Show me where the tunnel is, I murmured. In a minute. It seemed to go on longer than a minute. Then he said softly, this way, and drew me with him toward the back of the cave. Here, see it? I can't see a damn thing. Feel it then. He guided my hand. Got it. How did you know about this place? It's an old family. He didn't have to warn me to stop talking. Sound carries a long way in the quiet desert night. The footsteps were still some distance away, but they were coming closer. His hand moved to my shoulder. I resisted the pressure. It wasn't difficult. You first, I said. I'll follow. Another lie. Adrenaline and a mix of other hormones had given him a temporary burst of strength. But I doubted he could stand erect without the support of the wall against which he was leaning. Sometimes my instincts work better than my so-called brain. The one that gripped me now superseded fear and even self-preservation. My hands were icy cold, but absolutely steady. His were neither. I got the gun out of his pocket while he was still fumbling for my wrist. The dog was right outside. I heard its quick, excited panting, then a slither of rock and a muffled expletive. The uneven contours of the entrance brightened. I got my finger round the trigger and aimed, bracing my wrist with the other hand. The dog let out a sharp, peremptory bark. The man with it cleared his throat. Uh, Dr. Bliss? Mr. Dragarth, are you there? It wasn't Max's voice. It was a voice I'd never heard before, slow and hesitant, with a pleasant southern accent. John's hand closed over mine and pushed my arm down. The voice went on. Uh, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, Dr. Bliss, but, uh, if you're there, you, uh, damn it, Fido, you sure this is the right place? Stupid dog. Fido? Fido? Barked indignantly. Oh, well then, the voice said. I feel like a jackass, but if you say so. Uh, you remember me, Mr. Dragarth? Keith Kendrick from UCAL? Uh, how are you? I started to laugh. Do come in, John said. You'll have to excuse Dr. Bliss. She does this sometimes. 
Giggling maniacally, I shielded my eyes against the brilliance of the light. Behind it was a tall, thin man with sandy hair and an embarrassed smile. The dog at his heels looked like one of the pariah dogs that hang around the villages, but it had a collar and its tail was flailing furiously. John cleared his throat. Dr. Bliss, may I present Dr. Kendrick? Vicky, I gasped. Pleased to meet you. Call me Keith. I made an effort and managed to stop laughing. How did you know we were here? He told me, of course, he's been expecting you. Faisal? I asked, doubtfully. Not Faisal, John muttered. I'm afraid it wasn't Faisal. I'm afraid... I don't think I can stand this. We did run into Faisal, Kendrick said, while we were looking for you. He expected you'd be here before this, and he was getting worried, so we went out. He? I began waving my arms. I don't think I can stand this either. He who? Kendrick shied back. I'd forgotten I was still holding the gun. Uh, Dr. Bliss, if you wouldn't mind putting that away. He's coming. Don't get excited. I think I hear him now. There was no think about it. He was coming at full speed, tripping over and running into things. When he burst into the cave, he was too out of breath to speak. He grabbed me and hung on, wheezing. Schmidt, I gasped. Schmidt, is that you? Thank God you're all right. What are you doing here? But why should you be so surprised? Schmidt let me go. I told you I would be here. Guten Abend, sir. John, I am so very happy to see you again. He rushed at John, grabbed his hand, and began pumping it up and down. John gave him a bemused smile. Amana, he mumbled. You left those clues, the brochure and the... the... the bag, yes. I knew you clever ones would know what they meant. What else could they mean? Amana, John repeated. Right, clever ones. Stop shaking him that way, Schmidt, I said. He's not, he's not feeling well. Ah, oh, poor friend. You have a fever, yeah. We will return at once to the house. Here, I will support you. He turned and yanked John's arm over his shoulder. It was too much for poor John. I don't know whether he was shaking with chills or with laughter, but he managed to make it back to the jeep where Faisal was waiting before he keeled over. Our arrival at Keith's house wasn't exactly inconspicuous. He and Faisal had to carry John in, and Schmidt wouldn't shut up. But nobody came out of the neighboring houses to ask what was going on. Sometimes it's safer not to know what's going on. The house had only two rooms. The one into which Keith led us was obviously his bedroom. It contained a camp cot, a few boxes, a table and chair, both draped with miscellaneous male garments, and a lamp. I wouldn't have been able to afford such comfortable quarters if it hadn't been for Mr. Tregarth's generosity, Keith said. I hope he's not seriously ill. What can I do? The place didn't look comfortable to me. It didn't even look sanitary. But it was a lot better than we had any reason to expect. I asked for water and was pleased to learn that John's generosity had also provided plenty of the bottled variety. Faisal went off to deal with the jeep, and Keith went for more water, and Schmidt hunkered down beside me and watched while I unbuttoned John's shirt and started peeling back the tape. He has been wounded. He was genuinely concerned, but I detected an underlying note of enjoyment. Wounds are so romantic. In Schmidt's favorite form of fiction, they're usually in the arm or the shoulder, and after biting his lip and muttering, It's only a scratch. The hero goes back to fighting four or five opponents barehanded. You could say that. I lifted the cloth. Lieber Gott, Schmidt whispered. Who has done this? I'll tell you later. It's not as bad as it looks, Schmidt, I added, as tears of sympathy rolled down Schmidt's sunburned cheeks. Something else must be causing the fever. Maybe... 
Maybe a good night's sleep is all he needs. John opened one eye. Was that... The eye rolled toward Schmidt and then closed. It was. I thought I was dreaming. I hoped I was dreaming. Schmidt, what have you... Oh, sein, my poor friend, Schmidt said. All is well. You are safe with... All is not well. John raised himself on one elbow. What of rest and sleep, Schmidt insisted, trying to push him back down. No, have something to drink. You're probably dehydrated. I shoved Schmidt away and held a glass to John's lips. Yes, that is probably better, Schmidt agreed. Oh, Christ, will you two stop picking at me like dogs over a bone? I'll submit to your infernal attentions as soon as Schmidt tells me what wild story he gave Kendrick. Richard is himself again, I remarked. Richard is a hell of a long way from being himself, which is lucky for you. Schmidt. Why, I told him the truth, of course. Oh, God. John collapsed back onto the hard pillow. That you had discovered a plot directed against the museum and were on your way to Cairo to disclose it with the villains in hot pursuit, Schmidt went on. In those exact words, I suppose. He let out an involuntary sigh as I began wiping his face with a wet cloth. Well, it could be worse. You didn't go into detail. I told him no more than that, Schmidt said indignantly. It is an old rule of espionage, the need to know. Besides, he would have thought me verrückt if I had told him the entire truth. And now you must rest. Perhaps a sleeping pill, eh? I have with me... No pills, I said. He's taken too many already. Faisal and Keith returned at that point. How is he? The latter asked, squatting beside the bed. God almighty, how did he... A slight accident, John said. I'm prone to them, especially when I'm in the company of certain people. If he's complaining, he's back to normal, said Faisal. He shoved a heap of garments off the chair and sat down. Y'all look as if you could use a drink, Keith said. I've got a bottle of bourbon. And there is beer, Schmidt offered. I brought with me beer, of course, I said. Where there's Schmidt, there's always beer. Sorry, boys, but we're not going to have a party. Everybody out. He needs to rest. Just one more thing. John's brief burst of energy was fading. He forced his eyes open. Schmidt, how did you get here? Why, by the train, of course. My cryptic message to you was received and deciphered, John said gravely. Which train? I left Luxor at six in the evening. It tore my heart in two to leave you, Vicky, before I could know whether you had succeeded in your courageous rescue. But I felt certain you would. And if you did not, I could serve you best by going for help as quickly as possible. So, you left the hotel shortly after I did. I was beginning to understand what was on John's mind and to share the wild curiosity that kept him conscious. I suppose you were disguised? Aber natürlich. They might have been watching for us at the station. Would you like to see how I disguised myself? I can hardly wait, John murmured. Schmidt rummaged among the articles on the table. He was too pleased with himself simply to display the garments. He had to put them on. A long, dusty black robe, a headcloth of the same color, and an opaque veil that covered his face from the bridge of his nose to the end of his chin. I wore also my contact lenses said the chubby little Egyptian woman in a muffled voice. They made my eyes water very much because the windows of the car were open and there was a great deal of dust and sand. Such a useful costume, eh? I did not even have to cut off my mustache, though I would have done it, Vicky, if... What is wrong? He's fainted, I said. I didn't blame him. He felt cooler after I'd sponged him off. 
and he'd passed from unconsciousness to what seemed to be normal sleep. After washing the parts of me that showed, and a few that didn't, I went into the next room, where the party was in full swing. Schmidt jumped up from his chair. From the chair, I should say, there was only one. Bier or bourbon, Vicky? Neither. I... Oh, what the hell. Bourbon. You should rest, too. Schmidt assisted me into the chair and patted me. I will, after we've decided what to do next. At the moment, our options are somewhat limited, Faisal said dryly. He was sitting cross-legged on the floor. In his rumpled, dusty clothes, his dark face with a day's growth of beard, no one would have known him for the well-groomed young professional of the Queen of the Nile. We'll have to stay here till John is fit again. When will he... How the hell should I know? I took a swallow, shuddered, and took another one. Sorry, Faisal. I didn't mean to snap at you. If he's not better, a lot better, by tomorrow, I'll get him to a doctor. You may have to help me. If he's conscious, he won't go voluntarily. Then you and Schmidt will have to proceed without us. It would probably be best for you to separate. That doubles the chance that one person will get through. Faisal gave me an odd look and nodded without comment. Schmidt said, But Vicky... Shut up, Schmidt. The bourbon was great stuff. My brain was really clicking. I felt like a combination of Einstein and Ms. Super Spy ready for anything. We can't stay here long. For one thing, Keith could get in deep trouble if the cops find out he sheltered us. Once the truth comes out, he would be a hero. Schmidt twirled his mustache and added happily, like the rest of us. If the truth comes out. Please don't argue, Schmidt. I figure I'm good for about ten more minutes. And although I'm dying to hear about your train ride, and why Keith is indebted to John, and how the hell we all ended up here where none of us expected to be, all that can wait. The whole village must know we're here. Sooner or later, someone will turn us in. Any group of people has a few potential informers. I'd rather take my chances with the police than with... with the other guys. If they locate us first... I raised the glass to my lips. It was empty. No wonder I was starting to feel so peculiar. I am not drunk, I said. Slowly and with dignity, I slid from the perpendicular to the diagonal. I think it was Faisal who caught me. I woke twice during what would have been the night if I'd gotten to bed at a decent hour. On both occasions, the room was light. On both occasions, I found myself on my knees beside the bed, fumbling at John's face before I came fully awake. The first time he felt hot, so I sponged him off, getting only an irritable mumble as thanks. The second time he was shivering, so I covered him up. And then returned to the rug some kind soul had put beside the bed, promising myself I'd just rest for a few more minutes. The next time I woke up, the temperature had risen a good 40 degrees. My clothes were sticking to me, and my mouth felt like a desert path along which a lot of camels had passed. Keith stood in the open doorway, a tray in his hands. Oh, sorry, he said. I was just getting him some coffee. John was sitting up, trying to look debonair, which isn't easy for a man who was unshaven, dirty, half-naked, and in somebody else's bed. I had to give him credit. He almost carried it off. You look very fetching, he remarked. If you ask me nicely, I might even share my coffee with you. I sat up, observing for the first time that the garment sticking to my sweating body was a white robe trimmed with gold. Schmidt must have stopped at the shops on his way to the station. I hoped it was he who had undressed me. I'll, uh... I'll just get another cup. Keith retreated. Tactful lad, John said. Aren't you going to come here and soothe my fevered brow? I crawled to the bed and touched his forehead. It is warm. His hand slid up my arm inside the loose sleeve. So are you. So is the climate of Upper Egypt. You look terrible. His fingers tightened, drawing me closer. 
Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. The mind has very little to do with it, I said wryly. If I were as ill-mannered as some people, said my beloved, I would point out that you aren't at your best just now either. But you're my darling, you're my sunshine, and I won't stop loving you when your hair has turned to silver. Can you say less? No fair. That's at least two different songs. Answer the question. What question? I hadn't supposed we'd be left alone for long, and I would have bet money on the identity of the next visitor. John let go of me, and I sat back on my heels. Ah, said Schmidt, pleased. You are feeling better. I hope you aren't going to make a habit of this, Schmidt, John said. No, no, don't mind me. Trust, go on with... Give me the coffee, Schmidt, I said. Schmidt did so, and then seated himself. If you don't want to make love some more, then perhaps we should talk, eh? Yes, that is best. You must save your strength, my friend. Making love is weakening to the vital forces of even a man who is in perfect health, and making love with a woman like Vicky... Um, right, John said. If you don't mind, Schmidt, we ought to turn our attention to more pressing matters than my vital forces. What's been going on in the great outside world? I seem to have wasted the day in slothful slumber. It was not wasted, Schmidt assured him. You needed to recover your strength. Perhaps you will be able to go on tomorrow morning, assuming, of course, that you and Vicky do not... Shut up, Schmidt, I said, automatically. I would have liked to give John a hand with his toilette, without engaging in any of the debilitating activities Schmidt had mentioned, but the only way I could get Schmidt out of the room was to take him out. It was later than I'd realized. Schmidt had the right idea. John needed another night's rest before we could continue our journey. And we needed clothes, nourishment, and above all, more information before we decided how to proceed. Faisal had gone out in search of the last. Keith was brewing something on a two-burner hot plate. When he asked if I was hungry, I said I'd wait for the others. I'm sorry we descended on you like this, I added. We'll try to make it up to you. Keith turned down the burner and squatted beside my chair. I remembered now where I'd seen him, talking to Schmidt the day the tour visited Amarna. Schmidt would, of course, view that brief encounter as the beginning of a beautiful friendship. What were friends for if not to help their friends in an emergency? Maybe this development would cure Keith of talking to strangers. I have to admit, I thought Dr. Schmidt had lost his marbles when he turned up with a wild story about robbing the Cairo Museum. Keith glanced at Schmidt, who was sitting on the floor next to the rug where the dog lay. The dog's tail was flopping up and down, and Schmidt was talking to him in German. But when he said Mr. Tregarth was meeting him, I figured it was all right. I hope I didn't offend Mr. Tregarth when I mentioned his generosity. He asked to remain anonymous when he offered to support my work here for an additional month. He's a very modest man, I said. When did he do that? About six weeks ago. I had permission to work here, but I only had enough funding for a month with strict economy. Now I can finish my survey. I let him tell me about the survey, nodding and smiling at appropriate moments. I don't believe in coincidences. It was reassuring to know that this wasn't one. John's generosity had been nothing of the sort. Having been informed of Blankiron's plans, he had realized he would need all the allies he could find. And he had had to pick someone who already had the EAO's permission to work at a given site, since official permission wasn't easily or quickly achieved. He must have planned to leave the crews at Amarna, and he had undoubtedly prepared a plausible story to win Keith's cooperation. My arrival had put an end to that scheme. He hadn't even bothered to approach Keith during our visit. But Schmidt had, and nice, indiscreet Keith must have told Schmidt about his generous patron, and Schmidt had assumed that when he indicated Amarna as our meeting place, John would go to Keith. As he had. 
So far, Schmidt was way ahead of the rest of us. He'd known exactly what he was doing. I still didn't know what I was doing. Tired of Schmidt's attentions, the dog wandered over to inspect me. He was a nondescript creature, like all the other pathetic strays, except that his ribs weren't showing, and he seemed to trust people. What happens to him when you leave? I asked, scratching Fido behind his ear. He's not mine. One of the Egypt Exploration Society people adopted him a couple of years ago. They come out for a few months every winter, and the custodian looks after him when they're away. He must prefer Boston baked beans to rice, though, because he's been hanging around me since I got here. I'm afraid that's the main course tonight, he added with a grin. My commissariat isn't extensive. I assured him I shared Fido's passion for baked beans. I'll get to it then, Keith said, unfolding himself and rising. Faisal should be back any minute. I hope Mr. Tregarth is better. I've never seen injuries quite like those. It's almost as if someone deliberately... I don't think you want to know the details, I said. It's not because we don't trust you. That's okay. The less I know, etc. Here's Faisal, he added. Baked beans coming up. Schmidt rushed to greet Faisal. Sehr gut, mein Freund. You are safely returned. What is happening? It could be worse, Faisal admitted. The whole damned village knows we're here, of course. How did you explain our presence? I asked. I know small towns, gossip is a favorite sport, and personal questions aren't considered rude, just friendly. Faisal ran his fingers through his dusty hair and squatted down on the floor. I said I'd been hired to drive a couple of Kendrick's archaeological friends who had come to visit him for a few days. Nobody questioned the story, but the sooner we move on, the better. How's Johnny? Johnny made his appearance at that moment. Anything else of interest? he inquired. Not much. I didn't want to ask questions about the kidnapped American tourists, and nobody brought it up. You know villagers. They're more interested in local scandal than in issues of national importance. Turn on the radio, Kendrick, and let's see if we can get a news broadcast. We were eating dinner. Keith had also opened a couple of cans of beef stew before the news came on. It was, of course, in Arabic, and I had to wait for a translation, but I could tell by Faisal's lengthening face that it wouldn't be good news for us. They know we've changed vehicles, Faisal said, switching off the radio. Amr reported the jeep stolen. Damn him. One can't blame him for protecting himself, John said, and his friends and family. So they know we're on this side of the river. They seem to have lost track of us, Faisal admitted grudgingly. We might have doubled back, getting through the checkpoints before they found out about the jeep, or struck out into the desert. But we can't use the jeep any longer. They've got a description, and the number. Can we buy another car? I asked. John glanced at me. He didn't say anything, but I knew that look, and I realized that once again he was one step ahead of me. If he had planned to leave the cruise here, he must have made arrangements for transport away from the site. After a brief pause, I give the guy credit it was very brief. Keith cleared his throat. You can take my Land Rover. I guess it's the least I can do since it was your money that paid the hire fee. John's faint smile faded, and he said bluntly, you're too intelligent not to suspect by now that you've been set up, Kendrick. I didn't expect matters to develop as they have. And I'm sorry about taking advantage of you, but not sorry enough to let you off the hook. We've got to have that vehicle. I don't think you'll get in serious trouble over this. If anyone, police or otherwise, learns we were here, don't try to be clever or heroic. Tell them we robbed you, lied to you or held you up at gunpoint. Any story you like, we'll back you up. Let's hope it won't come to that, Keith said. I don't understand what the hell this is all about. But as my granny used to say, you gotta trust somebody sometime. You will let me know what happens, won't you? You'll hear it on the news broadcasts, John said. 
one way or the other. All right, then, we'll be on our way in the morning. Faisal, you and Schmidt take the Land Rover. You'll look very innocent with your dear old mum in the back seat. Vicky and I will wend our way to Minya and... Faisal shook his head. It won't wash, Johnny. There's a greater chance, John began. I agree. We'll have to divide forces. But neither of you speaks Arabic. Schmidt does. Only enough to swear and tell dirty jokes, I said. Schmidt blushed. Faisal said, that would be enough. No, Johnny, I'm sorry, but Vicky goes with me or with Schmidt. It had better be with me. That way there'll be one able-bodied man in each party. Listen, you male chauvinist, I began. Schmidt was as indignant as I. Ha! You think I cannot defend myself and protect Vicky? I, the finest swordsman in Europe? I patted his hand and made appreciative noises. But I was watching John, and I saw his face change as he met Faisal's steady stare. Faisal is right, he said slowly. This is a better arrangement all round. He knows the roads, and if Vicky slumps down in the back seat, she can wear one of those conveniently concealing female garments and remain modestly silent. I hope that won't be too great a strain, Vicky. Now go to hell. I said, angrily. If you think I don't know why Faisal suggested this, you are sadly mistaken. Women and children into the lifeboats first, right? They'll be watching the railroad stations, and you're the one Larry wants, and you aren't able-bodied, and... Schmidt had taken my hand in his. He squeezed it and said gently but firmly, They are in the right, Vicky. Think with your head instead of your heart, and do not make this more difficult. It wouldn't be any easier for John or for Schmidt than for me. I knew that. They'd be as worried about me as I would be frantic with apprehension for them. But they were right, damn them. Larry would be just as pleased to have me as John. If they catch you, John had said, then I'll come after you. So would Schmidt, the little hero. They took my silence for agreement. Faisal got to his feet. The market is still open. What are we going to need? Schmidt had cashed all his traveler's checks, so we had money to burn. After Faisal had left, shopping list in hand, we settled down to wait. Keith declined my offer to help with the dishes, so I joined John on the floor, and Schmidt started singing to the dog. Don't ask me why. I guess singing calmed Schmidt's nerves. The dog loved it. So did John. Let's have detour on the highway to heaven again, Schmidt, he suggested. The third verse, if you ever get out of the fast lane, fascinated Keith to such an extent that he squatted down on the rug next to the dog and requested an encore. Under cover of Schmidt's and the dog's howls, I said softly, You rotten cheat, you already knew those songs. I am acquainted with the entire spectrum of Western music. John said modestly. He put his arm around me, and I leaned against his shoulder. Then why did you pretend you'd never heard them? I hadn't. Not a Schmidt performed them. I've been waiting all my life to hear him sing It Wasn't God Who Made Honky Tonk Angels. Schmidt was explaining to Keith about traveling melodies. You will find the same tune used for many different songs. The one I have just sung to you is the same one used for that tender love song, I am thinking tonight of my blue eyes. Don't sing it, Schmidt, I begged. No, not our song, John agreed. He was shaking with amusement. How about Great Speckled Bird instead, Schmidt? Ach, yeah, that is right. Do you know that one, Keith? The large spotted bird is the church, you see. The other birds all flopped around her. John's face took on a look of unholy glee. I'm going to get him a guitar. No, a harmonica. I hid my face against his shoulder. I was laughing, laughing so hard I cried.
Faisal and I left at dawn. Schmidt and John would wait till later, when there were more people around, before they took the passenger ferry. Schmidt was the cutest little sheik you ever saw. Since he had to do whatever talking might be necessary, he had to wear male clothing, and since his accent was a trifle peculiar, we decided he'd better be a tourist from some other Arab-speaking country. He was crying, of course. He held out his arms, and I gave him a hearty hug. See you in Cairo, Schmidt. Take care of yourself. Yes, yes. Schmidt straightened his shoulders and wiped his eyes. Fear not, Vicky. I will protect your lover with... Shut up, Schmidt. I kissed him and turned to John. Schmidt's dye wasn't as sophisticated as the hair coloring my female friends use. It had left John's hair flat and dull. His eyes were startlingly blue in the tan of his face. We hadn't weakened John's vital forces the night before. In fact, I'd hardly had a moment alone with him. There'd been too much to do, and at Schmidt's insistence, he had taken something to make him sleep. Take care, I said. And you. We shook hands. It was an absurd thing to do, I suppose. But with Faisal and Schmidt looking on, and the black garments muffling even my face, anything more demonstrative would have been still more absurd. Faisal grinned and shook his head and murmured something in Arabic. Schmidt blinked furiously. Since the section of the East Coast Highway north of Amarna wasn't finished, we had to take the car ferry across to the West Bank. Faisal had turned pale when John asked if there wasn't a roundabout way, like the one we'd taken to reach the site, and John had tactfully dropped the subject. Once we reached Minya, we would cross back to the East Bank. There were fewer towns and less traffic on that side, and we could make better time. I huddled down in the back seat and tried to look senile, while Faisal got out to chat and smoke with the other early birds. The crossing only took five minutes, and nobody approached me. My thoughts weren't good company. Had some potential danger been overlooked? Some precaution forgotten? John's temperature had been about normal that morning, as nearly as I could tell without a thermometer. But he was a long way from healthy, and some of the deeper cuts weren't healing the way they should. Since Schmidt was a sheik, with all that oil money in his pocket, they could at least travel comfortably. John was supposed to be his secretary or companion or something. Schmidt had turned purple with embarrassment and fury when Faisal made a ribald comment about one alternative. John was wearing poor Keith's one white shirt and best suit, and he would speak only German, at which he was fairly fluent. But theirs, as I had known, was the most dangerous route. Once they reached the opposite bank, they'd have to hire a car or a taxi to take them to Minya in order to catch the train, and there was a good chance the police would have the railroad station under surveillance. Given the best possible scenario, if they weren't caught or delayed or forced to seek an alternative route, they couldn't hope to reach Cairo before afternoon. Faisal had estimated it would take us at least six hours, even if none of the above disasters occurred. We were to meet the others at the Central Railroad Station, where the giant statue of Ramses II marks the center of the square. There was enough traffic, pedestrian and vehicular, to provide reasonable cover. 5 p.m. was the hour designated for the first attempt at a rendezvous. We'd try again every two hours until we met. Or until something else happened. If either party reached the city earlier, it was not to wait for the other. John's instructions on that point had been clear and forceful. The sooner we notify the authorities, the safer everyone will be. Schmidt will get in touch with his friends in the EAO and the ministry. Vicky, I'll put through a call to Carl Fader. He got me into this, damn him, and he can damn well get me out. All right. If you can't reach him, or if anything whatsoever goes wrong, head straight for the American embassy. Faisal and I hit our first little problem when we approached the bridge crossing to the east bank. Traffic was backed up for half a mile, and as Faisal slowed, I heard him cursing quietly and monotonously under his breath. 
I leaned forward and he interrupted his monologue long enough to mutter, Shut up and cover your face and pray. He called out a question to a man standing in the back of a pickup ahead of us. I didn't understand the answer or the question, but I knew what it must have been. Traffic was moving, though very slowly. I could see the uniforms and the rifles up ahead. I turned myself into a black huddle, trying to look seven inches shorter. In my extremity, the only prayer I could remember was, now I lay me down to sleep, which was, I devoutly hoped, inappropriate. I bowed my head and concentrated on breathing. It took over twenty minutes to get through that half mile. I knew better than to look up, even when the car stopped and I felt rather than saw a man right next to me. After a moment, during which I didn't breathe at all, and a brief exchange in Arabic, the Land Rover began to move. Faisal went on for another ten or fifteen miles, and then pulled off the road. Turning, his arm over the back of the seat, he gave me a strained smile and said hoarsely, How about something to drink? I fumbled in the basket at my feet and got out a bottle of soda. If we have to do that again, I'm going to die, I informed him. Faisal drained the bottle and tossed it out. They're still looking for the jeep, I think. They didn't even ask for my papers. If they don't find out we've changed vehicles, we should be all right. Relax and enjoy the scenery. Ah, I said. One of these years, I hope to travel that road again, when I'm in a proper state of mind to appreciate the view. That day, I wouldn't have noticed the Great Pyramid of Giza unless it had been in the middle of the road. Faisal drove like a man fleeing justice, but then so did everybody else. I had to hold my voluminous garments with both hands to keep them from flapping in the breeze from the open windows. He was in front, I was in back. There was no possibility of conversation, so I clung to my veils and closed my eyes. Twice we were slowed to a crawl by construction, three times by accidents. All three appeared to be minor. What blocked the road were the crowds of gesticulating debaters discussing the incident. I hadn't slept much the previous night. When I awoke after a nap I hadn't meant to take, we were on a wide street lined with shops and teeming with traffic. Straight ahead, two slender, delicately carved towers rose into the sky. I leaned forward and poked Faisal. Where are we? Is that a mosque up ahead? No. It's one of the city gates. Dates from the 11th century. I took a roundabout route. His voice cracked. We made it. Praise be to God we made it. Praise be to God, I agreed heartily. What time is it? Half past twelve. Do you want something to eat? I want to get out of this tent. I grumbled. I want a shower and a drink with ice in it and a change of clothes. But I'll settle for being here in one piece. You may as well divest yourself of that ensemble if you can do it gracefully and inconspicuously, Faisal said. You'll be no more noticeable in Western clothes now. I'll find a cafe and we'll have a bite while we discuss our next move. I was too stupefied by heat, drowsiness, and disbelief to argue. But by the time he stopped and I had, inconspicuously, I hoped, removed my tent and veil, I'd had second thoughts. We were in the heart of the city by then, and there were a number of young people around, including some foreigners. I cleverly deduced that Faisal had picked a spot in the university area. We shouldn't take time for this, I objected, as he helped me out. I need to make that call to Carl Fader. Munich is in an earlier time zone, isn't it? He's probably out to lunch. Faisal led me through a doorway curtained with strings of beads and found a table. The place was hot and dark and noisy and full of flies. People were talking in a mixture of languages, and a radio was blaring Egyptian pop music in the background. What do you want to eat? I don't care anything. Something with ice in it. No ice, not here. It's made of the local water. He ordered in Arabic. Then he said, I'm going to telephone my father. Are you sure that's a good idea? My mother will be out of her mind, Faisal said simply. 
I have to let her know that I am safe and innocent of the charges. If he had presented any other argument, I might have disagreed, but that one hit me where I lived. I knew what it was like to wait hour after hour and day after day for news of someone's fate, fearing the worst. Boy, did I know. Come to think of it, my mother is probably not very happy either, I said guiltily. Does the whole world know I've been abducted? Count on it, Faisal said, grimacing. Yeah, it's the kind of story reporters love. Damn, my dad's probably on his way to Cairo right now. Well, they'll have to wait a few more hours. I can't put through an international call from a public phone. The food arrived, chunks of meat and pieces of pepper and onion on little wooden skewers. It won't take long, Faisal said. I'll be right back. It was two o'clock. Three more hours to wait, at least three. If they weren't there at 5 p.m., I tried not to think about it. When Faisal came back, he was smiling. I hadn't realized how tired and old he'd looked until I saw that smile. It's all right, he announced, settling into his chair. He wants us to meet him. Your father? He started out ordering me to turn myself in. But when I explained, told him you were with me, and that you'd confirm my story, he said he'd be willing to listen. Damn nice of him. Look, Faisal, I'm not sure... It's okay, I tell you. A friend of his is away on business. Father has the key to his apartment, which is not far from the train station. We can hole up there. Use his telephone to call Munich and your parents, and if you like, the embassy. That's much safer than the central telegraph office. You can have that shower, and maybe even a drink with ice in it. Where does he want us to meet him? I asked doubtfully. Esbekia Gardens. It's not far from his office. He didn't want us to go there, or to the house. The police have probably got both places staked out. He hinted as much. Have you finished? I sat in front with Faisal this time. He was in a very happy mood, relaxed and smiling. He kept pointing out sites, mosques and museums and parks. The traffic was horrendous, and parking seemed to be hit or miss. I wouldn't have considered the place where Faisal stopped, in between a barrow piled with cauliflowers, and a little old lady who had apparently set up housekeeping on the curb as a legitimate spot, but he waved my comments aside. God willing, we won't be coming back to the damned car anyhow. We've got a couple of blocks to walk. Okay. Vicky. What? Just in case. He hesitated. I'm sure it's all right, but stay a couple of hundred feet behind me. I'll talk to him. Get the key to the apartment. Wait till I wave or call to you before you join us. He didn't give me a chance to reply. He started walking. I followed, close enough to keep him in sight, but no closer. What he'd suggested was only a sensible precaution. His father might be under surveillance and unable to shake it. Crossing Cairo streets is a death-defying procedure. The street on the west side of Esbekia Gardens is a wide, very busy thoroughfare and I lost sight of Faisal for a few seconds while I tried to avoid being run down by taxis, buses, and trucks. Reaching the other side, breathless but intact, I caught sight of him standing by a little kiosk. The gardens were large. They must have arranged to meet at that precise spot. Hanging back, per instructions, I saw a tall, gray-haired man approach Faisal. He was wearing Western clothes, and even at that distance I noticed the resemblance. They stood talking for a while. Then the older man threw his arms around Faisal. Any father might embrace a returning prodigal son, and Middle Eastern males have no hang-ups about expressing affection physically. Not until I saw the crowds disperse, like hens when a fox enters the chicken yard, did I realize what was happening. Faisal saw the foxes, too. They were hard to miss. Four of them, carrying automatic weapons. He twisted away from the arms that tried to hold him and gave his father a shove that sent him staggering back. Run, he yelled. Run, Vicky. He wasn't trying to escape. He was just trying to warn me. He was standing perfectly still when they cut him down. 
I heard the rattle of weapons, and I heard him cry out and saw him fall. Another shriller cry echoed his. It came, I thought, from Faisal's father. People were screaming and running, and I ran with them, blindly. My throat ached with rage and horror and grief. What sort of man would turn in his own son? I hoped it had been the old man who had cried out. I hoped he was suffering. Maybe he hadn't expected they would fire without so much as a preliminary warning. But he ought to have known. He ought to have trusted his son, given him a chance to explain. I threw myself in front of a taxi, pried myself off the front fender, and wrenched the door open. The American Embassy, I gasped. Shoddy Latin America. I'm as patriotic as the next guy, but the sight of the flag had never affected me as it had that day. The farther you are from home, the better that star-spangled banner looks. I marched up to the door with my chin held high and demanded entry. It's nice to be famous. As soon as I mentioned my name, I was passed from flunky to flunky till I ended up in an office few tourists see. There was a flag there, too, and behind the big mahogany desk hung a picture of the president. I had voted for him, and I had always thought he had a nice, friendly smile. It had never looked friendlier. Dr. Bliss? Dr. Victoria Bliss? Thank God you have no idea how relieved I am to see you. The man who hurried to meet me didn't resemble my idea of an ambassador. He was too young and his hair wasn't gray. He sure was glad to see me, though. He invited me to call him Tom and took both my hands and shook them and went on to tell me exactly how relieved he was. The ambassadors in the States, which left me holding the bag, as you might say. A hostage situation is a diplomat's worst nightmare. Gee whiz, I'm really sorry to have upset you, I said. He flushed, and I gave myself a mental kick. I was getting to be as bad as John, making smart-ass remarks when I should be trying to gain his support and attention. It was imperative that I remain calm. If I lost my temper or broke down... He'd think I was just another hysterical female, and I'd never convince him in time that my wild, improbable story was true. I'm sorry, he said, with a smile so charming it must have been one of the qualifications for the job. Our primary concern, of course, was for your safety. Sit down. No, I insist. I won't ask you any more questions until you've had a chance to catch your breath. He went to the desk and started punching buttons. Joni, will you come in here, please? Joni's my assistant. She'll take care of you. But I want you to ask me questions. There's been a mistake. I was never... Joni must have been waiting for the summons. By that time, everybody had heard of my arrival, and they were all wild with curiosity. She was older than her boss. Being female, she would, of course, rise more slowly up the diplomatic ladder. You have to listen to me. Joni put her arms around me. Sure we will, honey. Don't worry about a thing. Come along with me. I'll bet you'd like to freshen up some. If she hadn't had gray hair and a lined motherly face, I might have resisted. There was shock on that pleasant face as well as sympathy. It gave me some idea of how awful I must look. I suddenly realized as well that I had to go to the bathroom. I know that's not romantic, but it's true. All right, I said. Five minutes. I'll be right back, Tom. Don't go away. Joni was very kind. She even offered me some of her makeup. And after I'd seen the wild face glaring back at me from the mirror, I accepted. I wouldn't have listened to anything that came out of a face like that. She only asked me one question. Did he hurt you, honey? He didn't. It was the wrong question. I thought of Faisal, making jokes and worrying about his mother and falling, falling and screaming, trying to warn me with what might have been his last breath. I turned on her like a madwoman. Hurt me? He was... It was the wrong tense, too. I threw her lipstick wildly at her. Damn it! Why am I standing here doing stupid things to my stupid face? Maybe he's not dead. Maybe he's just dying and being tortured and take it easy, honey. And don't call me honey. 
I thought I'd behaved quite rationally and reasonably until Joni escorted me to a small room that was obviously an infirmary or clinic. Another motherly, gray-haired woman, wearing a sweater over her white uniform, rose to greet us. So this is the young lady. Welcome home, my dear. We're all so relieved to see you. I felt as if I were being smothered in cotton candy. They closed in on me, one on each side, and Tom entered, barring my way to the door. How is she, Francis? he inquired, rubbing his hands and smiling. He thought the worst was over. He was in for a shock. I haven't had a chance to look at her. If you'll just sit down, Miss Bliss. I started to argue. Then, belatedly, I realized what I'd done. Defending Faisal had been a bad mistake. Hostages sometimes end up identifying with their captors. And when the captor is young and handsome and the hostage is female, I made a last desperate effort to control myself. But in retrospect, I admit I didn't succeed very well. What are you going to do? I demanded, backing away from the nurse. I won't have any shots. I hate shots. Just your blood pressure and pulse, the nurse said, as she would have spoken to a child. No nasty shots, I promise. All right. I let her push me into a chair and fix Tom with what I intended to be a firm, unhysterical look. It must have been more like a wild-eyed glare. You stand there and listen to me. Believe me, Dr. Bliss, there are a number of people who want nothing better than to listen to you. But, he added, with the first touch of kindly consideration he had displayed, I'm damned if I'm going to let them at you until I'm sure you're okay. I called your, uh, your friend. He's on his way. My friend? A wild hope dawned. Had Schmidt and John made it? If they had caught the 10 a.m. train. Yes, Tom smiled. He's been calling every hour on the hour. Normal, the nurse announced, unwinding the blood pressure cuff. She sounded disappointed. I told you so. Now, open wide. She propped my mouth open with a stick and peered in. I don't suppose it would have made any difference. The whole business only took a few minutes. But if I had had a chance to ask one question. I had forgotten that I wasn't the only important American in Egypt. I had forgotten it takes only 60 minutes to fly from Luxor to Cairo. They brought him directly to the clinic. Well, wouldn't you escort a distraught millionaire into the presence of the fiancé he has lost and just recovered? When I saw him, I jumped up, spilling the glass of water the nurse had offered and the little white pills she was trying to persuade me to take. There was no place to go. The room had only one door. When he caught me in his arms, I tried to fight free. Darling, it's all right, he exclaimed, holding me tight. Oh, Vicky, I've been so worried. Don't talk, sweetheart. Just let me hold you. Calm, reasoned behavior might have saved me. Though that is questionable. It was also impossible. I couldn't stand having him touch me. Instead of expensive aftershave and fresh linen, I smelled sweat and blood. Instead of his smooth, well-groomed face... I saw the gaping hole that had been Jean-Louis's face, and Faisal falling, and John slashed to bloody ribbons by the people this man had hired. I struggled and screamed and tried to bite. I can't blame them for thinking the emotional collapse they expected had finally occurred. It took two of them to hold my arm rigid so the needle could go in. The last thing I heard was Larry's voice. My poor darling. God bless you. All of you. I'll take care of her now. Chapter 14 Right back where I'd started. So I thought, when I woke up to find myself in a large room furnished with antiques. I felt quite calm and relaxed. 
That's one thing to be said for tranquilizers. They leave the recipient very tranquil. Deep down under the layers of fuzzy pharmaceutical comfort, a small section of my brain was trying frantically to get my attention. Think, it was screaming. Do something. Don't just lie there. Get me out of this. There had been time for him to take me back to Luxor. Night had fallen. The windows of the room were dark. But this wasn't one of the rooms in Larry's Luxor house. The furniture was old, but it wasn't as well cared for as Larry's antiques. The gilt was chipped, and the mattress of the bed on which I lay smelled slightly musty. Either Larry had a pied-a-terre in Cairo, or he was staying with a friend. He had so many of them. This wasn't a hotel room. There was no television set, no room service menu, and no telephone. And no bolt and chain on the inside of the door. The door was locked from the outside. Was I surprised? No. But I was sorry that frantic little voice had shaken me out of my comfortable stupor. The windows were not locked. They led onto a small balcony, and I stood there for a few minutes, letting the night breeze cool my face. A few lights showed through the branches of the trees that were, I was sorry to see, on the same level as the balcony, and too far from it to offer a means of egress. The ground was a long way down. There was no familiar landmark in sight, no towers, no high-rise hotels, not even a pyramid. The house must be in one of the suburbs. The adjoining bath had once been palatial. Now the tile was chipped and the marble discolored. The water ran rusty. After it had cleared a little, I splashed water on my face and hands. Then I went back and sat down. There weren't that many alternatives. By that time, the fuzz was gone, and I was in a state of abject, disgusting panic. The past hours hadn't been comfortable. I'd been scared most of the time, scared to death and out of my wits some of the time, but this was worse. Like having a chair pulled out from under you, just when you think you can finally sit down and relax. To do myself justice, it wasn't the thought of Mary's plans for me that made my mouth go dry and my hands shake. John and Schmidt could be tucked away in neighboring rooms, with Mary busy at work on one or both. Faisal could be dead. It wasn't courage that got me to my feet. It was desperation. I had to find out. The truth might be less painful than the things I was imagining. It couldn't be worse. I banged on the door. After a moment, I heard the sound of a key in the lock, and the door opened. He didn't point a gun at me. He didn't have to. The guard was Hans, my old acquaintance, the one with the face like a giant sheep and the physique of a giant, period. Hans even had muscles on his ears, and he was almost seven feet tall. The Egyptian sun had been hard on his fair complexion. His cheeks were red and peeling. Guten Abend, Fräulein Doktor, he said politely. Also, Sie sind aufgewacht. I will tell them. Ten interminable, dragging minutes passed before there was a response. My aching muscles relaxed when I saw Larry. I didn't like him a lot, but I definitely preferred his company to that of the lady. Ed followed him, carrying a tray. He didn't make a very convincing waiter. Shorthanded, I inquired, as Ed put the tray on the table and retreated to the door, where he stood with his arms folded, looking bored. This sort of thing was all in a day's work for him, I supposed. You've disrupted my plans rather badly, Larry admitted, but only temporarily. Would you care for something to drink? The bottle of mineral water hadn't been opened. The seal was intact. Larry watched with unconcealed amusement while I inspected it. You really haven't much of a choice, he pointed out pleasantly. You might go on a hunger strike but you can't do without water long in this climate. Courteous as ever, he forbore to add that there were other, less comfortable means of controlling me. So what are your plans? I inquired. Larry settled back in his chair and studied me with an approving smile. You're quite a remarkable woman, Vicky. Would it surprise you to learn that when I informed the embassy we were engaged to be married... I found the idea not entirely displeasing. 
Let's just be friends, I suggested. Larry laughed. Your heart belongs to another. Think about it, Vicky. It would be one way out of our present difficulty. Where is he? He didn't ask whom I meant. You don't know? We separated this morning. There was no harm in telling him that much. He must know Faisal and I had traveled together. It was a reasonable assumption that John and Schmidt would have done the same. I thought you might have. You had, of course, arranged a meeting place in Cairo. Never mind, we don't need that information. We've taken the necessary steps to inform him that you are my guest. He should be arriving any time. They hadn't caught him. My face must have registered relief. Larry shook his head. Don't get your hopes up, Vicky. There's a guard under your balcony, and every door is being watched. So it was to be an exchange, or an offer of one. They couldn't afford to let me go. John must know that. How did you get in touch with him? My dear, your lovely face has been on every television program in the country this evening. I gave out the press release myself. I'm sure he's seen it. He'll have been following the news closely. You're suffering from shock and physical and nervous exhaustion at the villa of the chairman of the Egypto-American Trading Company. He spends most of his time in the States, but he was happy to offer a refuge to you and your solicitous fiancé. And when I fell off the balcony or slashed my wrists, my solicitous fiancé would say I'd committed suicide in a fit of clinical depression. They'd add that to Faisal's account, too. What about Faisal? I had to force myself to ask. I dreaded the answer. Larry dismissed the minor question of a man's life with a wave of his hand. Forget about him. He's no longer a factor. Schmidt and Tregarth are the ones who concern me, and they ought to concern you as well. You're in no danger unless they refuse to cooperate. No, don't interrupt. Let me finish. Why should I want to harm you? Once I'm out of the country, there's no way you can prove anything. And without that pectoral, you haven't a leg to stand on. He took my appalled silence as a sign that his arguments were beginning to have their effect. Leaning forward, his eyes intent, he went on. You've gone to a great deal of trouble and endured a great deal of danger and distress to stop me. Admirable, no doubt, but very foolish. Why risk your life to prevent me from doing something so harmless? The antiquities I have acquired will be cared for and preserved more carefully than they would have been in their original locations. What I've done is an act of rescue, not desecration. I knew the arguments. They've been used by every looter, archaeologist, or thief from the beginning of time, and unfortunately they have some merit. There wouldn't be much left of the Elgin marbles if they'd stayed on the Parthenon. I don't buy those arguments, but I didn't feel like arguing with Larry. I'd seen eyes like his once before. In the face of a shabby, shy little man who had tried to smash a statue of Diana in our museum. The guards had got to him before he did much damage, and I had had a chance to talk to him later, when he was in police custody. He'd been very polite and soft-spoken when he explained that God had told him to destroy the heathen images. He couldn't understand why we couldn't see his point of view. The little man and Larry had opposite aims, but they had the same mindset, a kind of mental constipation, if you'll excuse the homely metaphor, a block of solid conviction through which no counter-argument can pass. Larry turned with a frown when the door opened. We'd been getting on so well, he felt sure I'd been about to agree with him. Her hair was tied back with a soft scarf that matched her pale blue dress. It was like a child's pinafore, with wide shoulder straps and big pockets in the gathered skirt. And she looked about sixteen. The Greek earrings shone bright against the masses of her dark hair. Has she got it? 
Mary's voice was crisp and not at all childish. We haven't discussed that, Larry said. I doubt it, though. Please go. You promised me. No, I didn't. Get out and leave this to me. She divided a malignant glance between the two of us and slipped out. That woman is getting to be a damned nuisance, Larry muttered. I think she's a little crazy. You know, Larry, you might have something there. Why did you fire her? You hired her. No, I didn't. My original arrangements were made with her brother, a very competent man. Competent, sane, leaf. I remembered the last sight I'd had of him. The knife with which he'd been slashing at me was still in his hand when John dragged him down under the icy water. Larry's frown smoothed out. Well, it won't be much longer. I'll certainly sever my connections with the organization after this. I hate to do it because they've done excellent work for me in the past. And at the start, she was quite efficient. Some of her ideas were brilliant, in fact. Like planting that message with the dead agent to get you on board as a means of making Tregarth behave himself. Oh, I said. He seemed to expect some response, but congratulating him on that brilliant idea was more than I could manage. Her organization handled that matter, and very well, too, Larry went on. She's been acting strangely the last few weeks, though, and one can't put up with that sort of thing. It's inefficient. Right, I said, swallowing. I need that pectoral, Vicky, Larry went on. Do you have it? What? Oh, in the fascination of following Larry's mind along its monster-haunted byways, I'd almost forgotten the Tutankhamun jewel. No, I don't have it. Didn't you search me? Larry looked uncomfortable. Only in the most respectful fashion. Mary wanted to. Of course, I wouldn't allow that. Thanks, I said, and I meant it. The idea of those soft little hands on me made my skin crawl. It's a very large object, Larry went on. I don't believe I could have missed it. Anyhow, I didn't suppose Tregarth would trust you with it. He has it, doesn't he? Unless he is a lot dumber than I think he is, he's stowed it away somewhere safe by now. So we decided. Well, Larry rose. He'll turn it over to us in exchange for you. So you see, Vicky, you haven't a thing to worry about. Is there anything I can do to make you more comfortable? His departure would certainly have that effect, but it wouldn't have been tactful to say so. I shook my head. Have a little rest, Larry said kindly. I'll let you know as soon as we hear from him. Mary wasn't the only one who'd gone around the bend in the last few weeks. Or had Larry always been this way? determinedly unconscious of the deadly results of his harmless schemes. Maybe they were all like that. The presidents and chairmen and commanding generals who sat in their fancy offices and gave orders to engage targets or cut the workforce. They never saw the suffering, bleeding bodies those orders affected. I didn't have a little rest or eat any of the food on the tray. It wasn't very appetizing dry sandwiches and a wilted salad that probably contained a whole colony of healthy typhoid germs. That suggested there were few or no servants in the house. Larry might not have his full crew with him. Some of them would have to stay with the boat. Mary and Hans were there, and that probably meant Max and Rudy were also with Larry. How many others? And what the hell difference did it make? I couldn't get out, and there was no way John could get to me without being caught. I went onto the balcony. Down below, far down, I saw a stone-paved terrace without so much as a shrub to break one's fall. Rudy was down there, too. At least the shape and the shadows, slim as a weasel, looked like his. To complete the picture of total disaster, the railing of the balcony swayed under the pressure of my hands. No point in trying the old bedsheet routine, even if Rudy hadn't been lurking. 
Those rails wouldn't support the weight of a healthy six-foot female. I was inspecting the bathroom, hoping to find a used razor blade or a nail file, when I heard the bedroom door open. He's on his way. He telephoned a few minutes ago. Her eyes glowed. Little flecks floated in them like the dead insects in amber. My heart couldn't sink any farther. It was already trying to shove through the sole of my shoe. So, Mary went on briskly, we must get ready to receive him, mustn't we? Sit down in that chair. Not the big carved armchair, that one. It was a straight chair, the seat and back covered with faded gold brocade. No thanks, I said, backing away. I'd rather stand. If you prefer it this way. She turned to the door. Hans, come in. Hans's face wasn't capable of displaying subtle emotion, but I got the impression that even he was beginning to wonder about little Mary. Aber gnädige Frau, Herr Max hat mir gesagt. From whom do you take your orders? I'm not going to hurt her, she added unconvincingly. At least it didn't convince me. Poor, bewildered Hans shrugged, setting off a miniature avalanche of muscles and advanced on me. Just for the look of the thing, I picked up a bowl from the table and heaved it. To my surprise, it hit him square on the chest. Not to my surprise, it didn't halt his advance. So I sat down in the chair and Hans took the cord Mary had foresightedly brought with her, and he tied my wrists and ankles. He worked with slow deliberation. The knots were painfully tight. Hans didn't get any jollies from hurting people. He just killed them. Larry isn't going to like this, I said. Larry knows I'm here. Mary assisted Hans out the door and closed it. My darling husband is an ingenious swine, and as I pointed out to Larry, it would be foolish to take unnecessary chances. Are you really married? Bell, book, and candle. Mary leaned against the table, hands in her pockets. Not for long, though, she went on conversationally. I'll regret that, in a way. I shall hate wearing black. It's not my color, and sharing his bed was quite an interesting experience. Oh, come off it, I said. You're wasting your time with that routine, Mary. He could hardly stand to touch you. It was always you hanging on to him instead of... I wouldn't have believed a soft little hand like that could hit so hard. When my ears had stopped ringing, I said... Did Larry authorize beating me up? He took my knife away. Mary's voice deepened, and the golden eyes glittered. But he can't object to this. A few bruises will have a persuasive effect on John. You've got him trained like one of Pavlov's dogs. I don't understand how you accomplished it. She examined me curiously, from head to foot and back again. I could see her problem. The idea that any normal man could resist a cuddly little cutie in favor of a six-foot Amazon with a sarcastic tongue and the disposition of a hedgehog absolutely baffled her. To be honest, it baffled me, too. Not that he could resist little Miss Mary the Ripper, but that he'd stuck with me so long. With an abrupt movement, she pulled the lovely little Greek heads from her ears and flung them at me. These were meant for you, you know. I made him give them to me. Did you enjoy seeing me wear them? I did wonder. They aren't your style. But they were clearly a love token, weren't they? Something distinctive and different, carefully chosen for a woman who would appreciate them. Her thumb caressed the gaudy diamond on her finger. I knew what she intended, and I was contemptibly relieved when she decided to try a little mental torture first. Wouldn't you like to know how your other friends are faring? I shrugged. You haven't got Schmidt, or you'd have said so. Faisal. I assume Faisal's dead. Oh, no, Mary said softly. He's still alive. He may never walk again, but that won't concern him after they hang him for treason. The tip of her little pink tongue showed between her parted lips. 
She was having such a good time, she didn't even hear the voices outside. There's a poem about a highwayman who came riding, riding up to the old inn door. The soldiers used his sweetheart as a decoy, tying her to a chair with a rifle pointed at her breast. She managed to get one finger around the trigger, and when she heard him coming, she pulled and warned him with her death. I always wondered why she didn't just yell. Oh, well. Maybe he couldn't have heard her over the pounding of his horse's hooves. Or maybe it didn't fit the meter. I didn't have a rifle at my breast. Anyhow, John knew the soldiers were there. I threw my head back and opened my mouth and screamed. But the name I called was not that of my lover. Max? Hey, Max! John was the first one through the door, but Max was right behind him. It wasn't until much later that I understood the significance of that sequence. The Pavlovian conditioning didn't seem to be as strong as Mary had believed. After a few steps, John stopped. He'd only glanced at me. His eyes were fixed on Mary. More melodrama, Max said in exasperation. How weary I am of this. You were forbidden to come here, Mary. Mr. Tregarth is willing to cooperate. You will only irritate him if you persist in this nonsense. I am already irritated, John said. His eyes returned to my face. Are you fine, just fine, I said, stretching my mouth into a smile. My cheek hurt. I do hope you have a couple of aces up your sleeve, because if you haven't, this was not one of your brighter moves. He was still wearing Keith's suit, but he'd washed the cheap dye out of his hair. Avoiding my eyes, he remarked to the room in general. She tends to babble when she's nervous. Mary does affect people that way. Get her out of here. Blankiron was the next to arrive. Damn it, he exclaimed. Mary, I told you. She laughed contemptuously. What a conveniently bad memory you have, Larry. Well, I certainly didn't give you permission to... He couldn't even say the ugly words. I'm sorry, Vicky. I told her to stay with you, but I never authorized. Swell, I said. So how about untying me? Nobody reacted to that naive suggestion. Mary backed off a few steps, and Max said, with poorly concealed exasperation, Can we now discuss the situation in a reasonable way? You have the pectoral, Mr. Tregarth. You know I haven't, John said. You watched Rudy search me. Where is it? None of your damned business. Now, Maxie, don't lose your temper. That pectoral is my ace in the hole. You don't suppose I'll meekly hand it over without getting something in return, do you? Need I ask what? Surely not. And please don't insult my intelligence by suggesting you'll turn her loose after I deliver the goods. I want her out of here and safely back at the embassy. As soon as she telephones to say she's there, and the ambassador confirms it, I'll get the pectoral for you. We could force you to tell us, Max said. You could certainly try, John said agreeably. Leaning against a chest of drawers, hands in his pockets, he was putting on a pretty good imitation of languid self-confidence. But the tension that vibrated along every nerve was evident to me, at least. He was trying very hard not to look at me. But it's not the most efficient method of attaining your ends, he went on. You know me well, Maxie. Do you suppose I give a damn about the museum, or the tomb, or any bloody antiquity on the face of the earth? I'll even go through with the robbery, if that's what you want. You will? Blankiron said eagerly. But you said... John raised an eyebrow. I didn't object to robbing the museum. The thing that put me off a bit was a strong suspicion that I wouldn't survive the attempt. I'm willing to take my chances with the ordinary security system, but I object to being shot or stabbed in the back by one of my purported assistants. Max looked a little embarrassed. I was against that, he said. 
I felt sure you would expect something of the sort. And there really was no need. John cut him off. He was looking at Max, but I knew he was aware of every move Mary made and every breath she took. She was the most unstable and unpredictable factor in the structure of mutual self-interest he was building with such agonizing deliberation. I was afraid to move or speak for fear of shaking it, and I knew why he wouldn't look at me. There was no need, John agreed. You're a businessman, Max, and Mr. Blenkiron's sole concern is making off with his pretty toys. My sole interest is my survival and Vicky's. My proposal will accomplish all those admirable aims, but you'll have to make up your minds without delay. Herr Schmidt has an appointment with the director of the museum in... He glanced at the cheap watch that had replaced his. In an hour and a quarter. If he hasn't heard from me before he leaves his present location, he will take the pectoral with him. And then, if you'll excuse a cliché, the die will be cast. There's barely time for Vicky to reach the embassy, providing she leaves within the next five minutes. Max's eyes narrowed. We must discuss this. It requires consultation. It's your own fault, John said. You oughtn't to have selected such a remote hideout. Cairo traffic is difficult at any time of day or night. Maybe there was something to that business about auras. I could almost see the taut lines of tension crisscrossing the empty air like a cat's cradle of colored yarn. The strain of manipulating them was beginning to tell on John. His nonchalant pose hadn't changed, but his face was beaded with perspiration. It sounds reasonable to me, Blank Iron said slowly. So long as we have Tregarth, the others won't risk. You fools, Barry said suddenly. Can't you see what he's doing? She'd been standing quietly, hands folded and head bowed. It was her old pose of sweet submissiveness, and the men, bless their chauvinist hearts, had dismissed her from consideration. But I'd been afraid of this, and so had John. He straightened, taking his hands out of his pockets. But before he could speak, Blank Iron said angrily, Be still. You've already caused enough trouble. You sentimental idiot! She took a step forward. Her hands were empty, clasped and twisting. Too fine-minded to hurt a woman, is that it? And you, Max, you're getting soft, too. I'm afraid I won't be able to give you a favorable efficiency report on this job. Are you really stupid enough to let him hypnotize you into giving up the one thing that will force him to cooperate? I'll show you how to get what you want. Hold on to him, Max. She didn't wait to see him comply with her order. It would never have occurred to her that he might not. Who needs a knife when she's got diamonds? They're harder than steel. She had twisted the ring around, and when her hand struck my face, the stone opened up a long, stinging cut. When I opened my eyes, John had her by the throat. I could see her mouth gaping in a struggle for air, her cheeks darkening. Max hadn't moved. John could have snapped her neck with one twist of those long, skilled hands. When he released his hold, she crumpled bonelessly to the floor but she was still alive. I heard the rattle of painfully drawn breath. John's hands fell to his sides. I couldn't see his face. His back was to me. Max sighed. You surprise me, Mr. Tregarth. Mr. Blankiron, I think perhaps you had better run along. Larry's features were drawn with disgust and horror. Yes, Yes, perhaps I had, he mumbled. The boat will be in shortly. I'll just go down to the dock and... You'll make the... the arrangements, Max. Don't concern yourself, Mr. Blink Iron. I'll handle everything. You're a very competent man, Max. I leave everything in your hands. Vicky, I, uh... You'll be fine. I hope we meet again under more, uh... 
pleasant circumstances. The door closed. John turned. His color was bad, and perspiration trickled down his cheeks, but his voice was cool and ironic. A pity we didn't have a basin of water to offer him. Don't do anything you might regret, Max. It's over, you know. He stepped back, closer to me, as Max came toward him. I know, Max said calmly. Stooping, he lifted the unconscious woman and carried her toward the bed. Instead of putting her down, he went on, out onto the balcony. When he came back, his arms were empty. It was done with such quiet, unhesitating efficiency, I didn't understand what had happened until John moved violently and jerkily and then jolted to a stop. That's settled, Max said. I had hoped you would take care of it for me, but evidently I overestimated you. It doesn't matter. The onus won't rest on me. If you two will wait here for... Oh, an hour should be long enough. You can proceed on your way. Whitbread has gone with Blank Iron, and Rudy and Hans will accompany me, so you need not worry about being disturbed. John cleared his throat. You mean you... I am a professional, Mr. Tregarth, and I don't underestimate your intelligence. When I learned that you and Herr Schmidt had reached Cairo unscathed, I knew we had lost. He would, of course, go straight to the authorities. His reputation is such that they would be forced to listen to him, and however reluctantly act on his accusations. They would be hammering at the door by this time if they weren't hoping you could get Dr. Bliss out safely. He waited for confirmation. John nodded dumbly. So, Max went on, I requested Mr. Blinkiron to settle our outstanding account and made plain reservations. He has not my experience. I fear the unfortunate man doesn't realize that there will be a reception party waiting for that boat to dock. He glanced at his watch. I really must be off. Oh, do forgive me, Dr. Bliss. No doubt Mr. Tregarth would find it easier to release you if I returned his pocket knife. John had recovered enough to catch the knife, though his movements lacked their usual smoothness. Thank you. I trust there won't be any onus directed at me either. Only insofar as my employers are concerned. John started to protest, and Max went on smoothly. You must realize that I can't accept the responsibility without incurring a reprimand, at the very least. I take pride in my record, and don't want to see it blemished. You are at liberty to tell the police whatever you choose. You needn't worry about retribution. From a financial viewpoint, this affair has been a success for us, and we haven't time to waste on personal grudges. They won't bother you if you stay out of our way. That, I assure you, is my greatest ambition, John said. He'd cut the ropes around my ankles. Now he moved behind me and freed my arms. I just sat there. Joining in that conversation would have strained even my gift of repartee. And mine, Max said. I don't like you, Mr. Tregarth. I hope never to see you again. Goodbye. Goodbye, Dr. Bliss. Goodbye, Max, I said. I can't bring myself to thank you, but you owe me nothing. He hesitated briefly, and then an odd little smile stretched his thin mouth. I wish you good luck. If you gain what you clearly desire, you will need it. I sort of hoped that maybe, once we were alone, my hero, the man who had risked all to save me, 
would sweep me into his arms and hold me close, murmuring broken endearments the way they do in romantic novels. John just stood there, staring blank-faced at the closed door. So I got up all by myself. My legs seemed to be working all right, and I thought I was in full possession of my senses until I realized I was heading blindly for the balcony. John caught my arm. No, Vicky. She could be... No. He touched my cheek. I'd forgotten about the cut until his fingertip traced a line from my cheekbone to my jaw. I don't know who moved first. His arms went around me with bruising strength, but he was shaking from head to foot, and he didn't resist when I guided his head onto my shoulder. That's more like it, I murmured. John, don't. You couldn't have stopped him. He tried every trick in the book to get you to do it for him. You almost succeeded. God, it was so close. Too close. Kiss me? What? Oh, right. Better now? I asked after a while. My voice wasn't very steady. Neither was his. Yes, thank you. I'm experiencing temporary relief. Suppose we postpone further treatment. I can't stand this ghastly place much longer. Is it safe to leave? Well, I should think so. Max is a man of his word, when it suits him to keep it. Are we going to keep ours? To give him an hour? I didn't give him my word. However, annoying Max would not be a sensible move on my part. I shan't turn him in but there's no reason why we have to wait out the time here. Okay, wait just a minute. The earrings were hard to see against the complex pattern of the rug. I finally found both of them. One of the wires was broken. It can be repaired, said John, over my shoulder. Though I shouldn't think you'd want them now. Are you kidding? They're the most beautiful things I've ever seen. How did you know I meant them for you? She told me. That just made me want them more. Vindictive little creature, aren't you? Vindictive, yes. Little, no. The light ran softly along the tiny golden faces. I closed my fingers carefully around them. Over twenty centuries, they've probably been in worse hands. And ears. The house was uncannily quiet, and as eerie as a mausoleum. Dust covers shrouded most of the furniture, and our footsteps echoed in the silence. It was hard for me to believe the place was really deserted. I kept expecting someone to jump out at us from the shadows huddling in those vast, high-ceilinged rooms. When we reached the door without meeting anyone, John let out his breath. There are television crews and newspaper reporters all around the house, he said. I'd offer to carry you out in a fainting condition but appealing to the tender mercies of the press might not be as effective as making a run for it. We'll run, I said. I won't even ask where. That's an encouraging sign. Stay close. He put his arm around me and opened the door. The limo was big and black and long. As we raced toward it, hotly pursued by assorted newspapers, the door opened. John tripped a reporter and pushed me into a pair of waiting arms. Hi, Schmidt, I said. I had a feeling you'd be here. When I woke next morning, it wasn't morning, but afternoon. I was lying on my side, facing the window, with my back to John. I could tell by his breathing he was still asleep, so I lay still, enjoying, enjoying the fact that I could hear him breathing, and that I was doing the same. The scenery wasn't bad, though. Few hotels in the world can boast such a view. The Great Pyramid of Giza, golden in the late sunlight, seeming so close it might have been right outside the bedroom window. 
trust Schmidt to come up with the fanciest suite in one of the most elegant hotels in the country, on short notice, and during the height of the tourist season. We hadn't arrived at Mena House until 4 a.m. Our first stop, at John's insistence, had been at the hospital. The legal process, which would clear Faisal, might take some time, and the least we owed him and his family was to tell them at the earliest possible moment that it was underway. It required a call to the minister to get us past the guards who were still on duty, and when I saw Faisal's father, I felt so sorry for him I couldn't hold on to my anger. His mother was there, too. They were sitting side by side on a hard bench in the corridor, and her arm was around his bowed shoulders. They both broke down when Schmidt told them the good news, and everybody except John the imperturbable started crying and hugging one another indiscriminately. Faisal was under deep sedation, but when I kissed his cheek and whispered in his ear, I think he heard me. It had been John's suggestion that I be allowed to see Faisal. If anything can rouse him, it will be a woman. When I suggested that so long as we were there, he might let a doctor have a look at him, he glowered and made a pointed remark about other kinds of therapy. But with Schmidt's assistance, I managed to bully him into giving in. There would be time for another kind of therapy later, and I wanted to make sure he was in fit condition for it. After that, we had to talk with a lot of people who wanted answers to questions we hadn't figured out how to answer yet, and I had to droop and pretend to feel poorly so they'd let us go. And later, he was out cold the moment his head hit the pillow. That's what you get for being thoughtful. I changed position, trying to make as little noise as possible. His head was turned away. I could see only one side of his face and the curve of his cheek. I'd always admired those cheekbones, but this one was too tightly shaped, and although his mouth was relaxed and his breathing even, a chill of superstitious terror ran through me when I saw how drawn his face was, even in sleep. The one visible eye opened. It held an expression of mild interest. Oh, you're awake, I said brightly. I am now. You were breathing on me. Sorry. Are you? I'm not. He turned over and gathered me in. The doctor said the subject was not mentioned. I carefully refrained from bringing it up. His lips moved from my temple to my ear and were heading south when I said, I don't think this is such a good idea. You look awful, and you're too thin, and... His lips touched mine, and I threw caution to the winds and kissed him back so hard he let out a grunt. I knew you didn't mean it, he said complacently. The men of my family are notoriously irresistible to women. Well, not my father. By all accounts, particularly those of my mother, he was a dull stick in every way. But Grandad was quite a lad in his time. And my great-grandfather has become something of a... I don't want to hear about your great-grandfather. I love you. Did I mention that? I wouldn't object to hearing it again. But he held me off, and he was no longer smiling. It took long enough to wring it out of you. What were you afraid of? There were too many answers to that question. Some obvious, some not. He had to know most of them. I tried to pass it off. You know me, independent, bullheaded, and afflicted with bad dreams. Oh, God, did I... I had. It was coming back to me. I'm sorry. That's all right. You stopped crying and babbling when I got hold of you. Was it the old nightmare? Yes. Uh, no, not that one. I thought not. You went on like Lady Macbeth. Blood and roses. I remembered now. So that was why I hadn't waked completely. How embarrassing. My subconscious isn't awfully original. His mouth relaxed. I am willing to overlook a few minor flaws in a woman who is so talented in other areas. 
Are you sure you feel up to... Damn it, don't laugh. That wasn't intentional. I should hope so. Trite and vulgar. I was only conscious of the movements of his hands and lips until he started violently and lifted his head. Oh, Christ, isn't that... It could only be. Schmidt was humming like a drunken bumblebee. I didn't recognize the tune. Nobody could have recognized the tune. It's all right, I murmured tenderly. I locked the door. I can't. He sounded like a nervous virgin. Not with Schmidt out there. I haven't fully recovered from the time he broke the door down just when I... He was laboring under a slight misapprehension. I drew his head back to my breast. He won't break this door down. He's very romantic. Then he'll be listening at the keyhole, John mumbled. I've become very fond of the little imp, but I draw the line at providing him with vicarious entertainment. Try to rise above it, I suggested. That was deliberate. Well, perhaps with a little of the proper sort of encouragement. How's this? A step in the right direction, certainly. Do go on. More precious than jewels, more precious than gold, I murmured. John, if you don't stop laughing, Schmidt'll think we're telling jokes and want to come in. I figured we could count on half an hour. It didn't seem that long, but it was actually forty minutes later when Schmidt raised his voice to a level that could not be ignored, even by me. Trust Schmidt to select an appropriate air with which to serenade us. This one was about a cold-blooded hoodlum named Pretty Boy Floyd. Folk music, like Schmidt, glamorizes outlaws. According to the lyrics of the ballad, Pretty Boy was a misunderstood martyr who'd given Christmas dinners to families on relief. I'll head him off, I said, removing myself from John and the bed. In that order. Stay there and rest. I don't need to rest. I was just getting warmed up. Are you going to put on some clothes, or have you decided to reward Schmidt for refraining from kicking the door in? I don't have any clothes, I said, bitterly except that filthy, wrinkled, disgusting outfit I've worn day and night for too long. I will not put it on. I'm going to burn it first chance I get and dance around the bonfire. Widdershins, John suggested. Have a sheet, then. You don't want to get the old chap too worked up. He watched interestedly as I wrapped the sheet around me and tried to figure out how to keep it there. I'm afraid you haven't got the hang of it. Why don't you come over here and let me show you? Some other time. Excellent suggestion. Schmidt had enjoyed himself with the room service. I've never seen such a spread. Everything from pastries to salads and from coffee to champagne. And, of course, beer. I did not know whether you would like breakfast or Mittag essen, he explained, pulling out a chair. So I ordered both. How is Sir John? How do you feel? Did you have a pleasant time making... Yes, thank you. You look very glamorous. I pushed my tangled hair back from my face. I look very terrible. I don't even have a comb. I need clothes, makeup, a toothbrush. There is much to do, Schmidt said, around a mouthful of pâté. We must organize ourselves. What's happened since last night? I will wait to tell you until Sir John joins us. Perhaps I should go and... No! I shoved Schmidt back into his chair. He'll be out in a minute. Knowing Schmidt, he was. He was more kempt than I, though he was wearing the same grubby clothes. After submitting with only a faint grimace to Schmidt's embrace, he joined us at the table. Eat, eat! Schmidt crooned, and I will tell you the news. The Queen of the Nile had docked at midnight. After the briefest of inspections, the authorities had ordered the hold sealed, arrested the entire crew, including my shipmates, sweet and bright, and carried a protesting Larry away.
Not to prison, though, Schmidt said. It is a great embarrassment to all concerned. Not only is he an American citizen, but he is a powerful man with many friends. I do not know what will be done with him. Nothing, said John cynically. At worst, he'll end up in an expensive nursing home till he recovers from his fit of temporary insanity. The fact that it went on for ten years will be tactfully ignored. What about the others? That is what we must discuss. Schmidt's round face was unusually serious. For you, my friend, are one of the others. And even the dangers you have incurred in order to redeem your initial um, error will not save you if the truth comes out. Faisal, too, must be cleared of blame. We are three intelligent people. I feel certain we can invent a scenario that will achieve those ends. If the situation hadn't been so serious, I would have enjoyed listening to those two concoct a plot. The greatest collaborators of fiction couldn't have done better. Schmidt's inventive imagination had been developed by years of reading sensational fiction, and John had always been the world's champion liar. Getting Faisal off the hook was the easiest part. He hadn't been involved with the restoration of the tomb, and he could reasonably claim he had suspected nothing until after Jean-Louis's death. His activities thereafter warranted a medal, not a prison sentence. If all four of us told the same story and stuck to it, it would be hard to prove we were lying. What about Larry? I asked. It will be his word against ours, Schmidt began. John shook his head. Forget about Blenkiron. His wisest course is to say nothing and admit nothing. There will be a behind-the-scenes deal made in order to avoid embarrassment all round. Egypt will get its treasures back and will accept with proper appreciation the gift of the Institute for Archaeological Research, and the blame will be placed on the shoulders of Maxie's crowd. And on mine. No, no, Schmidt said energetically. I have it all worked out. You will see. Max and the boys had made their getaway. Three men of their descriptions had boarded a plane to Zurich shortly before midnight and were now believed to be somewhere in Europe. A rather large territory. They will not be caught this time, Schmidt said, which is all to the good. They will say nothing about you, John, and Blank Iron cannot accuse you without admitting things he will not wish to admit. So far as anyone else knows, you and Vicky met for the first time on the cruise. Neither of you had any reason to doubt Herr Blank Iron's intentions until I expressed to you my suspicions. Oh, so you're going to take the credit for discovering the plot, are you? I inquired. But I did discover it, said Schmidt. Oh, yeah? I caught John's eye and smiled self-consciously. I never did get around to asking you how much you knew, Schmidt. I assumed... You assumed I was a stupid old man, said Schmidt, calmly. And you did not ask because you were crazy with fear for the man you... I think that point has been made, Schmidt. I said. So tell me now, okay? It was ratiocination of the most brilliant, Schmidt explained, twirling his mustache. Though I will confess that the truth did not dawn until John told me that Herr Blankiron was a criminal and that I must leave the house. Mind you, he told me no more than that. It was while I was eating my lunch at the hotel that I put the pieces together. The crime I deduced must be theft. For what other reason would Herr Blank Iron have in his employment a person like, uh, like Herr Max? And what is it that a rich man could not buy that he must steal it? The death of Monsieur Mazarin was the ultimate clue. He was killed. Not by the explosion, but by a bullet. 
a coincidence that the only one to die was the man who had directed the reconstruction of the tomb? I did not think so. And when I remembered the way in which the reconstruction was carried out, and the sudden ending to the tour, and all the other suspicious circumstances, voila, Urika. So you see, it spells Fröhliche Weihnachten. We are heroes, and everyone will live happily ever after. Exhausted by this creative effort, he paused to eat a croissant. Very well done, Schmidt, John said. But you've overlooked one little detail. Vicky has already dutifully informed her mysterious superiors, and thereby, I feel certain, Interpol and every police department in Europe, that I am the dashing Robin Hood of crime they have sought so long in vain. Schmidt choked, emitting a fine spray of crumbs. Vicky, did you do that? How could you? John gave me a kindly smile. I don't hold it against you, darling. You will wait for me, won't you? Seven to ten years should do it, unless they make the sentences consecutive, in which case you may have to hire a wheelchair when you meet me at the prison gates. No, I'll hire Max and Hans to break you out. I've always wanted to be a mall. A what? Schmidt demanded. Gun mall. I said abstractedly, like Bonnie and Clyde. It is not amusing, Schmidt grumbled. How can you choke about such a disaster, such a tragedy? Shut up, Schmidt. Just let me think. I told... That's right, I told Sweet and Bright. They knew anyway. They're part of the gang. Nobody's going to believe. And Larry Blankiron. And John had stiffened. That's all. Oh, damn, the tapes. They've got the tapes. But you didn't say anything. They don't have the tapes. Faisal picked them up and handed them over to Larry. I was there when he destroyed them. You're sure you didn't mention me to anyone else? I didn't tell Alice. She was the only person who identified herself to me. I don't know to this day who the other agent on board was, if there was one. Am I a great spy or what? I can't believe this, John muttered. It's too easy. There must be something we've overlooked. Very good, Schmidt said. He gave me a forgiving smile. I should have known that in the struggle between love and duty, your heart would triumph over your... Shut up, Schmidt, I said. So then, how does it stand? Schmidt bit into a pastry and chewed, ruminating. I see only one remaining difficulty. Are you prepared, John, to play the grieving husband? For if her part in this comes out, it will be the knot that unravels the tangled skein of the truth. Very literary, Schmidt, I said. I don't know what the hell it means, but it sounds good. It is obvious what it means, Schmidt said indignantly. The forced marriage, his knowledge of the plot his earlier connection with her brothers, all these things will become known, together with your acquaintance with John, and your reputation, my dear Vicky, will be in ruins. Do you think I care about my reputation? I care, John said shortly. Honestly, Vicky, I'm beginning to worry about you. Anyhow, Schmidt's right. The whole implausible story hangs on her innocence. Unless. How about claiming I was unaware of her criminal connections when I married her? They aren't exactly public knowledge. But how could you have remained unaware of them? Schmidt didn't like this version. He saw where it was leading, and he wanted the credit for unearthing the plot. John grinned at him. That's the point, isn't it? I'll leave the medals to you, Schmidt. I don't doubt that Max and his employers will appreciate our keeping her name out of it. That's another consideration. So when I marched in there last night, I was hoping to rescue her as well as Vicky.
Yes, yes, that is it, Schmidt said eagerly. The villains foully murdered her. Both of you saw it. No, John said. She was dead when I arrived. Vicky saw nothing. That is easier, yes, Schmidt agreed. The less one admits to knowing, the fewer lies there are to remember. Do you find any other holes in the plan? Not at the moment, I said. I couldn't believe it either. Good. Then we will go shopping. Schmidt scraped crumbs off his mustache and bounced up. You cannot come, Vicky. Not wrapped in a bedsheet. So I will select for you a suitable wardrobe. Oh, God. See here, Schmidt. I'll go along, John said, and try to control Schmidt. I believe I can claim to have a reasonably good idea of your size. He was smiling as if he didn't have a care in the world. But he hadn't eaten much, and he had never spoken her name. Chapter 15 The following days are something of a blur. We spent most of the time trying to elude the press, and the rest of it talking with various officials. Occasionally I'd catch a glimpse of a mosque or a souk, and once I actually saw the gates of the Cairo Museum as the limo passed it. While John and Schmidt were shopping, I called Mother and Dad and told them the reports of my nervous breakdown had been greatly exaggerated, but not as exaggerated as the story of my abduction and the news of my engagement. Despite her all-around relief, Mom was a little disappointed to find out that I wasn't engaged to marry a millionaire. She was tactful enough not to say so, however. I managed to talk Dad out of flying to Cairo, my call had caught him just as he was about to leave for the airport. It was a nerve-wracking interlude, and not just because I kept wanting to punch out the ghouls who followed us with cameras and microphones shouting questions. The worst were the questions that focused on John's supposed bereavement. They would have been cruel and contemptible if he'd really cared about her. Under the circumstances, they verged on emotional assault and battery, and I don't know how he kept his temper. Mine came close to cracking more than once. Even more nerve-wracking were the interrogation sessions. Everybody from the CIA to Interpol to the SSI to the Salvation Army seemed intent on questioning us. It was tantamount to walking, not a tightrope, but a spider web strung over a pond full of piranhas. My head ached trying to keep track of the lies we'd invented. One encounter stands out in my mind. Following Schmidt's advice, I had refused to be questioned, except at the embassy and in his company. John was there that day, too. Everyone understood why we stuck together. Or at least, they thought they understood. Clichés, good old clichés, we had suffered together and survived together. And so on, ad nauseum. I'd been expecting this particular meeting and had braced myself for it. So when Burkhardt rose to greet me, I didn't slug him or spit in his face or even throw anything at him. You son of a bitch, I said, slapping his outstretched hand aside. How you have the gall to face me after screwing up the way you did? John and Schmidt descended on me, murmuring soothing comments and forced me into a chair. No, I will not be quiet, I shouted. 
I'm just getting started. God damn you, Burkhardt, if that's your name, which I doubt. You and your security measures and your smug superiority and your total indifference to ordinary human decency almost got me killed. And furthermore... I hadn't planned it that way, but my explosion turned out to be the smartest move I could have made. By the time I finished telling him what I thought of him, he was too nervous to think straight. We know now, he said, when I gave him a chance to talk, that the individual referred to in the message was the man you had encountered in Sweden. Max, I snapped. That was the name I knew him by, and no, I didn't recognize him. He kept out of my way, and he didn't look at all the way I remembered him. The others, Hans and Rudy, weren't on the boat. Burkhardt fumbled through his notes. Dakin and Gurk. Who? Speak up, Burkhardt. I'm bloody sick and tired of stupid questions. Uh, you knew them as sweet and bright. Oh, right. I'd never seen them before. I thought they were two of your people. I added, in case he'd missed the point, you and your goddamn obsession with security. It's no wonder the poor, effed-up world is in the state it's in. With people like you behind the scenes manipulating policy? Now, Vicky, Schmidt began. Shut up, Schmidt. And you too, Burkhart. I've answered the same questions 50 times, and I'm not going to answer any more. And you can tell Carl Fader that when I get my hands on him... Yes, yes. Burkhardt said quickly. Would you like uh, perhaps a glass of water? I am not hysterical, I shouted. I am, I am leaving. Yes, leaving now. I think no more questions, said Tom, the diplomat, trying to sound firm and professional. I rounded on him. Yes, and what about you? You're supposed to be looking out for my rights. I am, I am, Tom said quickly. Here, uh, Burkhart, I don't believe it would be a good idea to continue. Not at the present time. Not at any time, I informed him. I was beginning to enjoy myself. I am leaving. But before I do, I want to ask Burkhart a question for a change. Just out of idle curiosity. Who was the incompetent jerk who was supposed to be protecting me? It was not her fault, Burkhart muttered. She obeyed orders. She was told not to. She? Would you like to speak with her? She asked for a chance to express her congratulations and apologies, personally. But I did not think that advisable. You wouldn't. I wanted to get the hell out of there, but curiosity got the better of me. Where is she? In the next room, of course. That's where these people live. In the next room, peeking through keyholes and eavesdropping on private conversations. I didn't recognize her at first. I didn't recognize her the second time I looked either. Close-cropped sandy hair, a tailored suit. Not until she flashed that wide, toothy grin did enlightenment dawn. Susie? She didn't come any closer. I wanted to express my regrets personally, Dr. Bliss. I failed you, and I feel very bad about that. None of us had the slightest suspicion of Mr. Blankiron. I assumed that when you were with him, you were okay. Her voice was quicker and harder than Susie's, with a flat Midwestern twang instead of a Southern drawl. Criminy. Surprise had numbed my brain. Then I remembered something. You were at the hotel that night with Perry. She nodded, no longer smiling. Trying to find you and Herr Schmidt. Poggington Smythe knew nothing about my real purpose. I took him along as camouflage. You saw me? I saw you. Since I didn't know whose side you were on, I ran. All the way down the goddamn Nile. Renewed rage choked me. That awful trip. Scared out of my mind. Worried about thirst and exhaustion. Fever. Faisal lying in that damned hospital with his legs full of bullet holes? Get out of my way. I'm going to kill him. Burkhart retreated behind the desk, and John caught me by the arm. You'll excuse us, gentlemen and madam. She's been through a lot lately. He and Schmidt towed me out. Susie moved quickly to open the door for us. Her back was to Burkhart, and when she caught my eye, she rolled hers and made an expressive face. 
Then, then her eyes moved, slowly and deliberately, from me to John. He had drawn my arm through his, and his hand covered mine. He shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have let him do it, but things like that happened occasionally. It was so hard to be on guard every moment. Involuntarily, I started to pull my hand away. His fingers tightened, holding mine fast, warning me not to react. But she'd observed both movements, and she tilted her head and widened her eyes, and there was Susie again. And I knew as clearly as if she'd spoken aloud that she was remembering a conversation between me and Larry the day at Saqqara. He's not so young, I had said, without thinking, and Larry had asked if I had known him before. She looked me straight in the eye and smiled. Goodbye, Dr. Bliss. Goodbye, Mr. Tregarth. Good luck to both of you. Funny how everybody kept wishing me luck. I began to believe we might get away with it after all. In fact, there were rumors about ceremonies of honor and assorted medals. Faisal was going to be the new director of the Institute, and I didn't doubt for a moment that he'd be standing on his own two feet when he assumed the position. He was recuperating much faster than the doctors had expected. When I leaned over to kiss him goodbye the last time we visited him, he pulled me down onto the bed and into his arms, and John had to detach me by force. You'll come back, won't you? Faisal asked. And let me show you Egypt without distractions. I hope so, I said. And to my surprise, I found I meant it. All in all, things were looking up. I wasn't even dreaming. But John was. He always quieted as soon as I touched him. But the night before we were to leave, I forced myself to wait and watch while he thrashed around and groaned, and finally a few words became audible. He might have said more, but I couldn't stand it any longer, and when I took hold of him, he woke. He lay quiet in my arms until his breathing was back to normal. Then he said, There is one misapprehension you may harbor that I would like to correct. I am not one of those sensitive, over-educated aristocrats who writhe around in a frenzy of guilt because they've been responsible for bringing a sociopath to his or her well-deserved end. I suspect they occur only in fiction, I said, trying to match his precise, detached tone. Oh, quite. There's no one so bloody-minded and selfish as your over-educated aristocrat. No doubt you've noticed that. John, I'm sorry I woke you. It won't happen again. Before long, he drifted off to sleep. I didn't. We said goodbye at the airport next morning. Schmidt and I were leaving first. John's plane took off an hour later. He was wearing a sling, for the effect, he claimed. But that unimportant, overlooked bullet hole wasn't healing the way it should— and I thought that morning he had a touch of fever. I told myself not to worry. Jen would nag him till he saw a doctor. The sling matched the black armband on his left sleeve. The suit hung a little loosely, but it was beautifully tailored, and he was the picture of an English gent manfully suppressing personal sorrow. For the benefit of the photographers, he bowed over my hand and allowed Schmidt to slap him on the back. Three friends brought together by chance and bonded in tragedy. I read some of the newspaper stories later. They were very mushy, especially the tabloid versions. I had sworn I wouldn't look back, but of course I did. He raised his hand and smiled, and then turned away. Do not weep, mein Kind, Schmidt said. You will see him soon again. I'm not weeping. I wasn't. Two tears do not constitute weeping. I knew there was a chance I wouldn't see him again. A couple of weeks later, 
Schmidt and I were walking along the Isar. In the rain. It was Schmidt's idea. He thinks walking in the rain is romantic. I didn't share his opinion, and I remembered those bright, hot days in Egypt with a nostalgia I had never expected to feel. The river was gray as steel under a steely sky. Fallen leaves formed soggy masses that squelched under our feet. My hair hung in lank, dank locks that dripped onto my nose and down my neck. I had meant to have it cut. Why hadn't I? I knew why. This was a stupid idea, I grumbled. I'm cold and wet and I want to go back to work. You have not done five minutes' work in the past week, Schmidt said. You sit in your office, all alone in the tower, staring at your papers and accomplishing nothing. You are the stupid one. Why don't you telephone him? He is in the book. Schmidt, you devil. My foot slipped and I had to grab at Schmidt to keep from falling. He grinned and grabbed back. You didn't call him, did you? No. What do you take me for? An interfering, nosy... I called the information in England to get the number, Schmidt said calmly. It would be only courteous of you to inquire after his health. He's all right. I kicked at a wad of sodden leaves. You know that. Jen called you, too. Oh, yes, very touching, Schmidt said with a sniff. The dear old Mutti thanking us for our kindness to her little boy. Herr Gott, when she began to talk about his tragic loss and the virtues of that terrible young woman, I was hard-pressed to hold my tongue. It hadn't been pleasant. Jen hadn't been awfully pleasant either. She'd said all the right things, but I had had a feeling she wasn't too happy about some of the newspaper stories. None of the reporters had had the bad taste to come right out with their prurient suspicions, but there had been references to my youthful blonde beauty. Every female in stories like those is beautiful, and John's tender concern. He had told me once his mother wouldn't like me. He must be getting very tired of being fussed over, said Schmidt. He'll put up with it only as long as he chooses. Schmidt, can we go back now? I sneezed. No, we have not yet said what must be said. But I do not want that you should catch cold. We will go to a cafe and have coffee. Mit Schlag, Schmidt added happily. He had whipped cream on his coffee and on his double serving of chocolate tort, and by the time he finished, on his mustache. It was a warm, cozy little cafe, with low ceilings and windows covered with steam that blurred the gloomy weather outside. Schmidt wiped his mustache and leaned forward, elbows on the table. Now, Vicky, what is wrong? It is good to talk when one is in distress, and who better to listen than Papa Schmidt, eh? He'd missed a speck of whipped cream. It might have been that homely touch or his worried frown or the comfortable intimate ambiance, but all of a sudden I knew I was going to talk till I was hoarse. I love you, Schmidt, I said. Well, I have known that for a long time, Schmidt said complacently but it is good to hear you say it. Have you found the courage now to say it to him? Uh-huh. This more enthusiasm than that, I hope. And he loves you, too. So, of what are you afraid? Funny, I said hollowly. He asked me the same thing. And what did you say? Something stupid, I guess. It's a stupid question, Schmidt. Loving someone condemns you to a lifetime of fear. You become painfully conscious of how fragile people are. Bundles of brittle bones and vulnerable flesh. Breeding grounds for billions of deadly germs and horrible diseases. And loving a man like John is tantamount to playing Russian roulette. He can't help being the way he is. He'll never change. And that lifestyle doesn't offer much hope for a long-term relationship, does it? I've been fighting my feelings for a long time. 
longer than I want to admit, because I knew that once I gave way, it would be all the way, no holding back, no reservations. That's the way I am. And he... It's not just physical attraction. Be you laughing, Schmidt? So help me God, if you laugh at me... But who could not laugh? You of all people, so prim and proper with the poor old gentleman. I was not always old, Vicky, and I have not forgotten what it is like to feel as you do. But I still do not understand what is holding you back. It's not me, damn it, it's John. He's gone all sentimental and noble and self-sacrificing on me. I saw it coming. And I hoped I was wrong, but I couldn't think of anything that would change his mind. He's so arrogant and stubborn. And he'd have called me by now if he meant to. It's been almost two weeks, and having her call instead was a deliberate sign. Schmidt whipped out his handkerchief. Weep, my dear Vicky. Break yourself down. It will relieve you. Thanks. I think I will. He moved his chair closer to mine and put his arm around me. He felt as comforting and soft as a huge pillow, and warm besides. When I finished blubbering, I saw there was another cup of coffee in front of me, with a double order of schlag on it. Schmidt's ideas of consolation are based on whipped cream and chocolate. So, said Schmidt in a businesslike voice, that is better. We can seriously discuss the problem. I will accept your assumption that this is how he feels, for you are in a better position to know than I. Can you explain why he should feel so? For surely now your position is safer than it has ever been. He is not under suspicion by the police, and you have an excuse for enjoying an acquaintance that began openly and legitimately. John Tregarth isn't wanted, no. But Sir John Smythe and a couple of dozen other aliases are, and not only by the police. Max assured us he held no grudge, but John obviously didn't believe him. And how many others like Max are there crawling around in the woodwork? That's what has him worried, Schmidt. Not just worried, terrified. I thought he was feeling guilty about her until the night before we left Egypt, and then it was me he was having nightmares about. He was reliving that awful hour with Max and the others and dreading what would happen, not to him, to me, if he didn't pull it off. He kept repeating, it was too close. And he didn't mean coming too close to murder. He meant, oh, hell. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I understand, Schmidt said, frowning. It is very... If you say romantic, I'll slug you. Touching was the word I had in mind. More than touching, beautiful. Yes, yes, it is what I would expect from such a man. He fears to endanger you, and so he will stay away. Is that what you want? I'd resigned myself to a long, poetic tirade. The direct question startled me into the truth. No. But he may be in the right, Schmidt said. He knows more than you of the possible dangers. He has no right to make that decision for me. God damn it, Schmidt, it's the same old macho crap you guys always try to pull. And it's not based on chivalry, but on pure selfishness. Tuck the little woman away in some safe place so you won't have to worry about her. What about us worrying about you? If you follow me. Oh, I do, said Schmidt. I follow you very well. My eyes fell. Touché, Schmidt. I know, I've done the same thing to you. But in this case, in both cases, the damage is already done. Once you care about someone, you're wide open. And the worst part of it is not knowing. Something awful could happen to him any time. It could be happening at this very moment, and I might not even know about it for days or weeks or... You know what I did yesterday? I bought a goddamn London newspaper and read the goddamn obituaries. I can't live that way, Schmidt. And he has no right to expect me to. And no, I'm not going to call him, because this is his problem. And he's got to come to grips with it. And if he can't admit the obvious basic fact... 
I broke off. I'd run out of breath. Schmidt was nodding and smiling, and there was a calculating look in those beady little eyes of his. Schmidt, I said. I already owe you more than I can ever repay. And I am deeply grateful to you for inducing this emotional orgy, even if you did enjoy every maudlin moment of it. But if you call him and repeat this conversation... Now, Vicky, would I do such a thing? He took out his wallet. Come, we must return to the museum. To work, to work, eh? I trust you will be more efficient in the future. It went on raining. Day after day. Three days, to be precise. I didn't mind. At that point, I'd have considered sunlight a personal insult. And the bad weather kept me occupied. Cleaning up after Caesar was a full-time activity. He and Clara had been glad to see me. Not that Clara admitted it. In fact, she spent a full day displaying her displeasure at my absence. She'd walk into the room and then sit down with her back to me, glancing over her shoulder now and then to make sure I was aware of how she was ignoring me. And she talked. There was nothing noisier than an irritated Siamese. Finally, she condescended to get on my lap, and after that, I couldn't get rid of her. I fell over her every time I climbed the stairs, and she slept on my head instead of at my feet, with her tail in my mouth. Caesar's delight at my return was more openly expressed. Thanks to the incessant rain, he was able to coat himself with mud whenever he went out, and he was determined to share this pleasure with the one he loved best. If it hadn't been for them, and for Schmidt. But I was feeling more suicidal than ever that gloomy Thursday evening. The drive home, through misty rain and fog, had been a nightmare of traffic and fender benders. Caesar had found something dead in the garden when I let him out, and he'd rolled in it. Clara had decided she didn't care for the brand of cat food I'd been feeding her for a week. I'd just bought a whole case of it. I had been too depressed to change my wet clothes or my muddy shoes. I was sitting on the couch, elbows on my knees, chin on my hands, dank hair dripping down my face, when the doorbell rang. Schmidt looked like Father Christmas, with an armful of parcels and a red scarf wound around his double chins. The bottle sticking out of one of the bags appeared to be champagne. Coming to cheer me up, are you? I inquired sourly. Do not be rude. You know you are glad to see me. Yes, I am. Hi, Schmidt. Grüß Gott, Schmidt said formally. Help me unpack these things. We are having a party. I hope we means you and me. I followed him to the kitchen. So did Caesar and Clara. They knew Schmidt. When he began unloading his parcels, I realized he'd been shopping at Dalmeyer's, Munich's legendary gourmet deli. I don't want anybody else. I have invited another guest, Schmidt said. He was trying not to grin, but he couldn't hold it back, and I knew before he went on what he was going to say. I think you will be glad to see him, though. Slowly, I followed Schmidt back into the living room. And there I stayed, rooted to the spot is the phrase, I believe, while he went into the hall. Was I thinking, in that supreme and critical moment, of how god-awful I looked? Of course I was. I had allowed myself to imagine such a meeting. In that fantasy, I was attired in robes of filmy white, and my freshly washed and carefully brushed hair fell over my shoulders. Trust Schmidt to pick a moment when I resembled a charwoman on her way home from work. But I didn't really care. However, I managed not to throw myself at him when he entered the room. His hair was damp and a little too long. It curled over his ears. I swallowed and said, with typical graciousness, He didn't have to come. I tried to stay away, John said. It was for your sake, my darling. I'm not worthy of you. 
but your image has been enshrined in my heart. Aren't you going to stop me before I perpetrate any more assaults on English prose? He was smiling, but it was an oddly tentative smile. And if I hadn't believed the word could never apply to John, I would have said he looked a little shy. I'm not going to do anything till Schmidt leaves the room, I mumbled. Why not? Schmidt inquired curiously. Why not indeed, I agreed. Damn good question, Schmidt. Mine is a small living room. One step was all it took. Sehr gut, said Schmidt's voice from somewhere in the rosy pink clouds. I hate to mention those clouds, but as I have already admitted, my imagination runs to cliches. I will now open the champagne. No bandages, I whispered. Are you really all right? What are you doing, counting ribs? The area is still a trifle sensitive, so if you wouldn't mind. You're so thin. Did Schmidt call you? After I threatened to kill him, if he... You've lost a bit of weight yourself, haven't you? Here, and perhaps here. He did call you. When he did, I'd been sitting staring at the telephone for over two hours, trying not to ring you. Are you angry with him? No. What'd he say? My ears are still burning, John said wryly. Even my dear old mum's lectures never attained that level of surgically accurate analysis. Vicky. He put his hands on my shoulders and held me away. We must settle this before Schmidt comes back and breaks that bottle of champagne over our bows. I thought it quite likely you'd never want to set eyes on me again. I told you I loved you. Yes, but weren't my demonstrations convincing? Oh, that. You couldn't help that. You were powerless to resist. I've been told Great Grandad had to beat them off with a club. Darling, stop doing that and be serious for once. Me? I stopped doing that. I know. It's your fault. I don't behave this idiotically with anyone but you. He took my face between his hands. Seriously, Vicky, I did try to stay away. If you hadn't, will you marry me? His eyes widened with horror. Certainly not. Are you out of your mind? Well, what's a girl to do? If you won't ask me, you don't suppose I would insult your intelligence by asking you to marry me, do you? John demanded indignantly. How about a dangerous liaison, then? It was the wrong adjective. His eyes darkened and his fingers pressed painfully into my temples. I haven't the guts to go through this again, Vicky. If I had survived, and you... and you hadn't, I would have put a bullet through my head. I'm told that drinking yourself to death is more fun, I said. Oh, God, won't you allow me a single moment of high drama? I owe you one for spoiling my big scene at Amarna. You're incorrigible. He pulled me into his arms. And irresistible. All right, then. Sweetheart, you've made me the happiest woman in... I wouldn't marry you if you were the last woman on earth, John said but we'll give the other a try and make frequent offerings to St. Jude. My darling, are you certain that this is what you want? It may be years before... The swinging door to the kitchen opened and Schmidt's head appeared. Do not concern yourselves, my friends. Schmidt is working on the problem. The head vanished, to be followed by a thump, a burst of profanity and a series of frustrated yelps from Caesar. Schmidt had blocked Caesar's path, but he had overlooked one little thing. John yelped and clutched his leg. Bloody hell! I looked down. Clara had bit him on the ankle. Eight years, Schmidt said. His ingenuous face fell. Unless it is petty theft. There is nothing petty about my activities. John said. Let me think. Italy. 
It was a charming domestic scene. Schmidt was sitting at the table, his papers spread out before him, his pen poised. He had stripped to his shirt sleeves in order to work more efficiently, and with the glasses perched on the end of his nose and his face set in a frown of concentration, he looked like a conscientious little accountant. An old Roy Acuff tape was playing. When one of his favorites came on, Schmidt joined in. His rendition of The Prisoner's Lament was particularly soulful. Schmidt had gracefully allowed me to retire in order to change and wash my face. My wardrobe doesn't run to diaphanous robes, but I did the best I could, and I tied a red ribbon around my hair. As I had hoped, the ribbon had the appropriate effect on John. His eyes widened, but all he said, all he had time to say before Schmidt was with us again, was, Once you've made up your mind, you don't hold back, do you? Caesar was snoring under the table with his head on Schmidt's foot. Clara was in the kitchen. I'd bribed her with the extravagant remains of Schmidt's feast, but she was still complaining. Every time she yowled, John flinched. He was recumbent on the couch, coat and tie off, shirt open, like a weary husband at the end of a hard day's work. I sat on the floor next to him. It's a sufficient indication of my state of mind that I had assumed that position without even thinking about it. Now and then his hand touched my hair, so lightly that no one except a woman who was totally besotted would have felt it. It ran through every nerve in my body. Italy, John repeated thoughtfully. It's been almost three years since I did anything in Italy. Ah, sehr gut, Schmidt exclaimed. He made a notation. I turned my head. Rome? Right. What a memory you've got. Now then, Schmidt shuffled papers. We have nothing in Norway. Sweden is next. Was your last, uh, <clears throat> adventure in Sweden the one in which Vicky was involved? That doesn't count, John said, stretching comfortably. They never pinned anything on me. How about Leaf? I suggested. Always looking on the bright side, aren't you? He tugged lightly at the lock of hair he'd wound around his fingers. They can't prove I did it. Anyhow, it was self-defense. Very good, very good, Schmidt beamed. And you have committed no uh, <clears throat> actions in the UK. Nothing we need worry about, John said, somewhat evasively. There's an old adage about fouling one's own nest. And the States? No. What about that artifact the Oriental Institute fondly believes it got back? I asked. John looked shocked. It's the original. How can you doubt me? Schmidt peered at his notes. So we have Germany, Italy, France, Egypt, Turkey, and Greece. Hmm. Nothing for two years? Anywhere? I've been busy, John said defensively. I rose to my knees and turned to face him. Two years? Then last winter, when you fed me that line about a nice, honest job and turning respectable? It was the truth? John smiled sheepishly. Hard to credit, I know. I did lie about the cottage in the country. I can't afford it yet. Everything's gone back into the shop. Really, the difficulty of starting an honest business in today's world, what with taxes and endless forms to fill out, and all those regulations. Oh, John! I took his hand and carried it to my cheek. Did you go straight for me? I think I'm going to cry. You dreadful woman, how dare you make fun of me? Why didn't you tell me? He looked as embarrassed as if I'd accused him of bigamy. I sat back on my heels. You didn't want to prejudice my decision, was that it? John, if you don't stop being so damned noble, I'll dump you and get myself a more interesting beau. He grinned, but Schmidt was deeply moved. You should not joke about such things, Vicky. It will not be so long after all. 
Six years at the most? Perhaps only five. It wasn't that simple. The statutes of limitations with regard to art thefts are subject to interpretations that vary from country to country, and even judge to judge, and they're constantly changing. And it wasn't the police John was primarily worried about. Schmidt knew all that as well as I did. He was just trying to cheer us up, bless his heart. I suppose I could give some of them back, John said like a sulky little boy offering to return the candy bars he'd swiped from the corner grocery. But I saw the gleam in his eye, and when Schmidt said eagerly, That would be wunderbar, I said, Not if you have to steal them back. Aren't you in enough trouble already? Honestly, John, I think you just enjoy taking things. Never mind why. Unobserved by Schmidt, who was considering this new angle, John's index finger curled around my ear. There's always a chance of time off for good behavior, he said brightly. I've been very virtuous of late, mending fences, so to speak. The Oriental Institute isn't the only institution that thinks kindly of me. Innumerable little old ladies have promised to mention me in their prayers, and several starving orphans. It's getting late, I said, catching my breath. You must be tired, Schmidt. Tired? No. We are celebrating, are we not? The damned tape chose that moment to start a new song, and Schmidt jumped up, bouncing on his toes. Come, Vicky, we will dance, nicht? It's not a polka, Schmidt. Well, do you think I do not know a polka when I hear it? I waltz as well as I do the polka. And the schuhplattle, and the samba, and the rumba. He offered his hand. Smiling, I let him pull me to my feet. At that point, I'd have agreed to do anything the little guy wanted, even if he wouldn't go home. At least it wasn't a samba. Schmidt clasped me in his arms, and off we went, just as I had expected. One, two, three, hop, one, two, three, hop. I was helpless with laughter, trying to figure out what outre combination of steps Schmidt was doing when he stopped and stepped back, beaming. John caught my hand and swung me into the circle of his arm. There were so many things we'd never done together. Gone grocery shopping, walked in the rain. Walked, period. Usually we were running, Planted daffodils, played pinochle, gone to the opera, washed the dishes. I wasn't surprised to find he was a good dancer, light on his feet, with a strong sense of rhythm. I thought I was doing pretty well myself, until a voice murmured tenderly into my ear, Stop trying to lead. Laughter loosened my muscles, and he spun me in an extravagant circle, adding, for now, at least, we'll argue each case as it arises. There is no more sickeningly saccharine, swoopingly sentimental piece of music than the Tennessee waltz. Over John's shoulder, I caught glimpses of Schmidt smiling and nodding and swaying more or less in time with the music. Then I didn't see him any more because I'd closed my eyes and stopped trying to lead. When the tape clicked off and I opened my eyes, Schmidt was gone. I heard the front door close softly. John inspected the room with a wary eye. She's in the kitchen, I said. Could I interest you in a game of pinochle? He always knew what I was thinking. Tomorrow. After we've walked the dog and done the washing up, I'll even attempt to establish a truce with that man-eating cat of yours. At the moment, however, you can lead. I intend to. This time. He took the ribbon from my hair. There would be a next time. And at least one tomorrow. I'd settle for that. One is all any of us can count on.
When Mama lay a dying on the flatbed, she told me not to truck with girls like you. But I was blinded by the glare of your headlights, and I went joy riding just for the view. You're a detour on the highway to heaven. I am lost on the back roads of sin. I have got to get back to the four lane, so that I can see Mahama again. Your curves made me lose my direction. My hands from the steering wheel strayed. But you were just one more roadside attraction. It's been ten thousand miles since I prayed. If you ever get out of the fast lane and get back to that highway above, I'll be waiting for you at the toll booth in that land where all roads end in love. The End